You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. One martini and a Manhattan. Thanks, Noreen. Shall I run a tab for you? Nah, we're going to take off in a minute. I want to stay for the show. What show? Georgie says it's a new act. Some guy with a dummy. Big deal. But he's supposed to be good. I'll run a tab. Okay, but this is the last round. Over here, sweet. Uh, be right with you, sir. Drink up. Slow down, Artie. The show hasn't even started yet. I got a better idea. Let's go someplace. What for? You know, someplace private. We can talk. Get acquainted. I told you, Artie, I'm not going to your place. Why not? This is Dullsville. Besides, those ventriloquist guys freak me out. I think they're funny. Yeah, but the dummies. They all got those big heads and those big painted eyes rolling around. Ugh, they give me the willies. Testing, testing. Oh, great. It's time for the show. Yeah, great. Is this thing on? I know you're out there, ladies and gentlemen. I can hear you breathing. But seriously, folks, if you're wondering why I called you all here this evening, it's a mystery to me, too. No, honest, I do know. It's because you want to see the chorus girl. Get him out of here. Yeah, I want to see him, too. All of them, if you know what I mean, and I think you do. But before we do that little thing, I want you to meet a couple of friends of mine. Well, one of them at least. The other's just a chip off the old block. So put your hands together and give a nice, warm, a New York welcome to Jerry and Willie. Hi there, everybody. Well, we're certainly happy to be here. Speak for yourself, jerky. Uh, that's Jerry. Well, like I always say, a dummy by any other name. Now cut that out. All right, all right, let go of the soup. Now, Willie. I said let go of the tux. I got it off a penguin at the Bronx Zoo. I'm getting out of here. Please, Willie, control yourself. Really, you can't go now. You couldn't. Those spindly legs won't even hold you. Say, what do you mean by that? Nothing. I didn't mean a thing. I only said it's not a good idea. Really? Come on now. <laughs> look, look, I apologize, all right? Whatever I said, I was only kidding. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah? Willie, isn't there something you wanted to ask? Ah, uh, okay. Tell me this, wise guy. It's getting close to Halloween. Are you superstitious? Me? Not at all. Ah, why don't you fess up? Well, on occasion... What do you do? Throw salt over your shoulder? Cross your fingers? No, never. And how come your legs are crossed? Oh, <laughs> sorry, Willie. Let me put you on the other knee. There. Comfortable now? That's better. Okay, wise guy. Tell me what it is you do do. Well, sometimes I knock wood. Ow! You did it again! You asked me. I'm through. I resign. Sit back down. From now on, I'm a solo. And as for you, you can turn in your lock. Give me one more chance, Willie. Now listen. Why should I? I know all your lines, and they ain't that good. Be reasonable, Willie. What in the world would you do without me? Anything I want to. Anything, huh? Like what? Well, for one thing, I could be a better ventriloquist than you. Oh, I don't think so. I do. Watch this. Put your hand over my mouth. Not tonight, Willie. Go on. What are you scared of? Well, you might bite the hand that feeds you. <laughs> what are you talking about? You don't feed me. All you do is give me your leftovers from the pencil sharpener. You know that isn't true. Go on. Put your hand over my mouth. Either that or you drink a glass of water while I sing Melancholy Baby. Well, if you insist. Do it so we can get to the joke. Now you're talking. Meet a ventriloquist named Jerry Etherson, a voice thrower par excellence. His alter ego sitting atop his lap is a brash stick of kindling about two feet tall, whose sobriquet is Willie. But in just a moment, Mr. Etherson and his naughty pine partner will discover that they've been booked into an out-of-the-way bistro on a small, dark back street known 
as the twilight zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, The Dummy, starring Bruno Kirby, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. I'll tell you, I'm a better ventriloquist than you are any day of the week and twice on Sundays. All right, Willie, if that's what you want, prove it to the folks. So what are you waiting for? Put your hand over my mouth. Remember, you promised. Okay, here goes. Well, it's about time. I've been waiting all night for a chance to do 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 A funny thing happened to me on the way over to the club tonight. That a fact? What happened, Blockhead? I was out in front of the Ritz Savoy. That's where you live? Yeah, that's where I live. In front of the Ritz Savoy. You put formaldehyde in those jokes? Well, why do you ask? Something must preserve them. Don't be insulting, Mr. Woodshop. It just so happens I'm not only a comedian, I'm also a lover. A lover? With that profile? You like it? I've seen better looking mugs in a coffee house. Oh, yeah? Well, listen, I've got a hundred women tearing their hair out for me. That a fact? That's a fact. I'm just tired of bald headed women. Willie, I think you've proved your point. You can throw your voice just as far as you can throw the ball. All right, Willie, I'll take my hand away. Now, why don't you be nice and say goodnight to these wonderful people? In a minute. First, I want to show them something. What's that? You can do anything I can do better. All right, wise guy. How about this? What are you going to do? I'm going to turn my head all the way around like Linda Blair. Are you serious, Willie? How's that for a 360? Not bad, but doesn't it hurt? Of course it does. What are you, the exorcist? I hope you didn't eat any split pea soup tonight. Come back tomorrow, folks. I'll be all alone up here. Promise. Just you and me. Come on, little pal. We're cutting out. Let me tell you something, folks. When I shake this busher and get me a real act, you're going to see some class. Let's go, Willie. We don't want to overstay our welcome. What welcome, jerk? Good night, everyone. And thanks for being such a... Help! I'm being kidnapped! You got your hand over my mouth again. Call my lawyer. Call my carpenter. Call my tree surgeon. Never mind the surgeon. Just get me to the nurse on time. Hey! I told you not to do that. And I told you never to put your hand over my trap, didn't I? <laughs> you okay, Mr. Etherson? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Rich. Must have caught a splinter or something. What did you do to me, you little creep? Thanks a lot. Well, what are you looking at? Mind if I sterilize the hand? And stop staring at me. I'll turn you around so you can look at the wall. Huh? Huh? What do you have to say about that? I, I don't have anything to say about that, Jerry. Frank, uh, how, how you doing? I'm doing fine. Who are you talking to? M me? Oh, no. I, I, I was just talking to myself. Uh, you know, trying out a new routine. A uh, new one? Yeah, yeah. Pull up a chair. So how did it look out there? Not too bad once you got going. Small audience, but a reasonably happy one. Nobody asked for their money back. Good, good. Of course, it doesn't matter what I think. Sure it does. You're my agent. The only thing that matters is what the paying customers think. You got through it okay, Jerry, somehow. You and the little tyke over there. Why do you have him turned around like that? Careful. I mean, I, I've told you not to touch Willie, haven't I? Still doing the bit, huh? Knock it off, Frank. What's that smell? Alcohol. What? I cut myself, all right? Smells like scotch. No, it doesn't. Take a look around. What do you see? This is makeup. And this... This is a jar of cold cream. I told you I'm on the wagon. Yeah, sure. I thought you gave me a solemn promise you were going to stick to soda pop and cappuccinos from now on. What's it take, Jerry, to get you wise? I'm tired, Frank. And I don't feel well. Give me a break and clear the area, will you? First, I'm going to clear the air. Now, I don't know where you manufacture your illusions, but you're not Edgar Bergen or Sherry Lewis or Jim Henson. At the moment, you're a second-rate nightclub entertainer. And if you stay on that bottle, you're going to lose even that title. I'll lose the bottle. Don't worry. 
just pull out for a while and give me some space. I don't even know why I waste my time. Ten percent of you is grief, and it's always been that way. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's because I got a soft spot in my heart for people who commit suicide eight hours a day. Frank. Jerry, it doesn't have to be this way. You give in to some bad hooch, you have bad nightmares. It's as simple as that. You take away the hooch, you take away the nightmares. Now, you need a college degree to figure that out? You've got the chronology wrong. First it's the nightmares, then it's the bottle. I wouldn't drink if I didn't need to. And I wouldn't be a second-rate nightclub hustler if that... that filthy, miserable little... Frank, I keep telling you, I want to get rid of him. I have to get rid of him. That stick of wood? That, that fugitive from the fireplace over there? How many psychiatrists you have to see, Jerry? How many hours on the couch? How many 80 buck an hour visits? I can't help it. You can help it. You know what it is. You've been told. Often, endlessly, up to my craw and overflowing. Schizophrenia. I know it by heart. Patient feels helpless and manipulated by forces beyond his control. I could give it to you backwards, forwards and sideways and in three different languages. It's like a well-rehearsed off-color joke. So the patient makes the transference between himself and his lifeless dummy, but is then unable to separate himself from the object of his transference. Now that's all very psychiatric, and it's worth about two and a half bucks a word. But that's not it, Frank. I told them and I've told you. It isn't schizophrenia or paranoia any more than it's athlete's foot or a head cold. Willie is alive, Frank. I tell you he's alive. Willie is a dummy, a piece of wood. Put him down. Look at him. Does this thing look alive to you? Please, Frank. 24 inches of lumber in a funny little suit of clothes and you are shoveling yourself into a grave over it. Careful. Now listen to me, Jerry. I've gone along with you. I've held your hand, and I've sung you lullabies, and I have patted you on the back. I've also covered for you the 110 times you run out on a performance. I thought up excuses that hadn't even been invented yet. I have gone without sleep and without commission, because I thought I had a talented article here who eventually was going to crawl out from under the bottle and hit it big. Well, I don't think you're such a talented article anymore, Jerry. Now, let's put it this way. Maybe I think you could be, but you're never going to. I think you're a self-indulgent sot with an overactive imagination, and the only thing you like better than scotch is sympathy. Well, I'm going to give you just 24 hours to straighten out. Get rid of the bottle, and get rid of that crazy obsession that you're in a death match with a dummy. Frank, it isn't just a dummy. I tell you, it isn't just a dummy. Oh, take it easy, kid. You're going to blow a gasket. Frank. Take a look at this. What do you got there, Jerry? A, a backup? I had it made special. Didn't know if I'd ever have the guts to unpack it. But now there's no choice. Frank, say hello to someone very special. I'd like you to meet... Willie's replacement. Willie's replacement? That's right. I call him Goofy Goggles. See the big thick glasses? Great, huh? From now on, he's going to take Willie's place. You mean in the act? You got it. I'll get rid of Willie. I'll scrap him. I'm going to do a whole new routine. A whole new routine takes time. You got another show in half an hour. I won't be able to go on for the late show. Tell him, tell him I'm sick or something. I've already told them you're sick or something. Now, the trouble is they know it's something that's bottled in bond. Frank, you got to back me up on this. You be out on that stage when you hear your music. I don't care which dummy you bring, but you be out there. This is one I'm not covering for. New routine, new routine, right. Come on, Goofy, we can do it. There you go. You sit right here on the table, and we'll cook up some gags. Sure, sure. It'll be easy. What are you looking at him for? Don't worry about Willie. I turned him around so he can't see. Better put on a little more pancake. It's hot under those lights. How you doing? Clean your glasses for you? There. 
<laughs> okay. Now, say, uh, say, uh, say, Goofy Goggles, why don't you have your glasses fixed? You look kind of nearsighted. Are you kidding? I don't need them. My eyes are A-OK. -okay. I'm a grown boy. <laughs> Goofy, you're looking at the band leader. I'm over here. Keep talking. I'll find you. Why don't you sit on my lap? There. There you go. Isn't that better? Say, Mr. Etherson, I've been meaning to tell you. You, you, you put too much starch in my collar. <laughs> too much starch in your collar? Well, that's so you'll stay awake for the whole show. Heads up. Did you see that chorus girl over there? Where? Where? See? What did I tell you? But listen, you got to be subtle about it. Don't stare at them when they walk by. Your whole head wobbles like it's going to fall off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That'll work. We're going to make it out there. You and me, Goofy, and nobody else. Just you and me. Willie. I saw that. You turned your head around. Don't look at him in the mirror, Goofy. He's nothing anymore. As soon as I lock him in a suitcase, he's through. Washed up. Finished. Hi, Jerry. All ready to go on? Sure, Noreen. I'm going to kill him tonight. Margie, listen to this. Hello, Margie. Pleased to meet you. Noreen told me all about you. This will knock you out. Make me talk, Jer. Go ahead. Watch this, Marge. I'm on in a couple of minutes, Noreen. How about after the show? Oh, come on. Check this out, Marge. He makes me sound just like Willie. It's real crazy. Go ahead, Jerry. Hey, where is Willie, anyway? Uh, he's not going on tonight. I've got a new partner. He's kind of cute. Meet my new friend, Goofy Goggles. Just the same. I miss you, Willie. Here's a kiss. Can you catch it through the door? Mwah! Knock it off, babe. That tickles. Willie, cut that out. <laughs> what did I tell you, huh? What did I tell you? It sounded like he was all the way in the dressing room. Isn't that wild? Gotta go, I'm on. Goofy, you're talking to the band leader. I'm over here. Now listen, I think it's about time you got new glasses. I really do. My eyes are 20-20. What are you looking for? Keep talking. I'll find you. <laughs> you know something? I think you ought to have an eye test. My eyes have a great IQ. Trust me. That's what you said to your toothpick. All right, now, let's try it. Look at this card. But, oh, wait, wait, wait. Are you, are you trying to trick me already? What does this say? Uh, give me a hint. Come on, Goofy. It's as plain as the nose on your face. It ain't that big. <laughs> Goofy, it's a letter that's between D and F. I got it. It's an E. My, my. How did you do that? I cannot tell a lie. That'll be a first. Well, I saw that card before and I memorized it. <laughs> I thought so. Well, uh, I got a mind like a steel trap. A mouse trap is more like it. Now, what do you say we get out of here? Wait, wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Hmm? Hmm? Uh, for my big finish, ladies and germs, I'd like to sing my favorite song. I only have eyes for you. You are here, so am I. Maybe millions of people go by, but they all disappear from view. With a voice like that, Goofy, it's no wonder they're all disappearing. For the exit. I'll make the jokes. You just move your lips. Cause I only have eyes for you. Cute act, isn't it, Georgie? What's cute about it? I like the old dummy better. Why'd he change it? Well, you know, brighten it up a little bit. Give it some novelty. Novelty? With a ventriloquist? Frankie, you see one, you've seen them all. Every dummy looks the same. And if they ever changed the jokes, I'd have a coronary. What's with you, this anyway? What do you mean? Well, usually, the acts go mix with the trade between shows. You know, walk out on the floor and do a little drinking with the customers. That's how we make our nut. 
on drinks. But this guy he thinks he's Greta Garbo. Locks himself in the dressing room like a regular prima donna. Oh, he's a little nervous tonight, is all. You know he hasn't been well. This is his first time out in a month or so. He'll warm up for you. You tell him to do that. Tell him to bring the dummy out and walk around the tables after the show. It's psychological, Frankie. Talking makes people thirsty, know what I mean? Good night, ladies and gentlemen. Good night. That was great. Really. Thanks, Marge. And him. Oh, he's a living doll. Oh, Goofy, you are the only man for me. Mwah. Hey, careful with the merchandise. That's enough, Marge. Goofy doesn't like to be touched. Say, what's the matter with him? Come on, Willie. You've had it. Get down and stay down. That's right, put your legs in. Stop fighting me. I said lie down. There. Rest in peace, Pinocchio. Your next stop's the sawdust factory. And as for you, Goofy, it's strictly you and me from now on. How's that collar? Still too tight? Jerry. What are you doing here? You leaving? What's it look like? Well, you got your coat on. You packing up, huh? I'm getting there. Georgie was hoping you'd mix with the customers. Tell Georgie I'm a ventriloquist, not a shill. Why don't you tell him? And that means? That means I'm resigning from your fan club. You keep your 10%. I'll keep my self-respect, also my sense of humor, my regular meals, and my normal office hours. You and I have had it, Jerry. I have gone the route with you and then some. You don't need an agent. You need medical help. You never believed me, did you? I believe you have obsessions. I believe those obsessions are eating you up alive, but I also believe, Jerry, that you're letting them. Frank, listen to me. He talks when I don't talk. He moves when I'm not looking. He tells jokes I've never heard of. He steps all over my lines. He throws me bum cues, and then he drowns out my gags. He, 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 listen to yourself. Frank, I'm not crazy. He's real. He's alive. That's why I stuck him in that suitcase. And that's why I locked it. It's all over now. I'm taking Goofy, and I'm going to catch the first plane out of here. I'll go down to Miami, or maybe L.A. Frank, what was that place in Kansas City that we did so well in? The place in Kansas City was the same as Miami, which is the same as Los Angeles, which is the same as Sioux City, Iowa, which is the same as any town south, north, and west of here. They're all the same, Jerry. You're not going to leave Willie by hopping on a plane, train, taxi, or a one-horse shay. This thing you have to lick right here. This you lick at the source. Yeah, well, we'll see. Come on, Goofy, get in. We're taking a little trip. What about the other suitcase? Drop it in the river for all I care. Or keep it for old time's sake. I don't ever want to see Willie again. I thought I just explained it to you. This you can't just run away from. And I told you we'll see about that, Frank. Just you wait and see. Willie is history. Come on, Goofy. Let's get out of this dump. What? Is anybody there? Georgie? Georgie, is that... Is this thing on? Somebody forgot to turn off the microphone. Well, it's not my problem. Goofy and me, we're hitting the road. Who's there? Come out and show yourself. I can't see who's... That you, Mr. Etherson? <laughs> oh, hi, Rich. Yeah, yeah. It's me. I was just closing down. Uh, uh, Rich, don't forget to turn off the mic. Okay, but I thought I did. Then somebody must have turned it back on. Wonder who did that. Well, take her easy, Mr. Etherson. Nice show. Thanks, Rich. Night. Good night. Running out on me, Jerry? What? 
You're not gonna leave me in a stuffy old suitcase, are you? Something else, was there, Mr. Ethison? Did you... Did you just say something? I said goodnight, that's all. Sure, sure. Don't work too hard. Uh, I'll try not to. Ah, uh, come on, sport. I wouldn't lock you in a suitcase. Where are you? Where? Hey, Geppetto. Did you forget something? Or someone? You leave me alone. So then, he says, he doesn't like to be touched. Can you believe that? Well, Jerry's a nice guy and all. Nice looking, that's for sure. But he's got a lot of problems. I don't know what exactly, but... It... Oh! What's the matter? This alley is really dark. So? Are you sure it's safe? I always go this way. It's quicker. Want me to walk with you? Don't be silly. You go up there to the street. There's plenty of cabs at the corner. Yeah, but it's so late. You shouldn't walk home alone. Don't worry about me, Margie. I can take care of myself. Well, if you say so. I say so. See you tomorrow night. Okay, Noreen. Night. Is that you, Margie? Is somebody there? Hey, take it easy, Noreen. It's only me. See? Oh, Jerry, thank God. Who did you think? I don't know. Were you following me? Well, sort of. I was waiting for you. You were? Yeah. I was I was watching the stage door for you to come out. Sure you were. Would I lie? Well, in that case, uh, I suppose the line is... Uh, this is so sudden, and for once it happens to be true. I thought maybe... What's in the suitcase? Is that Willie? No, 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 it's not Willie. Listen, I thought maybe we could get a drink together, or maybe a, a sandwich and a cup of coffee. What do you say? You want to go with me? Why not? I've been meaning to tell you. I've been meaning to tell you that I think you're very, very good looking. Really? Yeah, you're the best looking girl at the club, no kidding. So, so what do you think? We could get a, a, a cup of coffee or something? Seems to me I've heard that line before. Noreen, it's not a line. I mean it. Slow down. Don't get me wrong. Just coffee. That's all. Sit someplace where it's nice and, and bright and talk, you know. That's original. Come on, Noreen. How does that sound? Sure, I guess. But what's the big hurry? Do we have to walk so fast? What? Oh, no. Of course not. What's the matter with you, Jerry? Are you sick? What do you mean, sick? I just like you, that's all. Is that a crime? I like being with you. What is going on? I just thought we... we could spend some time together. Something's wrong. Y you act like you're frightened. What are you frightened of? Noreen. Tell me. Noreen. I can't be alone now. I can't. He's bugging me. Oh. His voice is coming out of everywhere. He's all around, no matter where I go. Before you came out... I thought I saw his shadow back there on the wall. It was you, Noreen. Who are you talking about? Willie! Don't you get it? Noreen, you've got to help me. Let me stay with you tonight. I'm telling you, Willie is... Willie is a dummy! Get away from me, Jerry. You, you're scaring me. Noreen! Noreen, wait! Noreen, please! Come on, come on! Open up! Hello? Rich? You still here? You didn't go home yet, did you? Rich? Say, I was wondering, could I stick around for a while? Maybe spend the night right here in the club? You mind? I can sleep in the dressing room. See, I got a little problem. There's this, uh, this guy, and he's following me. 
testing, testing. Is this thing on? No. What do you say, stranger? Long time no see. I thought you were gonna blow this joint. Where? What's the matter, booby? Your plane got grounded? Well, couldn't you get past security with that funny-looking suitcase? But how? What do you think happened to me on the way to the club tonight? I was out in front of the Red Savoy Hotel. That's where I live. In front of the Red Savoy. <laughs> Where did you go? You're not on the stage. The microphone isn't even there. Wanna play hide and seek? Guess what, Jerry? You're it. it, it, it. Hide and seek, huh? Where are you hiding, you little? <laughs> come out, come out, wherever you are. <laughs> The other suitcase. You're still in there, where I left you. You gotta be. There you are. I'll kill you, honey. There. What do you think of that? Now let me see you try to follow me. Wait a minute. What are these glasses doing here? These are goofies. I know I talk to myself when I put them in the... When I put them in the... Goofy? I didn't mean to hurt you. I took the wrong one. How could I leave the wrong suitcase? Open the other one. Go on, Jerry. Open it. The one you've been carrying around. <sighs> I was in there a long time. Now I gotta get my pants pressed. Let me give you a tip, Jerky. Don't ever run with a suitcase under your arm. I almost lost my lunch. Then you'll have a real mess to clean up. You get away from me. Just leave me alone. I won't tell a soul. Believe me, I won't tell a soul. Who do you think you're talking to? Maybe you need glasses. Willie, just let me walk out of here. And you'll never see me again, I promise. Well, why don't you take the eye test? What am I holding up? I'll give you a hint. It comes between D and F. No fair peeking. For the love of God, let me go. No can do, partner. Now, what do you say we get down to business? But you're a dummy. You're made of wood. Somebody built you. How could you... You jerk. You made me real. You spiked me to life. You gave me thoughts. You poured words into my head. You moved my mouth. You rolled my eyes and stuck out my tongue. You big lug, don't you get it? You made me what I am today. And I hope you're satisfied, you rascal you, from the song of the same name. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Evening, everybody. And now. Direct from the Big Apple, New York City, the funniest pair of cuckoos you'll ever see here in Kansas City or anywhere else, Willie and Jerry. Come on, folks, let's give them a big Kansas City welcome. How do you do, folks? How do you do? Funny thing happened to me on the way over to the club tonight. I met this broad. Come on now, Jerry. You don't mean broad, you mean lady. You just make the jokes, I'll deliver them. But seriously, I've heard stories about you. I'm innocent, I tell you. I was framed. I've heard that you're superstitious. Me? You are, aren't you? I mean, you throw salt over your shoulder, cross your fingers. I wish you'd cross your legs so I could get more comfortable. There. How's that? Better, but it ain't exactly the lap of luxury. Now, Jerry, I asked you a question. Remember? Of course I remember. What do you think I am, a blockhead? We're talking about superstitions. All right, wise guy. What do you do? I knock wood. Ow! <laughs> What's known in the parlance of the times as the old switcheroo. From boss to blockhead in a few easy lessons. 
And if you're given to nightclubbing on occasion, you might want to check out this particular act. It's called Willie and Jerry. And you'll find them booked into some of the better clubs along the Great Grey Way known as the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop, twilightzoneradio.com. Visit twilightzoneradio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD, or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. The Dummy, starring Bruno Kirby with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and based on a script by Rod Serling from a story by Lee Polk. Heard in the cast were Craig Wickman, Michelle Graff, Linda Ryder, Rich Kamenick, Christian Stolte, Doug James, Paul Patch, and Roger Wolski. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, the American Forces Radio and Television Service, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. And hear you, loud and clear. How's the monitor picture? Still distorted. And we've got a few minutes left. Check your controls. Make sure the red switches are all on. Check. Now the blue ones. Check again. Any overloads? Well, your amperage is steady. Voltage and input. You sure you want to go through with this? You sound positively funereal, Harvey. I sound the way I feel. I'm helping you because you asked me, Paul. I can give you my support as an engineer. But enthusiasm is something I just can't dredge up. No sense of adventure. A sense of wonder, perhaps. And a sense of concern for a friend who's placing himself in jeopardy unnecessarily. You could just as well test the process with a lab rat or a monkey, but with yourself. Why? A monkey can't take field notes. But if you're so sure, it works. I know it works. The challenge now is to use it. To better the world, if possible. Otherwise, it's just a machine that moves atoms from one temporal location to another. Sort of like a shuttle bus between centuries. Take it to the physics department, then. Publish your work officially. Do you know how much funding you'll have? You'll also have a Nobel Prize, if that means anything to you. It doesn't. In fact, it's what I don't want. If it's possible to change the past for the better, then it's equally possible to do the reverse. I can't take that chance. The world can't. Put this invention in the wrong hands, we're all through. If it is possible, I'll eliminate some of the suffering. If not, I'll know I tried. But... Either way, I'll destroy this machine as soon as I get back. You're in focus now, Paul. Good. That gives us three minutes to countdown. You've entered three sets of coordinates. Check. Paul. And I've got what I need. One tube of Dramamine, 
One Japanese pocket dictionary, one hunting rifle, disassembled with a telescopic sight, one long-range hollow point round. I'll only have the chance for a single shot. Anyway. Wait a minute. Harvey, where is it? Paul. Where's the cartridge? I have it. Well, give it to me. All right. The cartridge, Harvey. Now, I have a little over two minutes. Paul, this is crazy. It's too dangerous. Dangerous? Did you drink milk this morning, Harvey? What's that got to do with... What was the strontium-90 content in the glass? Did it occur to you that the things you've been eating and drinking might turn your bones to sawdust? Or guarantee that a child of yours might come into this world without arms or legs? The air you breathe today, what was in it? Harvey, old friend, you can talk to me about danger, but I don't have an exclusive franchise on risk. You know what I think? I think you just don't like the 21st century. I do not, Harvey. We're living in a septic tank. A gigantic cesspool in which runs the dregs, the misery-laden filth of man. Hatred, prejudice, violence. And man is the keeper of all this. He's also the scientifically advanced monkey who walks upright into an abyss of his own making. His bombs, his radioactivity, his fallout, his poisons, everything he designs is about dying. Harvey, we live in an exquisite bedlam, made even more grotesque by the fact that we don't recognize our own insanity. Did it ever occur to you that these scientifically advanced monkeys make bombs in order to survive? That across this planet, there are other monkeys who would pulverize us into dust if they thought they could get away with it? I don't need a lesson in current events. The freedom-loving monkeys make bombs, the aggressors make bombs, and ultimately somebody pushes a button and just as ultimately the Earth disappears. There will, of course, be a few germs who rise up out of the rubble and wave microscopic flags of victory and shed microscopic tears for the human race. Are you content with that, Harvey? But what you propose to do about it, to change history, is incredible. There is a logic and a paradox about time travel, you know. Haven't you read any science fiction? Granted, there's no guarantee, but if I fail, you simply cross off one insignificant human. One frail, protesting member of the race. Look at it this way. If I fail, if I wind up in hell, or limbo, or a cemetery, the responsibility is exclusively mine. Now do me one last favor, Harvey. Get back to the console and start the countdown. I should know better than to argue with you, Paul. I hope you make it. You know that. See you soon. Time will tell, Harvey. Time will tell. Ready. T minus ten, nine, eight. Here we go, my friend. The great adventure begins. Your image is wavering. My God, Paul, I can see the bones through your skin. Get the first coordinates. Two, one, zero. Godspeed, Paul. Godspeed. Exit one Paul Driscoll, a theoretical physicist and a creature of the 21st century. Unknown to his fellow researchers, he has worked up a complicated theorem involving the space-time continuum, built a prototype, a kind of time machine, if you will, and dared to put it to the test with himself as the subject. But he's attempting to use it for a purpose that doesn't include cheap thrills or personal gain. In a moment, he will seek out three history-changing events from the past in a desperate attempt to alter our less-than-perfect present. One of the oddest and most rarefied perks available to faculty members in The Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, No Time Like the Past. Starring Jason Alexander with Stacy Keach as your narrator. There, I've finished my captain's log for tonight. So, you said that this is a matter of some urgency, Mr. Uh... The name is Driscoll, but that's not important. Perhaps you will be good enough to tell me, sir, what this is about. I'm due on the bridge in a few minutes. Captain, 
Is there any possible way you can alter your course? I beg your pardon? The course the ship is taking, can it be changed? Since my country is a belligerent, and these waters are a zone of combat, I would prefer to consult with higher authority before taking such a step. Suppose I were to tell you, sir, that if you hold your present course for five more minutes, this ship will go down. Just who are you, Mr. Driscoll? You won't find me on your passenger list, Captain. Oh? And you got on board how? That's not important. But I'm not sailing for my health this trip, Captain. You might say, I'm sailing for your health, and that of the crew and all the passengers aboard. I happen to know that this ship is going to be torpedoed. Right off the old head of Kinsali Island, May the 7th. That's today. How do you know this? If I were to tell you, you'd say I was a lunatic. I can't alter the course of the Lusitania simply on the word of one man. All right, Captain, say I am a lunatic. Say that everything I'm telling you is just the product of a deranged mind. What would you lose by altering course now? How many minutes? That's not the point. That is the point, Captain. There'll be over 1,100 people drowned. That will be enough, Mr. Driscoll. And if you should be one of the fortunate few, Captain, remember when that court of inquiry convenes. I must ask you to leave, sir. I'm not asking you to scuttle the ship. All I'm suggesting is if you change course one degree, just one single degree. Steward, come in here. Yes, Captain. Escort Mr. Driscoll from my quarters. Yes, sir. Come along if you would, sir. Captain, there's still time. And still time to confine you to your cabin. Take him away. Sailor, take a look at the water off the bow. What do you see? Sir? Something under the water coming this way. Do you see it? Captain, sound the alarm. You. How did you know? Yes? I am here to prepare your room, mein Herr. Uh, that won't be necessary. But I have clean towels, sir, and soap. Uh, just a moment. Ah, you have the loveliest room in the hotel, mein Herr. Yes, 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 it's a lovely view. More than a view, sir. In a minute, from that window, you will see history unfolding. Why do you know that this whole side of the building has been rented? Every floor. All because of the Führer, so they can see him. Down in the street is a madhouse. That's what I was told. You are not German. I'm an American. An American. And what do they think of our Führer and the new Germany in America? We're quite neutral. You say neutral, but you mean something else. No, I, I don't mean anything. You hear? That is the new Germany. Something you will never understand. That, madam, is the old Germany. Something you'll never understand. We will see. All right, just one shot. Not Goering. Only Hitler. Right through the forehead. Come on, buddy. Step into the crosshairs. No! It's jammed! Open up, bitte! Much schnell, Herr Dress! You will open up this door! But I tell you, he was in here! Maybe you were drinking schnapps. There's no way he could have gotten out, except head first through that window! Look! What is that? A rifle! America, come. It's about time. Sit. You're the chief of police? I was told you speak English. I venture to say that I speak it better than you speak Japanese. Uh, I hardly speak any Japanese, but what I'm about to tell you is the most important English you've ever heard. Mr. Driscoll, is it? You happen to be an enemy alien. Which is the reason? Which is the reason I've been kept in a cell for six hours, and the reason you may have cause to regret this particular arrest. Go on. What I tried to tell your guards is that inside of an hour, this city is going to be destroyed. 
and upwards of a hundred thousand human beings will be destroyed along with it. Indeed. You're about to be bombed out of existence. But there's something you can do. Y you can begin some kind of an evacuation of women and children. You can save a few thousand lives. By who say so, Mr. Driscoll? Who do you represent? I don't represent anyone. Only the voice of history. That's extremely poetic, Mr. Driscoll. But most unfortunately, while I am sufficiently educated to appreciate lyricism, my official capacity makes me less prone to enjoy the subtleties and nuances of language for their own sake. All right, look. I'll give this to you very unsubtly, with no nuances at all. There is going to be a bomb dropped here, and you're going to know a nightmare beyond any imagining. Excuse me. Moshi moshi. Hi. Ah, wakarimashita. A single aircraft, Mr. Driscoll. One lone B-29. I rather think we can survive that. That picture on your desk. Your wife? And my two daughters, age eight and ten. If you don't care about the city, do it for them. Look, this isn't just a request. It's in the nature of a... a prayer. Mr. Driscoll, I will make an assumption that you have some illness. I won't stand you against the wall and shoot you. Even in wartime, I'll send you to the army headquarters, where you can be interrogated. You're an alien, and by rights should be interned. However, if you'll keep this in mind when you get back to your country, the face of the enemy is not devoid of compassion. And you might recall this conversation. If you survive, remember that the same thing could be said of your enemy. He tried to save Hiroshima. God. Hey, take this man away. Where? Where did he go? And what? What is the great flash of light outside? Go on, Paul. Then what? Then nothing. The SS Lusitania, 1915, one of the causes of the First World War. Attempt number one. Failure number one. Then August 1939, the Hotel Berlin. <laughs> Another blow for law and order. Hitting nothing and accomplishing the same. Finally Hiroshima, August 1945. Three tries. Three misses. Then you have to admit it now, Paul. The past is inviolate. What's happened must remain as it was. You can't change anything. Yes. I believe you. And so it follows that there isn't anything we can do about the present. <laughs> See that small brown book on the shelf? Bring it over to me, Harv, would you? The study of 19th century Midwest America. This one of yours? Mm. Particular favorite. Open it up to, uh, to page 14. Talks about a certain place. I'll have a place called Homeville, Indiana. There are pictures showing what it looked like in 1881. Charming. Parasols, bicycles. All very serene. Apropos of what? Apropos of the fact that I'm going back there. One last trip in the machine. I thought you were going to destroy it, whether you succeeded or not. <laughs> going back there not to change anything, but simply to become a part of that world. A world of band concerts and summer nights on front porches. A world that hasn't heard of atomic bombs or germ warfare or anything else. That's where I'm going, Harvey. I've already packed my bag. The only book I'm taking with me is this one. Of course you are. And there's no one who could hold you back. But remember this, everything is cause and effect. You go back in time to this, this Homeville, and you inadvertently change one event, alter it minutely. You might start a chain reaction beyond anything even you could imagine. I'm going back there to live, not to change what doesn't need to be changed. Now, Harvey, here are the coordinates. How about it? All right. God help me, Paul. And God help you. Then, let's do it.
How is it with you, Harvey? All set. The mechanism's still charged. Enter the coordinates. Here we go, then. Five, four, three, two, one. How is it with you, Paul Driscoll? Wherever you are. No television sets. No nuclear arms. But just the same. How is it with you? What's yours, sir? I think, uh, a beer, please. That'll be a nickel. A nickel? That's the price tag. You got five cents? <laughs> I think I might. That's a five-dollar gold piece. You, uh, you from around here? No, no, uh, from out of state. Just passing through? Well, as a matter of fact, I, I was thinking of settling down here. It's exactly as I thought it would be. Know anything about the uh, boarding house across the square? Ma Chamberlain's. Real nice accommodations. Runs a clean place. Well, then I guess I'd better drink up and uh, check it out. Come in. I brought you some clean linens. Room comfortable enough for you? Oh, very. Thank you. Should be. No mid-afternoon sun, southern exposure, and the best view I got. You a traveling man, Mr. Driscoll? No, Mrs. Chamberlain, I'm not. I don't hold with traveling men. What is your business? I'm a physicist. Hmm. Someday when I got more time, you can explain that one to me. Now, I might as well tell you the rules of the house. No visitors after 8.30. Lady visitors in the drawing room downstairs. No gambling, no chewing. Breakfast at 7.30 sharp. Dinner at noon, supper at 6. If you're late, you're out of luck. Each week's bill paid in advance. I think I understand. Well, I'll be going now. Got plenty to do. Will you be joining us for supper, Mr. Driscoll? I'd love to. That'll be a chance to meet the other boarders. Mr. Hoffman, Mr. Hanford, he's from the bank, and Miss Sloan. She teaches school here in town. Lovely girl. And a moral one, too. Very moral. I see. Well, you'd better. I run a decent place. Did I mention no hard liquor in the rooms? I'll remember that, Mrs. Chamberlain. See that you do. Afternoon, then. Nuclear fallout. Strategic wars in the Middle East. What happened to all that? It's summer. It's the first of July. There's going to be an evening band concert in a couple of days with... Lemonade and fireworks. It's 1881 in Homeville, Indiana. And by God, I'm home. But I tell you, Mrs. Chamberlain... More apple pie, Mr. Hanford. Until this government assumes its rightful place in the world, we will remain an isolated, provincial community of states. You know what we should do? Oh, no, Mrs. Chamberlain. I could need another bite. We should take the American fleet, send it over to the Orient, and plant the American flag. And then down to Australia and back across the Pacific to South America, planting the flag as we go, planting her deep and planting her high, flying her proud. You ought to run for office, Mr. Hanford. Believe me, Mr. Hoffman, I've thought of it. My friends have urged me to make my opinions known on some official plane, but finance comes first. It's the lifeblood of the nation. The bank needs me. You there, Mr. Driscoll, what are your views? I, uh, I don't have any, Mr. Hanford. Of course you do, man. Everyone has views on the destiny of our country. Now you take the case of the Indian Wars. All this nonsense about giving them land. As if savages could understand treaties. <laughs> Why, we should have had 20 George Custers and 100,000 men and just swept across the plains, destroying every redskin in sight. I think the country is tired of fighting, Mr. Hanford. 
We were bled dry by the late war. I think anything we can accomplish by treaty, as long as it saves lives, is very much the proper course to pursue. My dear young lady, I trust that this isn't the pap you spoon-feed your students. Treaties indeed. Peace. The virility of a nation is in direct proportion to its fighting abilities. Well, I will live to see the day when this country fields an army of a million men who can sweep away anything in its path. Oh, your pardon, Mrs. Chamberlain. I get carried away. Now, you're not some kind of pacifist, too, are you, Driscoll? Me? No, no, I... I guess I'm just a poor fool who's seen too many young men die because of too many old men who fight their battles at dining room tables. Oh, my goodness. I take offense at that remark. And I take offense at armchair warriors who don't know what a shrapnel wound feels like, or how death smells after three days in the sun, or the look in a man's eyes when he knows he's minus one leg and the blood is seeping out of him. You have an enthusiasm for planting the flag, Mr. Hanford, but you don't even have a nodding acquaintance with what it's like to bury men in that same soil. I'll not sit here and listen to talk like that. Of course you won't. You'll go back to your bank, and it'll be business as usual until the next dinner time when you'll give us another vacuous speech about a nation growing strong by filling up its graveyards. Well, you're in for some gratifying times, Mr. Hanford. There'll be a lot of graveyards to fill. In Cuba, then in France, then all over Europe and the Pacific. You can sit on the sidelines and wave pennants because by your definition, this country is going to get virile as the devil. From San Juan to Inchon, we'll show how red our blood is because we'll spill it. And there are two very unfortunate aspects to all this. One is that you'll never have to spill any. And the other is that you won't live long enough to know how right I am. Oh, dear, such a violent man. Excuse me, please. Mr. Driscoll. Well, have I properly endeared myself to everyone inside? I've been here almost two years, Mr. Driscoll. Two years of mealtimes with Mrs. Chamberlain's homemade pies and Mr. Hanford's rhetoric. I lost a father and two brothers in the war, all three on a single afternoon. I was just an infant at the time, but for the twelve years my mother lived, we had a funeral every day. She never stopped mourning. I think they died for something, Mr. Driscoll. But tonight, for the first time, somebody made a point that patriotism doesn't have to mean dying. Thank you for saying that, Miss Sloan. Call me Abby, Mr. Driscoll. Paul. Do you know something, Paul? You look like a man in love. Not with a woman. With... with a moment. A place. What did you mean when you said other graveyards, other wars? Those names, what are those places? It doesn't matter. Why do I get the feeling that... that you're standing outside looking in? That you're just passing by? I don't want to pass by, Abby. I want to come in. I wish... I wish I could. Why can't you? Everything is possible everything. Is it? I wish I could be sure. I... I believe I already am. Garfield's been shot! Quickly, what's the date? Why, the 2nd of July. Did he say the president's been shot? July 2nd, 1881, that's right. President James Abraham Garfield shot in a Washington railway station. But it just came over the telegraph. How do you know? How could you? You're wrong, Abby. Not everything is possible. Why, Paul? I can't tell you why. But it begins again. What do you mean? Nothing. So be it, then. So be it. It's late, Abby. Very, very late. It's time to go home. Oh, good morning, Paul. Mr. Driscoll, we uh, missed you at breakfast. Uh, sorry, I, I must have overslept. Is that the morning paper? Yes, you may read it if you like. I'm finished. The president was badly wounded. So I see. But there's hope for his recovery. 
I guess sometimes that's all that's left, isn't it? Hope. I suppose so. Maybe that's wrong. Maybe we should be more realistic. If we find something that we want and need but can't have, perhaps we shouldn't give in to hope. Abby, I... I'm sorry. I, I wish I could explain it to you, but I can't. It... I, I couldn't make you understand. It's perfectly all right. Really, it is. You've got to forgive school teachers. They're inclined to... to read too many things into a glance, a word, a touch. Well, I've got a busy day today. So much to do preparing for tomorrow. Parade at nine, square dancing at eleven, games from noon to five, picnic supper, and then fireworks. And my children, of course. Your children? Twenty-seven flat little voices. Fourteen boys, thirteen girls, who will entertain you with their rendition of Columbia, the gem of the ocean, sung in twenty-seven different keys. I wouldn't miss it for the world. May I ask you a question? Please. Who are you, Paul Driscoll? And where are you really from? And that book you carry, what is it? It's just an old book of mine. It's nothing. Is it? All right, then. We'll leave it at that. How do, Mr. Driscoll? Morning, Mr. Hoffman. She does an awful good job with those kids, Miss Sloan. So I've heard. Pretty, too, for a school mom. The ones I had when I was a kid, they looked like they came out of a pickle jar. <laughs> Mine, too. You like this town? More than I can say. Well, you might make it here if you've got what it takes. And from what I've heard, I'd say you do. You want to be more careful with your words, though. Mostly Republicans. Still and all, a nice little town. Doesn't change. That schoolhouse, I'll bet she's 75 years old as she stands. And I expect she'll stand till somebody pulls her down. Well, morning to you, Mr. Driscoll. I'm off to work. God bless President Garfield. The school building. That's what I was trying to remember. Oh, my dear God. The site of the Homeville National Bank, formerly occupied by a school built in 1823 and gutted by fire on July 3rd, 1881, injuring 12 children. The fire was caused by a kerosene lantern on a runaway wagon. And I can't do anything. I can't warn anyone. It has to happen the way it's supposed to, like the president. I'm sorry, Mr. Garfield. Recover, you shall not. You're to die on September 19th of this year. And the schoolhouse, you are to burn this afternoon. A dozen children injured, and God help me, I have to stand by and let it happen. by a kerosene lantern on a runaway wagon. No! Everything is cause and effect. Go back in time to this home bill. Change one event. Alter it minutely. You might start a chain reaction beyond anything even you can imagine. How are you today, Mr. Driscoll? Whiskey, please. Bother you, does it? What? Those kids trying to sing. Well, they won't be at it long. What's that? Hard to keep them in during the summer. But Abby's doing a good job of it. Give me another one, will you? Sure thing. Something wrong? I ain't trying to butt in on your personal affairs, but... You drink like a troubled man. If a man needs it, he needs it. So, drink your fill. And may you drown them out, whatever they are. What time is it? Ten minutes or two? I give him another ten minutes or so. I've got to try. How's that? Why the devil doesn't she let them out of there? How's that? Nothing. Just a runaway wagon with a kerosene lantern. That's all it takes. Oh, 
All right, neighbors, gather round and get ready for a revelation. Just close right in next to the bag. That's it. Know why I'm holding up this lantern? You're going to tell us anyway, ain't you? Like Diogenes, good friends, I'm looking for an honest man. Well, you ain't going to find one here. An honest man who'll try one sip of Dr. Malone's alternative and tell me it's not the finest medicine he's ever tasted. This little bottle right here, why, it combines all the treatments for scrofula, King's Evil, ulcers, indolent tumors, rheumatism, gout, scurvy, neuralgia, enlargement of the bones, joints, and glands, not to mention the liver and spleen, also tetter, ringworm, biles, and carbuncles, and the cost, friends, a mere 25 cents the bottle. Do me a favor, will you? What's that, young man? Don't light the lantern. Why, I have to light it, to shed light on the subject. Please, put it out. An incredible price, you say? I'm not in the business for profit. I travel the length and breadth of this glorious nation to cure the sufferings of mankind. The ridiculously low price barely covers the cost of ingredients, bottling, and my own primitively simple existence. How about you, madam? Nervous disease? Dropsical swellings or constitutional disorders guaranteed to alter a depraved or impure state of the blood and other bodily fluids. Well, I suppose I'll try it. Better give me one, too. How much if I buy two? Why not a dozen? Take them home to your family and your neighbors. One twenty-five cent piece each. That's all. How about you, young fella? One swallow. And you'll feel more manliness coursing through your body. Unhitch the horses. What's the trouble? Dyspepsia? Liver complaint? Here's what you need. I need those horses unhitched from the other end of your wagon. Now you listen here, young man. They've stopped singing. That means they're almost finished. Look, I can't argue with you anymore. You've got to unhitch those horses. This wagon mustn't move from this spot. You get out of here now. Go on. You hear me? All right, then. I'll do it myself. Get away from my horses! Abby! Abby, get the children out of the schoolhouse! There's going to be a fire, do you hear me? There's going to be a... Come on! Hold there! Stop! Oh, it's the whole schoolhouse! It's a fire wagon! Oh my god, the children! Get out, children! Run! Run! The children! Stay back! But I've got to get them out! Stop them! Hold them down! It's too late, mister! It's too late! Ugh. Paul! Abby! The children... We got them out. Only a few were injured, none badly. Twelve children. How did you know? You did, didn't you? You knew it would happen. At two o'clock this afternoon, what I didn't know was that I would cause it. Who are you? It really doesn't matter. I shouldn't have come here. It can't work. I know too many things. Too many tomorrows. All the wars, all the catastrophes, all the tomorrows. How, Paul? How did you know? You're part of history, Abby. You and this town and the people in it, and I can't change you. I can't even touch you. Why not? Because the past is inviolate. It belongs to those who lived it. It's not for interlopers, but those who pass by and look in and wish they were a part of it. Goodbye, Abby. Stay well. Where are you going? Back to where I came from. Where I belong. I wanted bandstands and summer nights, serenity. But the infinitely complicated mechanism of a human being. <laughs> he can't live with the threat of a bomb, and he can't live with burned out school buildings either. The finite or the infinite, it doesn't make any difference. He's always his brother's keeper. In a way, it was more than I expected because you were here. I've overstayed my welcome.
Hello, Harvey. Back so soon? <laughs> As it happens, back a little late. You changed something? I tried to. And in doing that, I, I caused it. And now, where do you go, Paul? Here. Where I belong. That's what I've learned, to leave the yesterdays alone. I'd rather do something about tomorrow. That's what counts. The tomorrows. God, let there be tomorrows. Incident on a July afternoon, 1881. A man named Driscoll who came and went, and in the process learned a simple lesson, perhaps best said by a poet named Lathbury, who wrote, Children of yesterday, heirs of tomorrow, what are you weaving, labor and sorrow? Look to your looms again, faster and faster fly the great shuttles, prepared by the master. Life's in the loom, room for it, room. Our tale of clocks and calendars in the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop, twilightzoneradio.com. Visit twilightzoneradio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. No Time Like the Past, starring Jason Alexander with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcherson and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Doug James, Michelle Graff, Nicholas Ruddle, Christian Stolte, Micah Jacoby, Owen Yen, Linda Ryder, Roderick Peoples, Rich Kamenick, Carl Amari, Vince Amari, Paul Patch, and Richard Shavzin. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Paul Patch, Terry Jennings, the American Forces Radio and Television Service, our sponsors, and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Not much of a town, eh, Major? Just the one street. That much easier to secure. Yes, sir. Tell the men we'll stop here for the day. Bring up the supply wagon. Company! Ho! Have them water the horses first. Some of them need chewing. Well, there's a blacksmith shop. But no blacksmith. Or anybody else, for that matter. Looks like they all just cut and run. It's Johnny Reb for you. Leave nothing behind. I got a feeling, though. Don't you, Major? What feeling? 
like eyes. Eyes? Where? That's just it, sir. I, I don't know. But I sure got the feeling. On the back of my neck. Like we're being watched. Maybe... Maybe this town ain't so empty after all. No place to hide. A few stores, church. If there's a sniper up there, he'd be a fool to take on this many. Well, it's like you say, sir. Johnny Reb's got more guts than brains. Take two men and look around. Miller! Sir? Check out the general store. Davis, you take the livery stable. Ain't nothing there, Captain. I can see it from here. You make certain, son. That's an order. <sighs> yes, sir. The rest of you, see to your mounts. Well, I'll be. Will you look at that? What is it? Captain, I think you better see this. Hold your fire! What do you see? Miller. Miller? Davis? What happened to them? I don't know, Major. They went around that storefront at the end. <laughs> what the... The time is 1863. The place is a valley in the state of Virginia. The event is a mass bloodletting known as the Civil War, a tragic time when the country split into two fragments, each fragment deeming itself a separate nation. It's been a long and brutal slaughter with no end in sight, and those who survive have learned to expect the unexpected. But in just a moment, the captain and the major and their entire company will make contact with an enemy they cannot defeat in an outpost not found on any military map. An outpost found only in the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story, Still Valley, starring Adam West with Stacy Keach as your narrator. <laughs> You want more coffee, Private? That what it is. Chicory, maybe a little sawdust, but it's hot. Obliged. I've tasted worse. I just don't remember where. What is it? Quiet. You hear something down there? Thought I did. Yanks? Maybe. Whatever it was, I don't hear it anymore. I didn't hear nothing. You never hear nothing, Dogger. Just sit in your duff and wait it out. Where's your carbine, soldier? Huh? Oh, it's, uh, it's over there. A lot of good it'll do you laying on the ground. What do you mean? What if the Yanks showed up? What do you do? If the Yanks was here? You reckon you know how to work this thing? Yeah, I know how, all right. And if you pull the trigger, you reckon it'll fire? I reckon. Then show me. Hey, what's the idea? The idea is you aren't a right arm to me, or a left arm. You're just some extra baggage that breathes through his mouth and splits half my rations. You mad about something? Fed up is more like a dogger. When do you figure to shape up by the end of the war? I do my part. Yeah, like an army mule. Why don't you just go down there and give up? The Yanks will treat you real good, while General Bobby Lee's off fighting the war for you. I didn't used to be like this. Yeah? When did you up and change? It used to be... Used to be I never gave any thought to fighting. Some kind of game we were playing, like when I was a kid. Hide and go seek, king of the mountain, blind man's bluff. Now it ain't that way anymore, Paradine. I've seen too much of this war. We've all seen too much, but we keep fighting. Some do. Some can't no more. I was at the second Manassas. I think that's where, where, come to me sudden like. What did? It's like this, Paradine. I had my two brothers there. One of them was 15 years old, that's all. 15. I was right alongside him, going up a hill. A mini ball came out of nowhere, hit him dead center. Took him three hours to die. It was just a kid, just a little screaming kid. That was my brother, Phil, my older brother, Kearney. 
He was dead the next morning. Wanted to be a preacher. Always talking about the gospel. Words of Luke. Words of John. Words of the prophets. He ran out of words. And God run out on him. But you, you don't have a nerve in your body, I guess. Oh, I got him. Just as many as you, from head to boots. But I don't concern myself as much as you. You're worrying about dead men and lost battles. That's just too much area to fret in. Then what do you worry about? I'm worrying about two scouts on a mission. Us. And a piece of dirty brown paper with orders written on it. It says right here. It says the Yanks are going to take up a position in Chanau Valley. We're supposed to scout them out, see if we run into their videttes, and then check back the minute they get into that town down there. I know, but that don't mean I have to feel jubilation about it. Take some advice, Dogger. Don't mark it by the day. You're worrying about Tuesday before Monday's up. Keep the view long, son. Then you can live with it a mite better. You hear him again? Sure do. Yanks? Yanks, probably. Horses, positive. How many? Just a patrol, I figure. Maybe 20, 30 men in all. That's funny. What is it? Listen. I don't hear nothing. I know you don't, but I heard horses, and they come from down there in the valley. They're Yanks. There isn't any question about it. How come you think that? Because everybody else in these parts is packed up and moved out before the fighting gets here. Come away from the edge, Joe. This ain't no place to stand out in the open. If they are Yanks, they'd be in that town already. It'd be as noisy as a county fair. But now, there ain't a sound anymore. Maybe they've gone away. I reckon I better get down there and take a closer look. I wouldn't do that. I know you wouldn't. Joe! Joe! You don't need to go! We got orders. Let's pull out. And just ride away. Both of us. You wait here with your horse if I don't come back. Listen, Joe. We know they're down there, right? You heard them. Well, we found out what we had to find out. Where they are. The Yanks are in the valley. So now we go back and report it. And what's the point of... The point is, we gotta count their heads and their horses and their guns. We gotta look at the regimental numbers so our boys will know what's coming. That's enough point for you, Private? I don't care no more. I don't care. I got only one big mission left, and that's to stay alive. I say we go down there and wave an undershirt and throw down our rifles and... <coughs> Why'd you hit me? Mr. Dogger, I extend my sympathy so long as you keep your yellow inside. But the minute it crawls over to me and tries to climb up on my horse, too, then I withdraw my sympathy. You understand? Yeah. I understand. I pledge everything I got to this war, and all I get is the back of your hand. So far, you and me have pledged nothing to the Confederacy except maybe empty bellies and lack of sleep. But a couple of hundred thousand others, including your own brothers, pledged a whole lot more. And now you're making it appear they did it for nothing. Now you pick up your rifle and stand at the ready. I got it. Good. If you hear a shot, that means they're down there in force. And you get back to camp at a fast gallop. Tell the lieutenant what happened. If you don't hear from me in 15 minutes, get back there anyway. You really going alone? Just me and this brave horse. For want of anything else. Wait right here, old girl, while I take a look around. Try to find us some water and grub. Yankees must have been here and gone. What's wrong? You smell something? Never did hear them right out, if they are here. 
Easy, horse, easy. That's only church bells. Must be the wind. Has to be the wind. Who's there? Come on out with your hands up. If you're in there, why don't you show yourself? You a yellow yank, that it? I got you, drop you. Where'd you go? If there's a yellow Yankee hiding in one of these stores, you better come out right now. I'm taking you prisoner. Put your hands in the air, or I'm coming in. I'll blow you to kingdom come, I swear. Ain't no Yankees, just me. You come close to dying, old man. Did I now? You better start talking fast. What would you like to hear? Some answers. Tell me who you are and what you're doing here. I was about to ask you the same question, son. When I first seen you come up the street, I thought you was a yank. You don't know how close you come to die. What were you going to use, Grandpa? You're not carrying a gun. Don't need a gun. Been doing just fine without one. What you got a hold of there? What's it look like? You've seen a book before, haven't you? That Bible's pretty heavy to throw, all right. I reckon you could knock out the whole Union Army with it. No, this ain't no Bible. <laughs> And I wasn't aiming to throw it. Just use it. Like I used it on them. On who? The Yanks. I took them all out. Every last one. Leastways, every one that rode in here. Sure you did, Grandpa? Oh, I done it all right. What'd you do, read to them? Not to them. At them. And they turned tail. Just like that. Nope. It was the town folk packed up and left. Then what happened to the Yankees? They're still here. I suppose you got them all hogtied, hmm? Come on, I'll show you. Over behind the blacksmiths. I don't need to play your games. Just tell me where to water my horse. What about grub? Ain't you hungry? Of course I am, but this town's been picked clean by bluecoats. <laughs> You're wrong about that, too, son. There's plenty of food. Sure there is. You think I'm lying? Feast your eyes on this. Well, that's a Union Army supply wagon. What'd I tell you? It's still full of crates. Most of them not even opened yet. Guns, ammo, clothes, rations. Take your pick, Johnny Reb. I don't believe it. This here is real salt pork. First meat I've had in two weeks. Eat your fill. Wait a minute. You saying the Yanks rode out and left all this behind? That doesn't make sense. Like I told you, Johnny, they didn't ride out. They're still here. Where are they, old man? Talk or by God, I'll... Turn around. What? Meet the Major. What is that? A statue? Well, now, you ever see a statue sitting on a real horse? But they're not moving. No, sir, they're sure not. And neither's the rest of them. The rest? Of the company. Are they dead? <laughs> sure, sure. Standing up, big as life, all 19 or 20 of them. Then they're sleeping. Sleeping on their feet. That one over there, he was cleaning his rifle. And that one, well, he took his boot off, and he's still standing on one foot. And this one, he was just drinking out his canteen, and he done fell asleep with his eyes wide open. Plague, then. Something in the water. The water's fine. Nice and sweet. Some kind of sickness, but that could take hours. And it wouldn't get them all at the same time. I told you. I put him to sleep. There must be some natural explanation. Natural? Now, don't that take off. What happened to them Yanks ain't natural. This is what done it. This here book and what's in it. <laughs> Give me that book. No, you don't, Johnny. This here is still my book. 
for now. Hey, hey, Yank, wake up. I'm the only one can do that. This is crazy. They must be asleep. No wounds, not a sign of blood. Go on, wake up. None of you are dead. Wake up, Yanks. I'm taking you all prisoner. I told you. It has to come out in this book. But you don't believe me. You think I'm lying. I didn't call you no liar. This here is what done it. Give me that. Now you're gone and done it. What kind of book is this? Can't you read, Johnny? The front of it says witchcraft. You better be real careful. Dropping it in the dirt? That wasn't bright of you. That wasn't very bright of you at all. Anything happens to this, you'll be in a real fix. Listen, old man. I expect you're harmless, but I got no time to fiddle with black magic or any other old men's games. Games? <laughs> games, you call it? And here in front of your eyes stands the enemy. Not a twitching, not even a moving an eyeball. Now look, old-timer. I flat out don't understand this. I don't understand it at all, but there's a war on. I got no time to just stand here, John. I'll take my book back, if you don't mind. Here. Good riddance. All ye horsemen and ye footmen conjured here at this time, I command you to be still! Oh, Johnny, you didn't believe me. What about it now? I reckon you'll have to believe me, being as you can't move a muscle, being as you can't speak a word. Didn't want to do that to you, because you're one of us. But you wouldn't listen. Well, now you will. Look at this one right here, for instance. Standing up straight as a ramrod. He's a major by his stripes. And he's carrying his marching orders. Says this here's just an advance party. Soon as the rest come by, I'll do the same to them, too. You listening, Johnny? I know you can still hear me, because I only used half the power. Now, let me introduce myself and tell you my story. Name's Teague. I'm a witch man, and my pappy was a witch man afore me. He was the seventh son of a seventh son, and I was his seventh son. I know conjure stuff forward and backward, up and down. It's my living. Folks in China will make fun of me, like they did my pappy, but they buy my charms. Things to bring love or hate if they hanker for them. Cures for sick hogs and calves. Sayings to drive away fever. All them things I'd done for Chanow folks all my life. You understand? If you finally got it, blink your left eye. Good. That's good. Now you can move again. I'll say the words. Ye lone horsemen conjured here in this spot. Ye and ye alone may pass on. <coughs> Mesmerism, that's what it is. Parlor tricks? <laughs> sure, that's what you'd call it. You'd call a rooster a hen and a gelding a bay just to deny what's right and true. Oh, Johnny, I thought you understood. What did you do? Just what I knows how to do. I've been laughed at and told to mind my business. Young'uns hooted and throwed stones. I could have cursed them, but I didn't. No, sir. They was my friends and neighbors in Chanow, and I kept back evil from them. But I couldn't move. I couldn't blink an eye. Just like the Yanks. When they come, everybody run afore them but me. Invaders, tyrants, thieving skunks in blue. But I fixed them. I didn't do no running. I carried this book out into the street, and I read the words, and you can see what happened. Now you listen, and you listen good, Johnny Reb. You fight the Yanks with everything you got. That's what I intend to do. Let me see those orders. From General T.F. Kotler, commanding 4th Division, Union Army, you will move immediately with your entire force, taking up a strong defensive position in the Chanow Valley. Hear that? His entire force. There's more coming. You and me got things to talk over, Johnny Reb. What things? I heard all I need. You got to understand. 
This book here don't have nothing to do with mesmerism. This is conjure stuff. And what I done to these Yanks, I can do to the rest of them. I can freeze them in their tracks. I can open up a path to Washington, D.C., so that Bobby Lee could ride in there with no more than three Confederate troopers and take over the whole country. That's what I can do with this book here. That's what I can do. You hear me? Magic? You claim it's magic. I don't claim. I say. It's what I read in this book. And now you've seen it. You've failed it. And you could... you could do this to the whole Union Army? Could and would. Why don't you? Why don't you, old man? For one good reason. And one good reason only. It better be a good one. If you have the power to turn the war to our side... I'm going to die. I'm going to die before the sun goes down. How do you know that? How? I can feel it in my bones. I can smell death. I seen the raven on the wing. I heard it coming. It's on a white horse, galloping this way. It's a pounding in my heart, a galloping and a galloping straight at me. Old Mr. Death ready to pluck me out of the living. So I ain't going to be around long enough to do what's got to be done. Then if you won't do it, who will? I'm leaving it to you. Me? That's right. But why me? A book ain't the only thing I can read. I can tell the look of a man. Eyes, head, hold on his weapon. I can tell all about that man. So I'm choosing you. Everything you need, you can find in this book. Spells, magic, curses, charms, everything. Here, take it. Oh, it don't seem right. It don't seem right at all. There's something about all this. Something. Something like what? Something unclean. Look at these pictures, animals, symbols, things I've never seen before. It's like being in league with... Say it, Johnny Reb. You got it right. Now say it like it needs to be said. With... with the devil. That's it. That's who you're in league with now, Johnny. That's who we'll have fighting on the side of the South. The devil himself. <laughs> the devil. The devil. Oh, easy. Who goes there? Dogger. Troop scout. Advance and be recognized. I'm advancing. Now put that rifle down. I got a message for the lieutenant. That's you, Dogger? Yes, sir. You've been gone a long time. We almost gave you up. Dead or prisoner by this time, that's what we figured. Neither, lieutenant. Where's the other scout? I don't rightly know, sir. What do you mean by that? Well, if I did know, I'd sure tell you. Talk sense, man. Well, sir, it's like this. Paradine, he rode off to the valley a while ago. Said if he didn't come back, to tell you as fast as I can. And he didn't come back? No, sir. He sure didn't. I've been riding like the wind. So the Yanks are here. Can't say that, sir. Not for sure. Why not? It was mighty strange back there. Not a sound that I could hear. Paradine, he said he heard horses riding into town. Think if it was, they never come out. Well, why should they? They're bivouacked while they prepare for tomorrow's battle. One thing, sir. If they did ride in, they plumb disappeared once they got there. What are you talking about, soldier? It's like they rode into a hole and got covered over. Them and the horses. Not a hoot or a holler out of them after that. Like they rode off the edge of the world. Or into a hole like... like a great big grave. What happened to Trooper Paradine? Well, sir, I... I reckon by now he's buried somewhere down there in that lonesome valley with the rest of them. Buried and never coming back. Good girl. Drink your fill while I do the same. Johnny. Where'd you go? Filling up my canteen, old man. 
Sorry, Johnny. Must have dozed off. That's okay. Stay lying down. You don't look so good. Almost sundown. <laughs> Not much time. Oh, now there's plenty daylight left. Drink of water? <laughs> Thank you kindly. <coughs> I told you. I only got till sundown. After that, it's all up to you. That ain't gonna happen. You're feeling stronger, I can tell. Oh, no. <clears throat> Just a few more minutes. That's all you gotta wait. Just a few more minutes. What are you telling me? Read it. Read it. You hear me? I said stay down. Johnny Reb, you hear me? You got to read from it out loud. Here. <coughs> right here. It takes your blood on the first page. Oh, come on. That settles the pact. That makes the contract. Your blood mixed with mine on the front page. You need food is what you need. That's the only thing wrong with you. How about some salt pork? <coughs> hey, Johnny Reb. Stars and bars. Here, I'll cut you off some. <laughs> Hoist them high. Would you open your mouth and eat? <coughs> Stars and bars. <coughs> Stars and... and bars. <coughs> oh. oh, man. Don't you do me like that. Oh, dang saber. Now I've gone and cut myself. The blood. It dripped right there in the book, just like you said, old man. Hey, old fella, talk to me. What, what do I do now? Who goes there? Paradine. Let him through. That's the other scout. Lieutenant, he's here. That's you, Paradine? Yes, sir. You see, Dogger, he didn't ride off the edge of the world after all. Joe! Is that you? It's me, all right. I'm sure glad to see you, Joe. I rode back here just like you said. You did good. So the prodigal returns. Some people around here figured you must be dead by now, or a prisoner. Neither one, Lieutenant. No time for either, it appears. Sir? That book in your hand. Man's got to do his reading, doesn't he? It wasn't like that. Well, let's hear it, man. What did you see? More than you'd believe. I'll be the judge of that. Go ahead. I'll try. Where are their advance people? In the town. And the rest of their forces? The main body was spread out behind 2,000 men at least. 60 guns, one troop of cavalry, maybe 50 supply wagons. You drunk or something, Paradine? Not a drop, sir. There hasn't been a sound from that valley all day. Not one sound. Now, I don't care if 2,000 men took off their boots and tied feathers to their feet. Somebody would have heard them. That makes sense to you? Lieutenant, you got every reason to call me crazy. But the reason you didn't hear them is because they're asleep. Why, of all the... Put to sleep by magic, black magic. It's all in this book here. There was an old man, Teague by name. He done it. Then he gave me the book so I can carry on. Paradine. This is an order. You're to take yourself to bed on the double. You're to sleep the night, make your report to me in the morning. This is my report, Lieutenant. There's practically a division of Yankees down there, and they're dead on their feet, not moving a muscle, just standing right out in the open, big as you please, or sitting straight up, the same as they were when the spell hit them. Spell? What spell? It's in the book here, I swear to you. I won't call you mad, Paradine, or drunk. I'll wait till morning, but if you haven't changed your story by then, I'll be ready to charge you with one or the other. You want proof? Of what? A daydream? Here's what you do. In the morning, you send a patrol down there and take a look at the main street of that town. And what will they see? Just what I said. But in the meantime, I think I've done something that'll prove it to you quicker. Where's Mallory's troop? Mallory's not back yet. They went up to the North Ridge late this morning. There was Yanks camped up there. Company strength at least, wasn't there? That's about what we figured, but what's that got to do with... It's got everything to do with what I said. This book. 
On the way back here, on the way back, I read from one of the pages out loud like the old man told me. I wanted to kind of test it, so I conjured up a spell, and I pointed it. I pointed it up there toward the ridge. That's enough. I've heard all I care to hear. Who's that? Sounds like the troops are back. Who's there? Mallory, where's the lieutenant? Now you'll know I've been telling the truth. Sir, reporting in. Glad to see you, Mallory. Warm yourself by the fire, then maybe you can clear something up for us. Paradine here says... I just saw something I can't explain. No more than any of my men can explain it. And they saw it too. We walked up to that ridge in a skirmish line. Scared out of our boots because it was so unearthly quiet. We figured the Yanks were waiting for us just beyond the parapet. They were waiting all right. But not for us. Standing straight and tall, guns to port, and frozen like statues. You mean they were dead? Not dead. Not dead and not alive. Just frozen stock still like rocks. You could see them in the moonlight, not moving. They could have been markers in a graveyard made out of, of, of granite. I swear I don't know what could do a thing like that, and I hope to God I'll never find out. Lieutenant, this is what done it. What's that? A book, but not just any book. Paradine, are you trying to tell me... You heard what he said. If that's true... If it's all true, then this is the devil's work. What's this all about? Is somebody going to tell me? An old man gave me this book. A witch man. You're right, Lieutenant. It is the devil's work. I know that, too. But maybe it's time we called muster on the devil. Maybe that's all that's left to us. We ain't got enough guns. We ain't got enough food. We ain't got enough anything. We're losing, Lieutenant. The Confederacy is cracking up into pieces in front of our eyes. It's bleeding to death every day. There isn't enough blood left in our veins to change things. And the ground won't hold anymore when that runs out. I don't know much about church things. And, and I don't know anything about Satan. All I know is that we had a cause. And it's dying right in front of us. Then, Paradine, please open the book and read what's got to be read. Say it loud and make it good for every Yank army in the field. Freeze them or put them in the ground, but make it good. I'll give it a try. Satan, Satan, I call upon ye in all your power and glory. I call ye in the darkest hour of my need. And in so doing, I do heartily revoke the name of... of... Go ahead, Joe. Finish it. I don't know if I can. You can do it. It calls upon us to revoke God. Give it to me, then. Wait. I'll finish it right now, if you can. Dogger. Now look what you've done. Leave it be. Joe, you, you said yourself... It's all we got left. He's right, Paradine. God help us, but this is all we got left. I don't like the feeling inside me. What do we call them, Lieutenant? Damn Yanks? That's the phrase, isn't it? Damn Yanks? But if I read aloud from this book, it'll be the Confederacy that's damned. It's that book, or it's the end. Then let it be the end. Let it come if it must come. But if it's a cause that has to be buried, let it be buried in hallowed ground. Let it be buried in hallowed ground. And let this be consumed by fire. Let it burn, boys. Maybe he's right. Let it burn. Joe, you awake? Yeah. I was thinking, you probably did right, Joe. 
If we got God on our side, we don't need no witch book. I hope you're right. It'll be all over soon, and then we can go home to what's left and forget all about it. Start over, because it'll be over and done. Likely so. The question is, how long? They say there's a battle going to start tomorrow. Yeah? Yeah, a big one. That's what the talk's been. Where? Some place in Pennsylvania. Could be I burned the book too soon. Whereabouts in Pennsylvania? No, oh, I don't know. I don't recall. Where, Dogger? Where's this battle in Pennsylvania? I don't know. A little town. Never heard of it before. A place called Gettysburg. Gettysburg. Well, I guess this is one we'll have to fight without the devil's help. No matter what happens. May God help us. God help us all. In a time to come, during what will be Joseph Paradine's old and garrulous years, he'll tell anyone willing to listen that the Civil War wasn't lost at Antium or Gettysburg or Shiloh. Rather, he'll insist, the Confederacy's fate was sealed in a little valley hamlet called Shanau. And people will laugh or pity him when he insists that the South lost the war because they refused a certain strategic alliance. But the truth is that such unholy alliances are often the norm rather than the exception in the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop twilightzoneradio.com. Visit TwilightZoneRadio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD. Or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. Still Valley, starring Adam West, with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling from a story by Manly Wade Wellman and adapted for radio by Dennis Etcherson. Heard in the cast were Mike Novak, Richard Hensel, Turk Muller, Doug James, Jeff Lupiton, Christian Stolte, Carl Amari, Vince Amari, and Roger Wolski. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Paul Patch, Terry Jennings, the American Forces Radio and Television Service, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Shouldn't be long, eh, Cap? Not unless they move to Italy. I bet old Benito would like to do that. We're almost there. See that mountain range just over the horizon? Well, now, what do you know? I think I might have seen that a few times. All we do is maintain course, and the boot will pop right up big as life. Sounds like you've done this before, Captain. You like Italian food, Blake? Me? Uh, yeah, spaghetti's okay. 
No meatballs, though. They give me heartburn. Okay. No meatballs. Beautiful day like this, I thought we'd just bomb the supply dump and sit down and have us some lunch before we head back. How's that sound? You picking up the tab? Don't worry about it. This one's on Mussolini, his own personal mess hall. Yeah? Special orders. I hear the Allies can drop in any time. Oh, I get it. So we'll quit pounding him, huh? Plus, he wants to show off what a good cook he is. Watch out for the garlic, though. That's his secret weapon. Lousy greaser. I got something for him. There it is. Target in view, Jimenez. How's our time? On the money, Captain. Set the bomb bay doors. Check. Ready to release on your command. Take her down 400 feet. Hope they don't have no big guns today. They don't. That's why we're gonna win this war. Another 200 feet. Let's drop these babies right down the smokestack. Yes, sir. Is that flak? I don't believe it. Give me some altitude. Looks like the jerks finally got some artillery. Pull up on the stick. I'm pulling. Huh, that was too close for comfort. Pull up, I said. Climbing, Captain. Higher. We're hit! Kratzky, you okay? Waste gun good, Captain. Connors? Missed the tail by a mile. Fine. We took a hit on the starboard engine, sir. Looks like we're losing fuel. Then let's drop our payload and get out of here. Fast. Yes, sir. Mayday, Mayday. This is King 9 calling Firefly. King 9 calling Firefly. Come in, Firefly. This is the war in Europe, 1943. The air spits out violence and destruction, and the sandy graveyard of North Africa swallows it up. Her name is King 9, a B-25 medium-range bomber, 12th Air Force, USAAF. On this hot, still morning, she took off to bomb the southern tip of Italy, manned by a crew who knew the risks when they signed on. Between them, they have several thousand hours of flight time, much of it in combat. They have followed these coordinates before, armed with a deadly payload for the enemy. A fairly routine run, certainly not her first, but unfortunately, it may be her last. Because this time she's taken a hit that's forced her off course and into a region not listed on any map. She won't return to home base on this day or any other. But as Captain Robert Embry is about to find out, like a resilient human being, she dies hard especially in the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, King Nine Will Not Return, starring Adam Baldwin with Stacy Keach as your narrator. What's the damage, Blake? We took a hit on the wing tank, Captain. How bad? Needle's dropping fast. We're leaking fuel. How much? A lot. Jimenez, what's our position? Ten degrees off course, Captain. Airspeed's dropping. Losing altitude. How far from base? Too far. We'll never make it. We may have to ditch. Down there, oh, mama mia. Take a look around. See anything? Nothing but sand, sand, and more sand. Looks like one great big beach and no ocean. Then get ready for some belly surfing. Landing gear? Leave it up. Won't do any good. The sand's too soft. Connors, climb. All crew, strap it in. We're gonna attempt an emergency landing. Flaps down. Level her out! She won't hold! Pull up! Get over that dune! There goes the other engine. Hang on! <laughs> She's holding! We're gonna belly in like a glider. Nice and easy. Piece of cake, Captain. Piece of cake! Watch it. Watch it! We're coming in too fast! I can do this. I promise you. Captain! Look out! I remember now, more and more, one piece at a time. First the wing tank was hit by flak, then we lost fuel, fell behind, veered off course. Not the moment of impact though, the crash, that's still pretty much a blur. But I remember holding the wheel, trying to hold it, the way she bellied in and then yawed at the last second. That brought the nose down into a dune and and all of a sudden it was over. When I couldn't hold her straight, she yawed and skidded through the sand. That must have been the way it happened. It must have been. I honestly don't know how long I was out. It might have been minutes or hours. Uh, uh, 
Hey, guys. Guys! We made it! Hey! Where are you? Where... Where is everybody? We're alive, you hear me? We're still alive! The crew... What about the crew? Did they bail out? Did I order them to bail out? No. No, I didn't. I remember that much. We rode it in together. They stayed with me all the way down. Because I'm the captain. Yeah, that's right. Captain Robert Embry. That's who I am. Blake's my co-pilot. Him and as the navigator. Kransky. Radio op and waste gun. Connors. He was tail gunner. And Klein. Sure. Klein, he was the upper turret gun. Uh, let's see. Who else? Think. <laughs> Gotta think. It was coming back to me, but I wasn't 100%, not by a long shot. My leg was racked up and my head felt like someone caught me with a left jab and a right hook that put me flat on the canvas. Now I saw the plane about a hundred yards away and I knew I had to get back inside to see if the guys were okay. Blake! Jimenez! I kept walking toward it, but it didn't get any closer. That's the way things are in the desert. Something about all that sand and nothing to measure it by. But I kept going. I had to help them if I could. If there was any... Way, any hope. Are you all right? Connors! I climbed up on the wing and finally got in through the gun turret. I dropped down inside. Blake? Blake, answer me. That's an order. And there was Blake's cap on the co pilot's seat. I knew it was his, but I turned it over and looked inside anyway. Blake, Gerald S., First Lieutenant, USAAF, and the radio op. His headset still plugged into the radio, but he wasn't there either. Jimenez. And Connors. All gone. If they were still on board when the plane crashed, then where were their... their bodies? No, no, I couldn't let myself think that way. Piece it together, that's what I have to do. Piece it all together. We bellied in. We bellied in and I must have been thrown clear of the plane. That's what happened. Sure. Knocked me cold. I could have been out for hours. And the others, th they... What about the others? Where are they? They didn't jump. They couldn't have. The chutes are still here. All of them. And they're not dead. They couldn't be dead. There are no... No bodies. But if they left the plane and started walking, why didn't they take me? <gasps> Morse code. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. We're here. Wait. Give that to me one more time. Mayday, Mayday, this is King Nine calling Firefly. King Nine calling Firefly. Pancaked in the desert. One hour, 30 minutes from last checkpoint. Bearing 290 degrees. Terrain flat and sandy. Low hills to the north. No other landmarks. No sign of crew. Mayday, Mayday. King Nine to Firefly. Come in, please. No answer. Nothing in the headphones, not a blasted thing. Easy now. Easy, don't panic. Go back to where this all started. The last thing I remember. I'm sitting in the cockpit. Right here. We're dipping. The ground's coming up to meet us, and we're sitting down hard. Flaps down. Level her out. Get over that dune. She won't hold. I can do this. I promise you. Crew. The whole crew was in the plane, and now they're gone, all of them. And I'm here with a king-size headache. So what? I got off easy. Nothing to worry about. But the main thing, the main thing is not to forget. I'm responsible for this crew. I'm in charge. 
As far as it's within my power, I've got to keep them alive. I've got to keep them out of this. Every last man. I command this aircraft, and I'm responsible. I'm in charge. Nobody else. I'm responsible for all of them. Klein, Jimenez, Connors, Blake, Kransky, every last man. Who's out there? Blake! Is that you? Blake? Blake! No. It's not you, is it? Just a piece of the tail assembly. Well then... Where are you, Blake? Over there? On the other side of the dune? Or... Or the other direction, toward the hills? Guess you wouldn't leave any footprints. Not for long in this wind. What in the... What is this? Klein, William F. Tech Sergeant USAAF. Klein? Sergeant Klein? You incredibly stupid jerk. You dropped your canteen. You dumb Bronx cowboy, you idiot. You're gonna need water out here. Don't you know that? Don't you know anything? I still got a nurse made you, huh? Is that it? This is some crew I got here. <laughs> some crew, all right. Run around dropping canteens full of water. You couldn't find your way off a golf course without a map. And I gotta stick around and wipe your noses and comb your hair and see that you wash behind your ears because you... You're the worst bunch of survivors I ever... Wait. That's the plane. Somebody's trying to start her up. But... Who? Hey! Hold up! That's my plane! But... Who's in the cockpit? Who's in my plane? Is that you, Blake? Blake! I see you! Right there, in the pilot's seat. <laughs> Don't tell me that's not you. Look at me, over here! I'm over here! Blake! 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 It's Embry! It's me! It's the captain! I'm here! I'm here, Blake! Blake, what's the matter with you? Can't you hear me? Blake! Where are you? Where'd you go? What's the gag, Blake? Hey, come on, fellas! If this is a gag, knock it off! It's not funny anymore! Strictly not funny at all! Why are you guys hiding from me? Don't you get it? I'm only trying to do my job! That was when I knew, really knew, something was very wrong. It was more than the flak and veering off course and the crash and not knowing where I was. Oh, I was in the desert all right. But where exactly and where was my crew? Huh? If someone was playing mind games with me, the question is who and for what reason? Because wherever I was now, I wasn't just in the middle of a desert in North Africa. If I was the only one there, after all, then the mind games had to be going on in my own head, and not anybody else's. The big question was... Why? The first thing I had to do was pull myself together and find out if I really was alone. And if I was, what the devil had happened to the others? I had to find out, don't you see? Whether I survived or not, I had to know. Gonna be a long night. Get a campfire going, then they'll see where I am. Hey! You out there, guys? <laughs> sure you are. You started walking, didn't you? With or without your canteens and your rations. But you won't get very far. You couldn't have. I wasn't out that long. Ooh, watch it, boys. The animals are restless tonight. Whatever kind of animals live in the desert. Blake! Jimenez! Connors! Klein! The whole lot of you! This is your captain speaking! 
Look over your shoulder. Here I am. I'm waiting. This is King Nine. King Nine calling Firefly. Come in, Firefly. Let me tell you something, Firefly, if you're still out there. Now listen up. You better respond before the batteries run out, because I might not be here when you fly over. I might not even be here now. For all I know, I'm already dying out there. Lying in the sand with a fractured skull. This is all going on inside my brain-damaged head. For all I know, this whole thing is one big hallucination. Sure. Think about it. If I see something, or if I only think I see something, how can I tell the difference? How could I be sure? Could you? You ever have a nightmare, Firefly? Huh? Really bad nightmare? Well, you were scared, weren't you? Just the same as if it really happened. Sure you were. Yeah. Your eyes moved around and you were breathing fast and your heart was beating a mile a minute. So what's the difference? I mean, really, what's the answer? The only way you ever found out was when you woke up. This whole time, I, I could be sleeping, having a dream. Maybe I'll wake up and I'll be back at the base, or... I tied one on, and I'm in a booth right now with a girl I met in a bar someplace. Oh, wouldn't that tear it? Wouldn't that really, truly tear it? <laughs> when the medics get a hold of me, they'll never let loose. They'll put me in a straitjacket and send me on tour like a freak. If they ever let me out of the loony bin, that is. But for now, I think I'll just take that chair him and as we're sitting in and carry it outside and keep the fire burning. Cause that's the only thing I can do till wake up. Uh, uh, hallucination, hell. I saw Blake. I saw my co-pilot sitting in that cockpit. That was no hallucination. I saw him. Nobody can tell me any different. Maybe I'm a little woozy, but I'm not that far gone yet. Uh, concentrate. Gotta keep my head clear. Piece it together. I'm Robert Embry, Captain. I fly a B-25 bomber. It's called King Nine. It crash landed in the desert. This desert right here. Because I ran out of fuel. Yes, I did. I did that. And now I gotta keep the fire going. So they'll see. And come back. You're responsible for the ship and the men. You, mister. Now you gotta pick up the dice and you gotta throw until you make a pass. That's the hand and you gotta make it. Six the point. Six crewmen. They're in your hands. So what do you do first? You build the fire up. The chair will burn a long time, soon as it catches. Here's some more newspaper. On the base this morning. What's it say on the front page? Uh, can't make it out. Picture of a plane. B-25 Mitchell aircraft found. Just like this one. Whose plane is that? Another one went down. Well, at least they found it. Maybe they'll find this one too. Sure they will. Just gotta wait a while. Embry, Robert, 24 years old. I took pre-flight training at Amarillo, and then I took multiple engine at Randolph, and I went to England, and then to... to Africa. And now we're based in... Uh, we're based in Tunisia. And we were on a routine mission to southern Italy, and we caught some stray flak where there wasn't supposed to be any. And then we ran out of fuel. And I got the poor devils off. Of course. I did that too. It was my fault. I got that much down, no question about it. It was my fault. But where are they? Where'd they all go? Hey! 
Hey, fellas. No more hide and seek, okay? Time to come home now. Dinner's ready. Come to Papa. Fellas! Fellas! What's this? A cross? Made out of metal? From the plane. And a flak helmet hanging down. But who? Who put it here? Huh. Somebody wrote something. Tech Sergeant William F. Klein died of wounds received in crash April 5th, 1943. Rest in peace, buddy. The crew. Oh, Klein, I didn't know. I didn't know. I'm sorry. I had no idea. Rest in peace, kid. Rest in peace. Captain! Huh. Who goes there? Blake! Is that you, Blake? Captain, Captain. Captain. Connors? Hello, Captain. Kransky! It's you and... Who's that? Here, sir. Huh. Jimenez! And the man next to you, what... What's the matter with his face? Is that blood? All present and accounted for, sir. Klein, I don't believe it. You... You're not dead. Well, neither am I. Neither am I. I'm here, fellas. We're all here. We can do it. Whatever it takes. Come on. Plane's over here. I'll show you. See? It's kind of banged up, and the aft fuel tank's definitely shot. But the other engine looks okay. And some of the instrumentation's haywire. Of course, we'll have to get our wheels down. We'll have to raise the ship and get under there. Because we're not going to walk out of here, that's for sure. And that's a definite. We can't walk out, so we're going to have to fly. But I'll get her up, boys. You can trust me. I'll get her back up. How does that... <laughs> hey! <laughs> hey, where'd you go? <laughs> you hiding behind that sand dune again? What do you want to do that for, huh? <laughs> hey, guys. Where are you? Listen to me. We can do it. I can do it. You'll see. All we have to do is get this propeller out of the sand and free it up. Hey, team. You can talk, you know. Talk to me. Yell at me if you want. Tell me off. But say something. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? It doesn't matter. You were never here. You were never here. Your illusions, mirages, that's all you are. You don't even exist. But there are no mirages at night. Only during the day, when the heat waves come off the sand. So either I'm dead, or out of my mind, or I'm off in limbo someplace. I'm unconscious, I'm sick, that's it. I'm cracked up in an army ward, or I'm down in the drink somewhere, drowning. Or I don't even exist any more than you do. There isn't a thing here, not a single thing that's real. Oh, God. Oh, God, you got to tell me what's happening here. you got to tell me. Please. you got to give me a sign. What? What is that? Aircraft. I can see their lights. Yes! Oh, but they're moving too fast. I've never seen planes like that before. I've never even seen jets. I couldn't have, not yet. Jets. Jet aircraft. What do I know about jet aircraft? It's 1943. There's no such thing as jets yet. But I know about them. F-106s, F-105s, B-47s, B-52s, B-58s. I know all about them. 
I am Captain Robert Embry, United States Army Air Force. I'm the pilot of this bomber right here. We went to Italy this morning because, because it's World War II, and it's not over yet, and I'm right in the middle of it. Hey, crew, we've got to get out of here. We gotta get out of here! We gotta get out of here! Because if we stay here, I'll have to dig more graves and bury you all with my bare hands. Don't you worry, I'll take care of it because it's my responsibility. <laughs> yes. Yes. And I'll dig one more while I'm at it. One for your captain. One for me, too. here, all the news, latest on the Kennedys, big changes in Cuba, mystery plane found in the desert, read all about it. I'll take one. Ten cents. Get your latest news right here. VA hospital, please hold. Where's Dr. Martin's office? Third floor to your right. Thank you. Veterans Administration, how may I direct your call? Come in. Dr. Martin. Yes? Stephen Markham. Oh, thanks for coming over on such short notice. Not a problem. Your patient... Embry, is that his name? Robert Embry. Age 41. He was admitted a few hours ago. May I see his chart? Happened this morning. He went by a newsstand, looked at a paper, and went into shock. When the ambulance got there, he was almost catatonic. This newspaper? Yes, that's the one. And that's what set him off? The front page? That's why I thought we should have a psychiatrist in on it. Odd. I thought so, too. So after he came around and told me the story, I spent the day digging into the fellow's background. I checked with the Pentagon in Washington. It's all confirmed. The information's in the file. He was a captain in the Air Force. Flew a B-25, Africa and Italy. 37 missions. Discharged in August 1943. Recurrent fevers. Any trouble since? Nothing. But if you look back at his original record, there is some suggestion of a psychological disturbance early on. He was discharged before they could find out much about it. It was all brought out in a Squadron MO's report just before his discharge. And this was his plane? That's the one. B-25 Mitchell bomber found. World War II bomber found intact in the desert. Lies 17 years in sand. Remains of crew not yet located. Hard to believe, isn't it? His plane and his crew, the King of Hearts. They took off for Italy on what was supposed to be a routine bombing mission. They'd done it many times before. But Embry never went on that last mission. He reported to sickbay that morning, and someone else flew the plane for him. His co-pilot, Blake. He never returned. And for 17 years, he's known that and carried it around with him, buried deep in his gut. Not deep enough. When he saw the picture of his plane on the front page, he wasn't able to keep himself from letting out one scream and then going into shock. The mind is a very delicate thing. Sometimes there's an infinitely fragile balance. We never know how fragile until something sets it off and tips the balance one way or the other. Something like this. Completely out of left field. How's he doing? I was just going to check on him again. Why don't you come along? Oh, doctor. I'm glad you're here. Did he get any rest? For an hour or so. He still seems agitated and disoriented. Thank you, nurse. Dr. Markham here would like a word with him. Of course. How are you feeling, Mr. Embry? Sorry, I don't know what's wrong with me. That's what we're here for. To get you back on your feet. That's our job. Crazy dream. <sighs> Crazy. Was it? I went back. Where? The desert. Take it easy, Mr. Embry. You don't have to go over it again. Go ahead. You went back, and then what? Back to the ship. I tried to find the guys. I... 
I looked for them, looked all over, I swear. But they were gone. I... I thought I saw Blake and then the others, but it wasn't real. A mirage. Yeah, a mirage. An illusion, that's all. He wasn't there. None of them were. It was an illusion, Mr. Embry. You know that now, don't you? Uh, I, I guess so. I guess so. It seemed so real. It's over now. All that's behind you. Is it? I should have been on that plane. I should have gone on that mission. I chickened out. You didn't chicken out. And you had no way of knowing that the plane would never come back? You'll realize that as time goes on, and you'll feel better for it, Mr. Embry. It's out in the open now. You don't have to keep it buried inside you. That's what's been hurting all these years. How did you know? You've been carrying around one gigantic guilt complex for something that wasn't your fault. Buried. Yeah. Buried. I found Klein's grave. Did I tell you that? He was killed in the crash. Take it easy. But then I saw him. And I saw the others, too. I thought I did. I thought I did for a moment. The whole crew. I would have buried them, you know. The last thing I dreamed, I would... I was digging graves for them in the sand so they could be buried just like he was. You need to get some sleep now. I'll ask the nurse to give you a sedative. As soon as you're ready, you can get back to your life. But there's no hurry about that. What you need right now is rest. Another crazy thing. Another part of the dream, uh, whatever it was. I was standing in the desert. And I asked for a sign. And I looked up. And there were these planes overhead in the night sky. They were moving fast, oh, and they made streaks, and I could tell by the sound. They were jets. <laughs> Isn't that wild? <laughs> it was 1943, in the African desert, and up above me were jet planes. F-105s and 106s. Just as if... As if I'd gone back there today. Did I? Did I go back? To the plane? Is that... Is that possible? Well, of course it is. In your mind. That's how you went back, Mr. Embry. In your mind. The greatest time machine of all. Go to sleep, Captain Embry. You're entitled. You're going to be all right. Thank you, Doctor. So, what do you think? I'd like to talk to him again in a couple of days, start a treatment plan on a regular basis. I can set that up for you. But I think the worst part of it's already over. The guilt's out in the open, and he knows what it is. And the dream? The delusion? Right now, it's still so fresh, it feels very real to him. In a few days, in a week or two, it'll lose its reality. You sure? Nothing's guaranteed, and that's why I want the follow-up. But in a case like this... Actually, I've never seen a case quite like this one. So much information coming back to him in a rush and generating a new set of memories he'd never had before. It's going to be one for the case books. Absolutely fascinating. He seems like a decent man. Yes, he does. And that's exactly what got him into this state. His fundamental decency. He has a conscience. If he weren't a good man, he wouldn't be vulnerable. And would have one less patient. I'd have a whole lot fewer. Is that Mr. Embry's room, Doctor? That's right. His clothes are in this bag. It was left in the examination room. You can give it to me, nurse. I'm going back in. Thank you, Doctor. What's that? I really don't know. Looks like sand. Yes, it does. Sand? Now, where in the world did that come from? I wish I knew. It was in one of his shoes. Could be from the seashore, Jones Beach. Or... Or... Where else could it be from? It could come from a desert. Really, now? I read the article in the paper. It said there were no bodies found in the area, not a single one. Well, the sand would have covered them over. The sand didn't cover the plane. It was sitting there, perfectly preserved. There would have been something left of the crew, too, their bones at least. Unless... Unless what? Unless someone dug graves and buried them. Mr. Embry. Looks like he finally dozed off. Good. 
good for him. I'll just leave his things. Shirt, trousers, jacket, and shoes, complete with several ounces of white sand. Where do you suppose it's from? Maybe a fishing trip he took recently? Very recently. Or from a plane. From a B-25 called the King of Hearts. Wherever it's from. Rest easy, Mr. Embry. You've had a long journey back. Very long. Now you can rest. Meanwhile, I'll leave your shoes by the bed. You'll need them when you're back on your feet. Which will be soon. Very soon indeed. Captain Emery. Godspeed. Portrait of an enigma buried in the sand. A question mark with broken wings that lies in silent grace. A marker in a distant desert shrine. Odd how the real consorts with the shadows. How the present fuses with the past. How could it happen? The question is on file in a barren desert. And the answer? The answer is waiting for us in the twilight zone. More from the twilight zone after this. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop, TwilightZoneRadio.com. Visit TwilightZoneRadio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD. Or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. King Nine Will Not Return, starring Adam Baldwin with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Rich Kamenick, Christian Stolte, Craig Wickman, Doug James, Linda Ryder, Michelle Graff, Paul Patch, Carl Amari, and Roger Wolski. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, the American Forces Radio and Television Service, our sponsors, and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Sleep. It's early. What time is it? I don't know. My watch stopped. Oh, look at the clock. It says seven, but it's wrong. Oh, it can't be wrong. You wound it, didn't you? It has to be wrong. Look out the window. It's still dark. It must be three or four in the morning. 
Why don't you turn the light on? I don't need it. Leave it off. So, this is the day, huh? This is the day. Well, if you got three or four hours yet, what do you have to get up now for? Can't sleep. So, I thought I might as well go over to the jail. You know what I think? What? I think you're crazy. If it really is the middle of the night, you're crazy to get up now. What's so special about today? Ella. Just about hanging a little? I said, why don't you go back to sleep? Why don't you? There's going to be all kinds of excitement today. Reporters and everything else. You're the one that could use some sleep. Bring breakfast over about 8.30. You want some coffee now? Pierce will have some at the jail. Just bring Jagger's breakfast at 8.30. What about you? I can't eat. What time do you string him up? Ella. You know what I mean. What time does he get hung? Hanged. That's what I said. What time? When you're talking about an execution, Ella, the word's hanged. It's at 9.30. And you know something? I hope they stay away. I hope everybody stays away, not just the reporters, the whole town. Because when I think of a bunch of cold-blooded gawkers who get their jollies from watching a boy die, I, I want to... Well, why shouldn't they? Why shouldn't the whole town turn out to watch it? Including you? I haven't decided yet. Well, why would you want to see a thing like that? Why would you even think about it? Because if anybody deserves it, he does. Dirty little animal. I'm leaving now. I understand that after the neck breaks, they only feel it for a couple of seconds. Well, it ought to take more time than that, Charlie. For what he done, this is a mighty easy way to pay it off, don't you think? Easy? To get strung up by the neck? All I can say is you have a funny view of what's easy and what's hard. Just remember to bring his breakfast over. Hey, Charlie. How does he want his eggs? Edible. They're the last ones he's gonna eat, so do one thing for me, will you, Ella? Make them edible. Sheriff Charlie Koch on the morning of an execution. For the record, and as a matter of absolute fact, it is a little after 7 a.m. Now, logic and natural laws dictate that at this hour there should indeed be daylight. It is a simple rule of physical science that the sun should rise at a certain moment and take away the darkness. But at this given moment, Sheriff Charlie Koch, his wife Ella, a condemned man named Jagger, and everyone else in this small, inconsequential town are about to find out that there are some causes and effects that have no precedent, except in the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, I Am the Night, Color Me Black. Starring John Ratzenberger with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Morning, Sheriff. Pierce, anything doing? Nothing much. You sure? Yep. Take your feet off the desk. Uh, sure thing, Sheriff. Glad you finally made it. <laughs> this ain't the day to be oversleeping. You tell me all about sleeping, Pierce. You're the expert on that. Hey, hey don't get me wrong. I, mean, I ain't complaining. I'm you but... ain't complaining, but at two or three in the morning, you've had a four-hour shift. And, buddy, that doesn't break anybody's back. Two or three in the morning? <laughs> what have you been drinking? It's 7.30. Then why is it pitch black outside? What are you talking about? Take a look. I... I don't get it. What don't you get, Deputy? That some men can't sleep and get up early? I suppose that doesn't make much sense to a guy who could put in 12 solid hours on a mattress and then wake up and complain Sh about... Sheriff! You got a problem, Pierce? Sh Sheriff, it is 7.30 in the morning. Uh, take a look at the clock. And you're right, it's black as a coal mine outside. I never seen a blacker. What's going on? You're right. It's 
And the sun's not up yet. And to tell you the truth, Deputy, I don't know why. I, I don't know why at all. Who's coming? I can't see yet. Everything out there looks the same. Black as the ace of spades. Morning, Colby. Sheriff? How about that? You see it out there? Of course I saw it. Any sign of the sun? Not a speck. You gonna run an extra in that paper of yours? If I get the time. I've been answering the phone since six in the morning. One fellow says that the electricity's gone off in the whole town. Well, I can see that's not true. Uh, another one says it's already tomorrow night. <laughs> I like that. And another one. The godly woman who professes to read the good book with admirable regularity. Well, she tells me it's the end of the world, and she can quote chapter and verse to support her thesis. Well, what do you think? Well, hold on, there's more. The president of the January graduating class of our local school, who majors in physics, tells me it's a phenomenon caused by sunspots. And then I've got about 20 phone calls from ignorant people like me who just want to know what the devil is going on. Now, you're well versed in law and order, Sheriff Koch, keeping the peace, in other words. So I'm here to ask you, what's your theory? I wish I had one. It's almost a quarter to eight in the morning. Daylight should have come two hours ago. Eh, maybe a storm's on the way. Big whopping storm, the kind that covers up the whole sky. Possible, I suppose. Storms don't bring this kind of darkness. Anybody call the state capitol? Oh, yeah. In between reassuring people that this is neither an interplanetary invasion, nor the end of the world, I place said call myself. And? Oh, things are normal there. It's daylight, just as it should be. But if you'll forgive the pun, they're as much in the dark as we are. Y you mean it ain't black up there? It appears that all up and down the state, and... Uh, across the face of the earth, for that matter. We are the only ones who are groping around in total darkness. So, the phenomenon is quite localized, which means we'll have to seek elsewhere for company to share our misery. How's Jagger doing this morning? I seen him. Brought him in a cup of coffee to make sure he was awake. Thoughtful of you. Ah, to remind him about what day it is. I'll bet you did. <laughs> I wonder, how did you occupy yourself as a lad there, deputy? Torture small animals, or... Just pull the wings off flies. Say, what do you mean by that? Oh, uh, nothing. I don't mean anything by it. So, Koch, can I talk to him? Go right on in. I'm not saying he'll talk to you, but that's the privilege of the press to try. So he's got an hour and 45 minutes left. What about a priest or a minister? He doesn't want either. As a point of interest, Sheriff... Entirely off the record. Do you believe Jagger's guilty? Mr. Colby, I arrest people on the basis of evidence. I jail them on that evidence, and I'm responsible for their meals and their health until they get sentenced, executed, or let loose. As to guilt or innocence, it's a matter for the jury, public opinion, and God to decide. And that part of it, thank the Lord, has nothing to do with me. Uh-huh. So, let us all praise God for the morning's impartiality, hmm? You just keep them alive until their moment of death. I see, I see. And as for my part, I follow fate around with a small pencil and a notebook and make a record for posterity of how he died and why he died. But neither one of us has any guilt to share for the fact that he does die. How perfectly convenient for us. He's guilty as hell. He fired buckshot into a man's head. A real decent, upstanding man. And today, he's going to pay the price. He's going to hang for it. Man, oh man, is justice going to be served up deluxe style this time? Pierce, why don't you shut your mouth? I got a right to an opinion. Oh, you do, Deputy. Indeed you do. There are just a couple of disturbing facets to this particular case. Like what? First, that the murder victim was not a decent man by any stretch of the imagination. Hey, you're talking about the dead. He was a cross burner and a psychopathic bully who attacked the man you've got locked up in there. Well, that don't matter. Go on, Comey. I want to hear this. Second, Deputy Pierce here saw it happen and then perjured himself. Now, wait a minute. Let him finish. That's the word, all right, Deputy. Perjured. You said that Jagger shot him from across the room. Well, no such thing could have happened, according to the records I saw. The murder man had powder burns all over him. So what? Now, you tell me how a man can get shot from ten feet away and still have powder burns on his skin. By itself, that might not have proved self-defense, but it would have supported Jagger's story. It would have at least raised some doubts in the jury room. If 
they had heard it. I wondered about that myself. Did you, Sheriff Koch? Well, you saw the body, didn't you? I saw it. But I didn't hear any comment on those powder burns when you gave your testimony, or, or did I miss that? I answer the questions they asked me. Oh, don't feel singled out now, because your courageous editor who covered the trial from start to finish, he just didn't see fit to include that insignificant little detail in any of his news stories either, now did he? Even though for some reason he knew at the time that he was being very, very selective about what he wrote and what he didn't write, about the truth, in other words. Which is what a trial is supposed to be, a search for the truth. So, when you get right down to it, you're quite right, Deputy. Justice is being served on a platter with its tongue cut out, just like the carcass of any dead animal. Call me when you're ready. I will. Smoke, Jagger? No, sir. You don't mind if I have one. Go ahead. I quit years ago, but I picked up a pack last night. I don't know why. And this morning, it, I looked at it like I've never seen a pack of cigarettes before. It didn't even feel right in my hand. I know it's bad for me, but I put it in my pocket just the same. Now, why do you suppose that is? Can I ask you a question, Mr. Coley? Anything you like. I can't promise I'll have the answer, though. I was just wondering, uh... What kind of day is it? Oh, you're not gonna believe me, even if I tell you. It's rainy, huh? No, it's not bad. A little chilly. The main thing is, it's still dark. How do you mean? It's still black as night outside. The sun never came up. Close to eight in the morning, and not even a little bit of daylight. God, come on. Don't kid me. I'm not. <laughs> Why would I? What reason would I have to lie to you? Well, uh, this place doesn't have any windows, so I, I guess it could be Christmas Eve or the 4th of July, and I wouldn't know the difference. Jagger, do you have a uh, religious affiliation? No. Anybody you want to see? Nobody. Anything you'd like to say? Anything at all? Nothing. No priest, no friends, no comment. What do you have? What do you think, Mr. Colby? Not much, that's what. I mean, I've got a little over an hour, and I've been thinking that I'd like to rip these bars apart and get out, same as you would. Or maybe, you know, just save everybody the trouble and hang myself in here. But I haven't got the strength for one or the guts for the other, so I'm just sitting here and waiting. What else is there? That being the case, would you care to make a statement? You want a statement? Is that what you came here for? Look at it this way. I don't think anybody should leave the Earth without a comment. You, me, or anyone else. Oh, well, now that sounds like a reasonable request. Considering that you're not the one who's leaving. I'm serious. I'm giving you the chance to say anything you want. All right, then. I'm guilty, Mr. Colby. How's that? That should let you off the hook. And that's supposed to mean what? That's supposed to mean that you're on the side of the good guys. You know. You have to be good guys and bad guys. That's the nature of man. Well, I'm the bad guy, okay? Worse than that, I'm the troublemaker in town. The one with the causes and the banners. I'm the idiot. The fool. I tried to be his brother's keeper. You understand now, Mr. Colby? It doesn't matter whether I do or not. I want to hear what you think. On or off the record. Anything I say, you're going to write it down and put it in that little newspaper of yours, aren't you? Not if you don't want me to. How would I know if you did or you didn't? I don't have a tape recorder on me. See? My notebook's in my pocket and so is my pencil. If I did put it in my paper, what good would that do me? <laughs> As a matter of fact, it would do me some damage. Because I didn't speak out about the case. I kept silent. Not even an editorial. So I can't very well change my stripes now, can I? I said all I had to say in court. But nobody listened. Well, I'm listening. We're two men talking here. If you say it's private, that's how it stays. What difference can it possibly make to you now? I have to know. Can you understand that? I have to. You think I know? You were there. You got one of those cigarettes? 
right here. It was a shotgun. It wasn't mine, it was his. Everybody knows that, but they convicted me on premeditated murder. Even though I'm the one who tried to take it away from him before he could go out and use it. So you fought with him? I either loaded the gun and put it in his hands or I tried to get it away from him. Take your pick. All I remember is the gun going off and that's what counts, isn't it? Not motives, not what's in your head. You know what road is paved with good intentions. Good, bad, it doesn't matter. I'd say there's a big difference. A huge one. Except that the man I killed, he was the White Knight. I wouldn't say that. Well, I would. The things he did, other people only thought about. What they wanted to see happen, but didn't dare do. He was the cross burner, the bomb thrower. He did their dirty work for them, like whipping some poor, scared guy just for being black, when nobody else had the guts to pick up a stick or a rock to do it themselves. So the White Knight ended up with his brains spattered all over the place. And I was the cause of that, one way or the other. There's no way the people around here were gonna pin a medal on me. You don't think much of this town, do you? Do you? The man wasn't a saint, but he died. And what the jury said was that regardless of how it happened, we cannot dispense life or death because someone offends us. That's the distinction between men and animals. And that's, that's well said, Mr. Colby. You tell it to the man who fixes up the rope, okay? You tell it to the sheriff and his deputy out there. You, you tell that to the town while they stand around and watch my eyes bulge out, my tongue swell up, and I choke and do my little dance for them. You tell them all about the difference between men and animals. But you better drop pictures. Because this kind of language they just don't get. Catch! You ready, Mr. Colby? I'm ready. A lot of commotion out there. I guess they just can't wait. Well, that's not it. It's because nobody can see where they're going. Why's that? I told you, it's dark out. For real? The darkest I've ever seen it. Get the crossbar on there real good. I got it, officer. And the rope. Make sure it's fixed right. Don't want it to break now, would we? Uh, no, sir. Uh, could you point your flashlight up here one more time? You got it. How's that? <laughs> Looks A-OK -okay from here. You done real good, boys. Boss? What? Uh, well, sir, you had us add cleats to the support, and then you wanted a bigger crossbar, and now you ordered a new rope but just for today? Well, the old setup was just fine the way it was, as far as I could tell. So how come you went and spent all that extra money? Because this one's going to go off without a hitch. Right, boys? Well, if it don't, it sure won't be your fault. <laughs> That's the truth. All right. I guess you can come on down. We got to test it one time. Sure thing, boss. Now, when I say pull, you drop the sandbag. Yo. All right, then. Pull. <laughs> That got her. That got her good, didn't it, boy? Yeah, boss. It sure did. Who's there? Easy, Pierce. Looks like everything's in working order. Yep. That ought to take care of him. Sure it will. But I'm still worried about one thing. And what's that? Exactly who or what is going to take care of us. There it goes. Nine bells. Why is it so dark, then? Is it an eclipse? Can't be. I've been listening on the radio. This ain't no clips. It's weird. It's just plain weird. Order 
the darkness that has suddenly and inexplicably engulfed this remote Midwestern town. Turn up that radio so we can hear. It is now 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, but latest reports indicate that the darkness blanketing the specific location is virtually total. So far, there is no sign whatever of any daylight on the horizon. A spokesman for the Meteorological Service says that the event is without precedent, according to records covering the past 150 years. Who's that? Turn on your headlights. Why, it's Sheriff Koch's wife. Morning, Ella. Is that you, June? It's me. What you got on the tray? Breakfast. Oh, aren't you the one fixing a nice hot meal for your man? Well, it's not for Charlie. Who's it for, then? For him. You don't mean... Mm, afraid so. For Jagger. What did you go and waste good food for? He don't have no right. He don't even have time to eat it. It's the law. The law? That's what my husband says. Anyway, I can help carry out the letter of the law. I'm glad to. It's my duty. Ella? Over here, Charlie. Just bring it on inside. I'll be right there. Excuse me. The governor, please. Yes, I'll wait. But please, tell him it's urgent. Mr. Colby? Hi, Ella. Where shall I put this? What? No, this is the uh, editor of the Sun-Times. That's right. I'm calling to see if there's been a stay in the... Yes, I'll hold. What do you have there? Charlie said to bring it. Breakfast? For the condemned man. I guess you can just take it on in. To the cell? The hall door is open. It's right down there. I know where it is. Charlie said to fix a plate of eggs. He didn't say I had to spoon feed it. Yes, well, of course, if he's on the phone. He's not? What do you mean nobody called? No, no, listen. After the automatic appeals, there's always a request to the governor's office for a stay while they argue it before the circuit court. Morning, Mrs. Koch. I thought that was you. Yes, uh, I'll hold. Thanks for bringing the tray. <laughs> Just in time, too. I wouldn't want it to go to waste. When did you make these eggs? When? They're cold. Well, that's not my fault. You could at least have brought them on time. Charlie, you listen here. I couldn't drive because there's no street light, so I walked over. I couldn't even see where I was going. That's just how long it took me. All right, all right. I'll take it into him. If he doesn't like it, he can throw it in the trash for all I care. Well, now, don't do that. I mean, I haven't had nothing to eat this morning. I said I'll take it to him. Yes, I'm here. I see. You sure... That's it, then. All right. Yes. Who was that? The governor's secretary. And? Don't dice. I see. Well, there you go. Sure is a big, fat surprise. No, but I'll tell you what is. It's a surprise that someone can go to trial for his life with a third-rate public defender who's afraid to stand up to the local DA. It's a surprise that no private lawyer somewhere heard about the case or went to bat pro bono. It's a surprise that the public defender didn't even try to call the governor a half hour before the sentence is carried out. And it's a surprise that I didn't give up the ghost on this place a long time ago. But it's not a surprise that you, Pierce, and this whole town...
Is he? Even now. This isn't the first gallows ever built, Reverend. Or the last. Won't be the first man to lose his life at an untimely age, and we won't be the last mourners on this earth either. Did you see him? Did you talk to him? Briefly. He wouldn't see me. Wouldn't even let me in his cell. That's a pity. He's a lonely boy. But at least he won't be lonely for much longer. That's the truth. He's going to glory. I'm glad you think so. And you don't, Mr. Colby? It would be easier if I did. But I gave up my faith years ago. Now I'm not sure I ever had it. We all stumble in life, lose our way for a time. But the shepherd doesn't give up. He keeps on looking for us. What happens if the shepherd loses his way too? It must be time. Listen to them. Oh, they want blood. Reminds me of sports fans in a, an arena somewhere. Yes, a Roman one. How's it look out there? Hard to tell. When they light their torches and storm the jail, I'll let you know. Well, I'd better get the prisoner ready. You're going through with it? Unless something happens in the next ten minutes, I have no choice. Then I suggest we use this time wisely. And how do we do that, Reverend? There's only one thing left to do. We pray. Time to pray now. It's 925. That's right, ain't it? 925? Five more minutes. I can't believe Koch is doing this. The sun's not up yet. Law says May 25th at 9.30 in the morning. Well, that's what it is. May 25th, and it's pretty near 9.30 already. Quite apart from the fact, Mr. Pierce, that you're not the most sensitive of men, doesn't this morning suggest to you that there's something odd going on, that perhaps... We'd better dispense with business as usual until we find out exactly what it is. You know something? I've taken an awful lot of crap from you. And just who are you, anyway? A little shot editor of a crummy little paper? That's right, a crummy little paper that crawls along on its hands and knees from one edition to another. The way I figure it, you got more creditors than you got readers. That'll do it, Pierce. That won't do it by a long shot. Maybe you feel like turning your cheek to this bum, but there ain't no rule book says I got it. He says I perjured myself, says I lied, and he wasn't throwing no bouquets at you either. Maybe because I don't deserve any. You know, Colby, you're right. I saw the victim. He did have powder burns. And when a committee of townspeople came to me and said there'd be no autopsy, I just bent my head and shuffled my feet and nodded. We've all got little axes to grind, don't we? I'd like to be re-elected sheriff. And you, Colby, you'd like to keep that newspaper going. And Deputy Pierce over here, he likes to feel important. He likes to be popular. He likes to stay on the side of the majority. So here we are, gentlemen. All of us treading water in a sewer. I don't take it from him, and I don't take it from you neither. Watch who you put your hands on, Pierce. Oh, what? You better unravel it right now, or I'll spread you all over the yard. It's 927, Koch. Then we'd better go get the prisoner. At last, Mr. Pierce. A labor of love, huh? You coming, Pierce? Yeah, I'm coming. <laughs> I wouldn't miss it for the world. I want to see Jagger's face when he gets a look at that gallows. You won't be able to see anything. And neither will anybody else, as long as it stays dark out. And maybe that's just as well. Come on! Let's get this show on the road! Hurry it up, Sheriff! Can't wait all morning! There he is! Dirty little murderer! I want to see him choke! You don't need the chains. I'm not going anywhere. He has some minutes, doesn't he? He's used them already. We're behind schedule. You can talk to him now, Reverend. Take your time. It's my time. I got nothing to talk about. <laughs> then let's go. Let's get on with it. Don't waste your last minutes, Jagger. We're a different color, and I know we have different faiths, but you've stood up for me and mine. You've spoken for us, and God help you, you've killed for us. I think we owe you some peace, and I'd like to try to give you some. That rope over there give me peace. I don't need any words, Reverend. 
No quotations, nothing in the Bible or any other book. Get it over with! Yeah, yeah let's go! Yeah! Patience, everybody! I'm going to give you what y'all came here for. I'll dance at the end of the rope and I'll choke and I'll swing back and forth like a rag doll. Yeah, you'll see. You'll get your money's worth. I promise. This way. I told you. I'll do this myself. Any last words? Not on your life. That's one thing I won't give you people. I won't give you the satisfaction of saying, I'm sorry! Yeah! 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 Don't return their hate. Don't dishonor yourself. Why don't you go home? Go on. Get out of here. Just tell me one thing. When he came at you, Jagger, did it feel good then? What's the difference? And when you aimed that gun at his head, that wasn't such a bad moment, was it? Good or bad, who cares? If I wanted him dead or not, it ended the same. What was in my heart didn't matter, because it's what you do that counts, isn't it? Not what you wish for. So, when you killed him, Jagger, when you blew his head off, there were no regrets then, were there? If I told you I didn't mean it, would you let me go? The law's the law. It's, it's what I did in this life. The same is for him, and I hated his kind. You enjoyed seeing him dead, didn't you? You know it. Now I know it, too. I know it only too well. This man is guilty. We're all guilty. Guilty as sin. It's important to get with the majority, isn't it? That's the big thing. That's what really matters to you. We're all the majority. The minority died on the cross 2,000 years ago. You want a statement? I'll give you a statement. Tell everybody that. Tell them they're no better than me. Who wants to put the rope around my neck, huh? You lady! You want to put it on this stuff? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And who, who wants to pull the lever, huh? You reverend! You know we're all murderers! I'll do it. You seen the light, Reverend? You finally seen the light? Have you? Have any of you? In all this darkness, can anyone make out the truth? Look at what's hanging from that gallows. He hated. He killed. Now he dies. You hated. You killed. And not one of you isn't doomed. Not one. Do you know why it's dark? Do you know why there's night all around us? Do you know now what the blackness really is? It's the hate he felt. The hate you've felt. The hate all of us felt. There was too much. There was way too much. And we had to vomit it up. And now it's surrounding us and choking us. So much hate, so much miserable hate. Oh, it's getting colder. Look what's happening. It's getting even darker. You can't, you can't hardly see anything now. Take me home, Charlie. I want to go home. I will, if I can find the way. That's crazy, isn't it? What he said. Isn't it crazy? You know what's going to happen, don't you? I mean, you know what's going to happen next. Oh, believe me, this here stuff is going to lift. It, it, you know, it'll, it'll just all of a sudden just plain lift. Because it's just, it's, it's just a fog is all it is. Nothing more than a fog. And it'll lift. And there'll be the old sun, high up and bright. Wait and see. 
There'll be the old sun shining to beat the band. I don't know. I don't know if there'll ever be daylight again. Only God knows. And I'm not even sure about that. Reports now coming in of similar occurrences here in the United States and abroad. At 9 o'clock this morning, a dark cloud suddenly appeared over several widely separated U.S. cities. The government of Israel has verified the fact that a rectangular area over the West Bank appears to have gone dark. In China, correspondents just filed a news item about several square blocks, including a political prison, thrown into darkness early this morning. In Iran, an area in Southeast Asia. In Central and South America, the African continent, the darkness continues to spread. Witness the effects of a sickness known as hate. Not a virus, not a microbe, not a germ, but a very real sickness just the same. Universal and not easily contained. The diagnosis? Highly contagious and unfortunately quite deadly in its effects. Consider yourself forewarned. Don't look for this one in the realm of science fiction, but rather right in front of you, in the mirror. As a matter of survival, you'd be well advised to eradicate it now, right now, before the light goes out, somewhere in the vicinity of your town. A prescription prepared for all within listening range of the Twilight Zone. We'll return to the Twilight Zone in just a moment. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop TwilightZoneRadio.com. Visit TwilightZoneRadio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD or call toll free 1 866 989 Zone. That's 1 866 989 9663. I Am the Night, Color Me Black, starring John Ratzenberger with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcherson and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Taylor Miller, Rick Peoples, Doug James, Norm Waddell, John Watson Sr., Turk Muller, Jeff Lupiton, Paul Patch, Maggie Carney, Lynn Foley, Carl Amari, and Irene Olson. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, the American Forces Radio and Television Service, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Education Toy Company. O'Brien. Yes, Mr. Judson. Where's my robot? Your robot, sir? The Space Invader robot. 
for the Christmas catalog? Uh, I was just going over the blueprints. Well, I need it. Yes, sir. How does it look? The blueprints or the prototype? Both. All finished, are they? Oh, yes, definitely. It walks, it talks, it shoots death rays, just like Mr. Ford said it would. Then bring them to my office by the end of the day. We need to start production. No problem, sir. Horace? Horace? Mr. Justin wants to see the robot. Horace? Why are you just sitting there? Didn't you hear what I said? I'm not just sitting here. I'm waiting. For what? For a showdown. Look out! What? Go for your gun, partner. Gotcha! Horace, why'd you do that? Do what? With the cap pistol. <laughs> Scared the pants off you, right? Come on, Horace. You pull that almost every day. I love cap pistols. Boy, when I was a kid, I always had a cap pistol. Everybody on my block had one. <laughs> you remember cowboy movies? Weren't they the best? I want to talk to you about your design for the new robot. I made believe I had my own horse. We used to gallop out of the theater and shoot up the whole neighborhood. Bow! Got you right in the heart! You're loco. You missed me by a mile! Horace, <laughs> do you know how loud you're yelling? Oh, I wasn't. I'll bet you could hear it all the way to Mr. Judson's office. How much? I'll bet you my ball of silver foil. Big Lenny, remember that? Remember when you could peel the foil off old cigarette packs and gum wrappers and roll into a great big ball? I had one that must have weighed five pounds. Boy, wonder what ever happened to it. I've been in the office next to yours for 12 years. I know all about how you used to collect tin foil. How will you listen to me for a second? You must have had a miserable time when you were a kid. I did. I couldn't wait to grow up. What do you want, Leonard? There's something wrong with the plans. There is not. I designed this toy. There's nothing wrong with it. See? If you'll listen, the I... The kids will go crazy about it. Do you know what it does? I know what it does. Look, Horace, I'm trying to help you. I mean a toy where the eyes flash and it walks over anything. It's a good toy. It is a good toy. But it can't be turned out at the price point Mr. Judson wants. But look here. What? When he sees the plans, he's going to blow his stack. It's got too many parts. You think so? I know so. Well, I don't. Horace, all you have to do is work it over. How's Betty? What? Betty. Your wife. Remember her? What has Betty got to do with it? We're talking about your work. Is that all you ever think about? Horace. Thanks. I'll look it over. Horace. All right. You do that. By this afternoon, okay? Sure, Lenny, sure. A great little toy, if you ask me. I would have loved to have this. Meet Horace Maxwell Ford, age 38, but already growing a bit paunchy. He's a man whose clothes never quite seem to fit and whose shirt is forever coming untucked from his trousers. His socks are usually down around his ankles. His horn-rimmed glasses are always about to fall off his face. And he can't keep his hair combed at all. A mild man, an apologetic man, except when talking about his favorite subject, his beloved childhood memories. He's the type who quite naturally becomes the butt of endless jokes, at least when the Jokers don't feel instinctively sorry for him. But were they wise enough, they would notice that there is a tragic quality about him as well. In just a moment, Horace Ford will come to understand what's tragic is not the fact that he's an inadequate man, but really an inadequate grown-up boy. A life-changing discovery, and one that could happen only in the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, The Incredible World of Horace Ford, starring Mike Starr, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Leonard? Laura, come in. What's the matter? Here. I don't want Horace to see this. It's his birthday present. Len, would you take it with you so he doesn't see it lying around? Check. 
I'll bring it along Friday night. Thanks. So how are you? Oh, I'm exhausted. It is not easy to shop for that man. What'd you get him? A smoking jacket. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that means he's growing up. Betty and I got him a new gold chain for that pocket watch of his. Oh, and we got him a yo-yo, too, as a gag. Oh, that'll probably be his favorite present. You mind if I sit down? My feet are killing me. Please. So, uh, the surprise party's all set for Friday? All set. What's the plan? Well, everybody's coming over to the place at 8. Horace thinks the two of us are going to a movie. I'll make him answer the door and sing happy birthday or something. He'll go right through the floor. Probably. Oh, what time is it? Wait. Is he busy? Mm, yeah. Well, I think he's worked late enough. Board? Oh. Uh, hi, Mr. Judson. What are you doing at the window? Uh, nothing. Uh, I mean, just thinking. Thinking? About what? I don't know. Toys? Whose toys? You don't seem to have done much thinking about ours. Look at this. I'm getting him out of there. Good night, Len. Laura. Well, look at it. I know what it is. The blueprint for the robot. What happened? If we put this into production the way it is, do you know how much money we'll lose? But it's a good toy. That has nothing to do with it. See here, Ford, you've been with us a long time. You must know that we're in business to make a profit. This design just isn't cost effective. I want it simplified. What do you want to simplify? For one thing, the eyes don't have to flash on and off. Sure they do. You want to ruin it? The flashing eyes? That's the beauty part. It's terrific. You could play for hours with a toy like that. Why are you raising your voice? I'm not. But you're talking about... Look, Ford. I don't want to argue about it. Just do the design over. Don't you remember when we used to play soldiers? With a mechanical man like this, you could... Oh, is, is this the office of... Oh, there you are, Horace. Laura? Uh, Mr. Judson, you remember my wife? Mr. Judson! Oh, how nice to see you. A pleasure. Remember, Ford, I'll need it first thing in the morning. No later. Yes, sir. Good evening. Hello, Laura. Aren't you surprised that I'm here? Yes, uh, yes, I am. What time is it? Well, why don't you check your watch? Almost six. Oh, that late? I've been shopping all afternoon, and I'm absolutely done in. Well, how about taking me home? Okay. Well, here's your briefcase. I'm just going to fall into bed tonight, literally fall into bed. <laughs> That's all right. I have some homework. Oh, no, not again. Now, what is it this time? The robot. He's trying to ruin it. Oh, I'm sure Mr. Judson's only trying to... I'm telling to... you, he is. That toy has no meaning unless the eyes light up. Hello, children. Mama. How's my boy? Fine. That's good. Are you hungry? A little. Dinner's almost ready. Laura, there's something wrong with the chicken. It's like leather. These birds they give you nowadays, like people don't know what chickens are anymore, hmm? Well, it looks all right to me. How was the office today? It was okay. What's the matter? Nothing's the matter. No, I can tell just from your voice. Everything's fine. Let's eat dinner. I'm telling you, Mr. Judson's just plain nuts. He reminds me of Corey. Hey, Mom. Remember Mr. Corey? I had him in 5B. What a character. You take the least common denominator class, and you multiply. <laughs> you know what we used to call him? Guess. I wouldn't even tell you. Boy, I'll never forget the time he caught me with one of those jawbreakers in my mouth. You know, to kind of change colors while you suck them? Horace. So he made me stand up, and every minute he'd point that pointer at me and say, Mr. Ford, what color is it? And I'd have to take it out of my mouth and tell him. I swear, I thought Hermie Brandt would bust a gut trying not to laugh. Horace. Hermie Brandt. The greatest stickball player in the whole world. One time during a fire drill. Let's have dinner. Oh, what great times. I was ten. Horace, why don't you stop it? 
Nobody cares about when you were 10 anymore. I care. You're almost 38. So? So you don't act 38 sometimes. So what? So that's what I mean. So what? What kind of answer is so what? Laura. I'm telling you, this chicken's dry no matter how much I basted it. Why do you have to keep talking about when you were a kid? People get tired of it. Oh, be quiet for once, will you? Horace. Let him go. Horace? Horace, the chicken will get cold. Oh, come on. Don't lie there on your bed. Eat a little. Laura didn't mean it. I'll cut you a leg in a second joint. Your favorites. You remember Hermie Brent? No. How come you never remember anything about Randolph Street? Oh, it was a terrible place. We're in a good neighborhood now, in a nice apartment. Why do you have to always... What was terrible? Listen, I had the best times there. Like, remember when Pop used to give me an Indian rope burn? I mean, he didn't, but he pretended like he was going to... When you were a kid, when you were a kid... Why don't you have kids of your own? Talk about them. Randolph Street. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go back there. Right now. Horace, we're having supper. I haven't been there since I was 11. Why shouldn't I? Horace, it's a dirty old street. What are you going to see? Stay home. Where are you going? So long. Horace, listen. Will you look at all this? Frank on a roll. Three cents. No thanks. Oh, Excuse me, young folks. Bread and butter. Hey, watch where you going, huh? Sorry. Hey, give me my ball. What? Oh, sure. Davy, you go home or you're gonna get smacked. Ring Olivio, caught, caught, caught. Ring Olivio. My gosh, this late at night? What time is it? I didn't hear him. Me neither. I did too. What do you want from me? Wait. Boys. Don't I know you? Hurry up, Hermie. Hey, Hermie Brant, come on. All right already, I'm coming. Hermie? Did he say Hermie? Nice of you to come back. Laura? You could have told me where you were going. I, Laura, I was down on Randolph Street. Listen, Laura, I have to tell you something. Look, your mother's asleep. Do you know what time it is? No, I don't care. Where's your father's pocket watch? I don't know. Laura, I saw some kids on the block. Little kids. Maybe 10 or 11 years old. Laura, they were the kids I played with when I was 10. The same kids. You're perspiring. You're not listening to me. I heard you. I think you're catching a cold or something. Wipe the sweat off your face. They couldn't have been the same kids, dear. I saw them! I saw Hermie Brandt and George Langbart and Cy Wright. Maybe they looked like some of the kids you used to know. I'm telling you. Horace, you're talking like a child. All right. If you don't want to listen, I'm going to bed. Horace. Oh. Yes, young man, what do you want? He dropped this. Dropped what? Well, this is Horace's watch. Where did you... Mail, Mr. Ford. Oh, hi, Freddy. Just leave it over there. In Olivio. <laughs> caught, caught, caught. What'd you say, Mr. Ford? Ring Olivio. What'd you think I said? You never heard of that? No, sir. Did you ever play Saluji? I don't think so. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, red light. Uh, see you later, Mr. Ford. Where were you brought up anyway? <laughs> Mr. Ford speaking. No, I'm not finished yet. Well, I don't know when it'll be ready. I can't help it if Mr. Judson wants to know. 
Listen, you can't turn these things out like donuts. Boris? Hi, Eleni. You tell him I am rushing it. Well, what does he think I am? Then let him do it. Sure, you can tell him that. Judson's office. What does he want from me? They want to get that toy into production for Christmas. He's got six more months. Take it easy, Horace. Look, he's an okay guy, but he's in business. You got to remember that. It's nothing personal. How's it coming? Now don't you start on me. What's wrong? I'm not sure. I saw a kid last night. But were you ever on Randolph Street? I don't think so. Why? Randolph was my old street when I was a kid. He wore the same kind of clothes we used to wear. This kid I saw, same shirt, same pants, same shoes. Kids don't dress that way anymore. So uh, you're not going to believe this, but I was walking on the street, and all of a sudden I hear a kid yell, "Ring Olivio!" That's a game we used to play. You know how it made me feel hearing that. I was a very good Ring Olivio player. You have to be fast, and you need a lot of stamina. Boy, the running you have to do. First, we choose up sides. One potato, two potato, three potato, four. Remember that? Then one side has to hide. Once I was hiding behind a grocery in the back where they keep all the cartons and all. <laughs> Horace. So, I fell asleep back there. When I woke up, I took one look at my Mickey Mouse watch, and I. Mickey Mouse watch. My God, I haven't thought of that in twenty years. Remember when you had a Mickey Mouse watch? What a big deal that was. Anyway, I was telling you about last night. I was on Randolph Street for the first time. Look, in... Horace, I've got some work on my desk. I only wanted to I tell you. I just stopped in to say hello. See you at lunch. Of course, we never had toys like this back then. Lord. Oh, Mr. Judson, I, I didn't see you there. I want to ask you something. What was the point of shouting at my secretary over the telephone? She was shouting at me. Aren't you happy with your job here? Yes, but look, Horace, you're a first-rate designer. You have value to this company, and for our good as well as yours, I don't want to see it dissipated. You've been behaving peculiarly. Is there something wrong, maybe at home? Excuse me, Mr. Judson. I'm trying to finish this redesign. And I'm not speaking just to hear the sound of my own voice. Do you understand what I'm saying? Perhaps I shouldn't have bothered. Hello. Sorry, I'm late. Subway was tied up for about twenty minutes. <gasps> Somebody jumped. Nobody jumped. Why do you always think that? Well, it happens if you read the papers. Or Something that... broke down. You can't kiss your mother hello anymore. Hi, Mama. I'll see how the dinner's coming. Tired? Yeah. I was thinking. There's a double bill at the Regent. Two pictures you've been wanting to see. Going Let's just... back there tonight. Where? Randolph Street. What for? I want to see those kids again. But why? Because I want to. It's important. Important. Veal cutlets and succotash. It's canned, but you can hardly tell it from fresh. Let's sit down. Help yourself to the meat, Horace. If it's overcooked a little, blame it on the subway. Are you sure nobody jumped? Please, he said no. What's so great about disasters? What? I remember when we lived on the block. Every time there was an accident or something, you were always right there. Horace. Well, it's true. What about the time Harvey Bender got his arm caught in a fire hydrant? Harvey Bender? Who's Harvey Bender? <laughs> that wasn't the dopiest thing. What's he talking about? The hottest day of the summer, he picks the clog up the hydrant. We all figured they were going to have to bust it open to get his arm out. What do you mean you don't remember Harvey? We were playing marbles, you know, on the manhole cover. I remember it like it was this morning. I got this big fat puree, and I'm belting them out, cleaning up. When all of a sudden, this nut says, "Let's turn on the hydrant." <laughs> I swear. He was the gooniest kid. His favorite thing was Shakespeare sucking the ear. Horace, stop it! Why should I? Just stop, please. But he was one of the kids last night. Who was one of the kids? Harvey Bender. What? I saw him last night. Don't you know that's impossible? I know what I see. He was ten years old when you were ten years old. He's as old as you are now. 
I'm telling you, I saw him. And George Langbart and Cy Wright. They're still kids. He's got a fever, I can tell. I have not got a fever. Mother, be quiet. Horace, sit down. Feel his head. Leave me alone. Listen, darling. I don't know what's happening at your office, but I can see the way you come home. You're tired? I mean, overwork and sometimes... I would like you to see a doctor. What for? Just to let him check you. You think I'm imagining it. No, I don't. Yes, you do. Listen to me, Horace. Horace, where are you going? To see my friends. Horace, please. Will you look at all this? Frank on a roll. Three cents. No, thanks. Oh, excuse me, young folks. Bread and butter. butter. <laughs> Hey, what's where you going, huh? Sorry. Hey, give me my ball. What? Oh, sure. Davy, you come home or you're gonna get smacked. Bring a levio, caught, caught, caught. Bring a levio. My gosh, this late at night? What time is it? Bins, I old bins. He not. I didn't hear him. Me neither. I did too. What do you want from me? Wait, boys! Don't I know you? Hurry up, Hermie! Hey, Hermie Brant, come on! All right, already, I'm coming. Hermie? Wait! Hey, let's wipe some apples from the fruit stand. Hey, Nitsy, we each grab one. Next to Larry. Next to next to Larry. Okay, I'll go first. Boys, please. Some apples, huh? Ah, sour. Hey, what do you think about the big birthday party? He didn't even invite us. Can you believe it? Who, who, who are you talking about? Yeah, and I'm supposed to be his best friend. That stinks. We had a myrtle ice, right, Hermie? Boy, ain't how. Listen to me. I, I can explain. Come on. Let's get him. No. No! <laughs> Do you think I got enough ice cream? Huh? There's one quart of chocolate, one vanilla, and one butter pecan. Where should I put the cake so Horace won't see it? I don't know. In, in the kitchen. Where is he? What time is it? 20 to 8. I'm getting worried. He should have been home an hour ago. Oh, he probably just got stuck at the office. I'm going to call. Horace, you're so late. I didn't know what time it was. Something's wrong with your watch? I lost it again. But how? Hello, dear. I'm fired. You what? What are you talking about? I went and had a hamburger. That's why I'm late. I'm asking you something. You're fired from your job? Would you stop? Well, what are you yelling at me for? I want to know from Horace. He's trying to be funny, huh? No. Why... Why were you fired? I was inadequate in my work. Who said that? What does it matter? It doesn't... doesn't matter, Horace. A man loses his job, he's had for 15 years, and it doesn't matter? What do they mean, inadequate? Don't they know what they've got? I tell you, gold. They've got pure gold. Would you please stop it? Your life's blood is in that place. I want you to call Mr. Johnson or whatever his name is. You get him on the wire, and you let him know what's what. I'm not calling anybody. A weekly paycheck. You think you can find that on the street? What's going to happen to us? All of a sudden, my whole life is going before me. Up, down, up, down. I'm 61 years old. It's time I didn't have to be afraid anymore. Why don't you look at me when I'm talking to you? What's going to happen to me? Shut up! I'm going to talk to Horace alone. What did I do wrong? Ever in my whole life? Somebody tell me. I couldn't help it. It's only a job. Like there are other jobs. You were stagnating there. I never had another job. Why did she have to cry? She's an old woman, Horace. That's always her first reaction to trouble. She's scared to death. 
Step on a crack, break your mother's back. She'll be all right. Did you get any severance pay? I don't know what I got. I walked out of there. Well, let's forget about it for now. We've got the weekend. Monday, you can start looking. We'll make a list. I've got to support her. And you. And myself. I think that's easy. You know what Mr. Corey said? He said that I would Mr. Never... Corey was your teacher in 5B. Mr. Judson. He said that I was having a nervous breakdown. He's out of his mind. Listen, I'm telling you, I saw those kids, and I know who they are. Horace! They were running up and down the street, swiping apples and having fun. That's all they were doing, having fun. They yell fins. Did you ever yell fins? It's not the subject we're talking about. That is the subject. Me making a living for three people while they're swiping apples and running in the street. Well, you're a grown-up man. What do you think you're supposed to do? They were sore because they weren't invited to some kid's birthday party. That's the biggest problem they've got. Horace, you've got to stop this! That's what I'm gonna do! When I went back the second time, the same things happened all over again. Some man wanted to buy me a hot dog, those teenagers walked by holding hands, and when they let go to walk around me, they said bread and butter. Then this guy bumped into me. I tell you, Laura, nothing changed. It's some kind of a pattern, and I'm in it. I'm in it! God, Horace, stop! I'm gonna call a doctor. Well, whatever it is, I'm gonna find out. I have to! Horace, where are you going? You can't go out now! You can't! What's wrong with him? Laura, tell me! I don't know! What is the name of a doctor? Tell me the name of a doctor! What are you doing? Who are you calling? For heaven's sakes, I have to know what's going on here! Horace! Where's the birthday boy? Laura, what's wrong? Uh, maybe we'd better go. No, no, please come in. He'll be back. Frank on a roll. Three cents. No, thanks. Oh, excuse me, young folks. Bread and butter. <laughs> hey, what's where you going, huh? Sorry. Hey, give me my ball. What? Oh, sure. Davy, you come home or you're gonna get smacked! Ring Olivio, cod, cod, cod! Ring Olivio? My gosh, what time is it? Where's my watch? Fins, I owe Fins. Do you not? I didn't hear him. Me neither. I did too. What do you want from me? Hey, boys! Hurry up, Hermie. Hey, Hermie Brant, come on! All right already, I'm coming. Hermie? Wait! Hey, let's wipe some apples from the fruit stand. Hey, Nitsy, we each grab one. Next to Larry. Next to next to Larry. Okay, I'll go first. Some apples, huh? Ah, sour. Hey, what do you think about the big birthday party? He didn't even invite us. Can you believe it? Who, who, who are you talking about? Yeah, and I'm supposed to be his best friend. That stinks. We had to murder him, right, Hermie? Or in how? Listen to me. I, I can explain. Come on. Let's get him. No. No! No. No. Why don't we bust in on the party? Fellas. Ah, what for? Probably start crying like a baby. Listen, fellas, can't you hear me? Can't you see me? I gotta tell you something. Step on a line and you bust your father's spine. Cut it out. You've got to listen to me. So are we going to the party? What do we do when we get there? Who cares? They probably got ice cream. Who needs ice cream? It's better than standing around here. Please, look at me. I'm standing right here. Hermie. Hermie, are you my buddy? Fellas, please. I gotta tell you something. I know I got some apologizing to do. Georgie, Sai, come on. What are you giving me the treatment for? Will you listen? I couldn't help it. Hermie, I'm your best friend. You have to give me a chance. Well, if it ain't little Horace Maxwell Ford. The birthday boy. Why didn't you invite us to your party? We're gonna myrtleize you. No, please. Please, no. No. Laura, honey, 
I'm sorry about his job, but he'll have another one in no time. He's a wonderful designer. Thank you for saying that. Oh, this party will perk him up. Best thing in the world for him right now. We even got him a yo-yo. <laughs> the kind that lights up. I know. All right, everybody. Ready? Somebody get the lights. Laura? Don't make a sound till I open the door. Come in, darling. He dropped this. What? Where did you get that? Oh, Laura. Laura, what's happening? He dropped this? What does that mean? It looks like a Mickey Mouse watch. That's exactly what it is. Horace? Horace, where are you? Horace? Somebody? Somebody? Horace, is that you? Laura? I'm here. It's all right, Horace. I'm here. Laura, help me up. Of course. Don't ask me what happened. I won't. Because I really don't. Oh, your face. You're all cut up. It doesn't matter. Where are my glasses? Here. Here. At least they're not broken. Can we go home now? That's a good idea. A very good idea. I have no idea what happened to Laura. But for one minute or one second, I don't know. I, I saw things that made some of the memories I had a lie. Because when I was a kid, a lot of it was an ugly, sad nightmare. And I saw that. I know what it was. I remember it now. All of it. I don't know what happened either, Horace. But I think we all do that. We remember what was good and we black out what was bad. Maybe if we didn't, we couldn't live at all. Come on, let's go home. Wait. What's this? It looks like your father's watch. Yeah. I must have dropped it. Come on, Horace. There's a party waiting. Party? It was a surprise. Everybody's there. Lenny? Yes, and Betty. They got you something. We're not supposed to tell you, but I think... Mr. Horace Maxwell Ford, age 38. A bit disheveled, but soon to be whole again. With his shirt tail tucked in, his socks up, his glasses straight, and his hair combed. At least most of the time. A mild man, except when talking about his favorite subject, his beloved toys. The ones he builds because he never had them as a child. Don't feel sorry for him. He's just begun to understand that he's really a very adequate man. All grown up and not the awkward boy he used to be. A life-changing discovery, and one that could happen only in the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop, twilightzoneradio.com. Visit twilightzoneradio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. The Incredible World of Horace Ford, starring Mike Starr with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and based on a script by Reginald Rose. Heard in the cast were Taylor Miller, Meg Thalken, Doug James, Carl Van Sickle, Adam Blaine, John Starr, Bill, Charlie, Alex, and Henry Kummerer, Martin Hughes, Bob Blaine, and Adam Tangway. 
To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Paul Patch, Terry Jennings, the American Forces Radio and Television Service, our sponsors, and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. traveling through another dimension, a dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind, a journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. How's that, Mr. Raiden? It should do nicely. The volume could be a bit higher, though. Higher? You gotta be careful not to break those speakers. I thought you installed subwoofers, state of the art, as I requested. Oh, we did. For later. Will you hear them? When the explosion hits here, you'll really feel it. Good. Good. I don't know where you got your sound effects, but you'd swear a bomb was going off outside. I mean, a big bomb. That's precisely what I want. I got the other TV hooked up, sir, at the end of the hall, like you said. Let me see. Here's the remote control. You got your on, and then you got your off and your volume. Uh, did you load the videotape? Sure did. As soon as the monitors go on, it starts rolling. Why don't you show me? All right, Mr. Raiden. Let's give it a test run. Look at that, would you? There's the street outside. Only now it looks like the beginning of World War III. Yes. <laughs> yes. This calls for something of a celebration. If you don't mind me asking, where would you get the footage? Some special effects guys out in Hollywood? Oh, you might say I have my contacts. Given adequate funding, anything is possible. Yeah, some setup you got here. All part of the show, huh? This is not a show. It may be, let us say, an illusion, but this room is not an illusion. It happens to be the best designed bomb shelter on the face of the earth. But tonight it's for gags, right? Something of the sort. A practical joke, and I trust a most effective one. Uh, you could say that again, Mr. Raiden. When those sound effects start and that stuff goes on the TV, you'd swear the whole world was getting blasted. That's the general idea. I've got three guests coming this evening, rather special guests, and I wouldn't want them to be disappointed. Well, it fooled me, and I put most of the wiring in. A drink before you go, gentlemen, to a job well done? Uh, you no, no thanks. Uh, it's getting pretty late. Are these friends of yours? How's that? You're uh, doing all this to fool three of your friends. They must be, uh, I mean, they must be real, like, special friends. Oh, they are. They are indeed very special friends. This, in a sense, is the moment a man lives his entire life for. Yeah, 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 I, I bet. Uh, that about it, Mr. Raiden? Yes, I'd say that uh, just about does it. Ah, uh, well, we, we gotta go. So long, Mr. Raiden. Good luck on your party. Party? Yes, you might call it the best party ever. 
<laughs> Bye, Mr. Raiden. <laughs> That guy gives me the heebie-jeebies. I know what you mean. This has got to be the number one kook in the whole country. I mean, can you imagine a guy spending that kind of a bundle just to set up a phony atom bomb explosion? And the whole thing set to go off at a quarter to twelve. Some kind of fanatic is he, huh? What's his angle? Eh, practical joke, maybe, you know, like he said. Yeah, the half a million bucks, that's some joke. Hey, hit the button, will you? Yeah, sure. You know, it's a funny thing. What? If they was to drop a bomb, I mean, if the whole world was to go up for real, it'd be kind of a pity if, uh, if the one guy left alive was somebody like him. Wow, no kidding. Well, hey, here comes the elevator. Live and let live, that's what I always say. Yeah, you got that right. Let's get out of here and grab some chow. Now you're talking. Going up? <laughs> oh, yeah. Hard to get used to, ain't it? This is the basement of a fashionable midtown skyscraper and office building. It's owned and occupied by one Paul Radin, whom you've just met. Mr. Radin is rich, eccentric, and single-minded. How rich, we can already surmise. How eccentric and single-minded, we shall see in a moment because you have just been invited to a very special party, catered and conducted exclusively for residents of the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, One More Paul Bearer, starring Chelsea Ross, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. And here's the main course, dear. Baked fish, just the way you like it. Splendid. Would you care for some more milk? Not just yet, Mary. Sit down, please. Oh, who could that be? I'll get it. No, you won't. I hope it's not one of the parishioners. Wait here. But you've been on your feet all day. Dinner will keep. Nonsense. I'll see to it, dear. Oh, yes, I'll tell him at once. Who is it? The most peculiar man. What did he want? I I'm not sure, but there's a limousine waiting at the curb. He said something about a matter of life and death. Odd, isn't it? He said exactly the same thing to me. And beyond that, Colonel, you've been told nothing. Hardly a word. The driver appeared at the club, something about an old acquaintance. And you, madam? I'm as much in the dark as you are. I was busy grading papers when that very strange man in the front seat came to my door. It sounded terribly urgent. I'll have a word with him. Driver! Yes, sir. Where, may I ask, are you taking us? Be there soon, sir. Yes, but where? Who do you work for? My employer wishes to remain anonymous. Well, isn't this mysterious? Like an Agatha Christie novel. But surely you can tell us if there's a life in the balance. Here we are. Where the devil? Mm, a very nice part of town by the looks of it. Please exit from the right of the vehicle. See here, if this is some sort of joke. I assure you, sir, it's no joke. Yet you can't even tell me who gave you your orders. It is an impressive building. You may use the private elevator. I know this building. Uh, that fountain. Elevator? To what floor? This one has only one button, and it says down. I'll enter the code for you. Well, if it doesn't go up, then it must go... The other way, of course. This is outrageous. I demand that you return me to the officer's club at once. Driver? Driver! It appears that we've been left to our own devices. It was ever thus. After you, madam. What in the... Good evening, friends. That voice. If you'd be so good. 
Just follow the hall to the security door at the end of the hall. There's something vaguely familiar about the tone, but I can't quite... Enough. It's time to find out what this is all about. That's right. Just come in, if you will. See here. Do sit down and make yourselves comfortable. Wait. I remember now. Yes. The accommodations are a bit spartan, but I trust you'll find them adequate for your needs. How good of you to come. Colonel Hawthorne, Reverend Hughes, and of course, Mrs. Langsford. I'm delighted to see you all. What? Such blank faces? Don't tell me you've forgotten. It's Raiden, isn't it? Aren't you Paul Raiden? You have an excellent memory, Reverend. And how about you, Colonel? Do you recognize me? Yes, I... I believe I do. You served with me once, didn't you? I did indeed. A second lieutenant. Yes. In an infantry regiment under your command. I recall it vaguely, and I seem to recall something else, too. It's not surprising that it doesn't come flooding back. After all, you had a few thousand men under you, a few thousand cogs in the great military machine. I was only one of those cogs. But then again, you didn't court-martial all of them, did you? That distinction you reserved for me alone. Oh, yes, I do recall now. You refused to lead an assault on a hill. Did I? Refused in the face of a direct order. The delay cost us a company of men. That was your contention at the court-martial board. It's what sealed my fate. I was dishonorably discharged, Colonel. Stripped of rank and booted out. How oh, fortunate for you. Fortunate, you say? Were I permitted to dictate the sentence, I would have had you shot. <laughs> of this I have no doubt. No doubt at all. But what kind of host am I? Let's get on with the festivities. I have sandwiches, snacks of various kinds, and of course there are beverages. Consider the bar open and at your disposal. Oh, for pity's sake, Paul. I must apologize. There's a lady present. Please forgive me for not addressing you first, Mrs. Langsford. Do you recall who I am? Of course I do. I taught you in high school. Well done. I don't forget my students. <laughs> Oh, now and then I find that they get jumbled together. Of course. But if I prod my memory a bit, I'm able to connect names with faces. And in your case, with character. I made an impression on you, did I? That's understandable. Because you flunked me, Mrs. Langsford. I certainly did. You dressed me down in front of an entire class, called me names, humiliated me. And quite deservedly so. Ah, but that's neither here nor there. I invited you here this evening for another purpose than to dredge up old animosities. Invited? I can't speak for my companions, Raiden, but the request I received was more in the form of an ultimatum. Your chauffeur said it was a matter of utmost urgency. Why, yes. Yes, indeed. That's the way it was broached to me, too. A matter of life and death. I was eating dinner, and my wife Mary got up to answer the door. And when she came back, she had such an odd expression on her face. Ah, Reverend Hughes. Still a bit on the wordy side, aren't you? It never ceases to amaze me, really, how changeless we remain over the years. But I suppose the habits of a lifetime are not that easily set aside now, are they? Perhaps you'll be good enough, Paul, to get to the point and tell us why we're here. I'd be delighted to. But first... Can I get you something? A highball, perhaps? Or a cup of coffee for the Reverend? How do you take it, black or white? Nothing, thank you. Paul, you're trying my patience. Habits, Mrs. Langsford. The incredible persistence of habits. You call me Paul, as if I were still sitting in your classroom. What about you, a nice cup of tea? Nothing for me. And you, Colonel, a tot of rum, perhaps? I would be deeply appreciative, Mr. Raiden, if you made your point and then let us leave. You've obviously called us here for something, and I, for one, would welcome hearing whatever it is without further delay. <laughs> How staunch! How commanding you sound, Colonel. 
The military mind never changes either. See here. Always pressing forward. Drive, drive, drive against the objective and wipe it out. Colored flags stuck in a map and troops stuck out in the hot sun. An officer must have nerves made of steel and a head full of cement. As you were, Raiden. Oh, no, Colonel. Not as I was, as I am. Which rather upsets the chain of command, don't you think? Because I'm in command now, and what I command at this moment is your attention. You see, I've called the three of you here for a very specific purpose. I think I'm beginning to understand. Of course you are. Always so intelligent, so insightful. Let's do it in proper chronology. My dear old school marm shall begin. That staunch and intrepid educator who would look so incongruously out of place without those severe spectacles covering those severe eyes looking out of an equally severe face who possesses such vast prerogatives from the local school board and the vast courage that comes from pitting all her wits and training and knowledge against poor captive children. Are you quite finished, Paul? My dear lady, I haven't even begun. May I make an observation, then? You have permission to speak. Would you like to address the class? Oh, just a comment, Paul, on how incredible this whole thing is. That a man like yourself, a millionaire many times over, a big, important man who walks with kings and heads of state and industrial tycoons... You've followed my career. How gratifying. How incredibly tiny a mind this kind of man must have to dwell on an incident in a high school classroom of some twenty-odd years ago and to let it fester inside of him, as it's done with you. I've never liked humiliation, Mrs. Langsford, whether it occurred twenty years ago or in the past ten minutes. Humiliation? All right, Paul, let's talk of humiliation. Let's talk of your humiliation. Mr. Raiden was caught cheating during an examination. Caught red-handed. Oh, not a federal crime, of course, but perhaps just a bit commentative on the nature of the person. And when accused of the act, he tried to plant his crib sheet on an innocent student. How right you are, Mr. Raiden, that I stood you up on your feet and in front of the entire class I told you what you were. But no room then was there, Mrs. Langsford, for just a moment of compassion? An iota of sympathy for a frightened and desperate boy? Oh, Mr. Raiden, I've dealt with frightened and desperate children all my life. And it might surprise you to know that I've given them more sympathy and compassion than learning. But neither sympathy nor compassion can be handed out wholesale like cheap bubblegum. The recipient must be worthy of them, and you never were. You were a devious, dishonest troublemaker. And for all your millions, my guess is that you are still devious, you are still dishonest, and I have no doubt that even now you're a troublemaker. You haven't changed either, Mrs. Langsford. Mr. Raiden, after so many years, what can be gained by... A great deal can be gained, Reverend. A great deal. But surely... You can go to the devil, Reverend. Raiden! You too, Colonel. And that's not a figure of speech. Tonight, my friends, just a few short minutes from now, you all most assuredly can and will go to the devil. <laughs> Mr. Raiden, obviously years have passed between now and whenever it was you felt you suffered various indignities at our hands. Felt? How conveniently you forget the extent of my suffering. You, for example, accused me of lack of character, and worse, you put a scandal over my head and all but destroyed my reputation. I do remember now. A girl... A young girl whom you drove to suicide, because even at that early stage, you were not a man to hold honor in very high regard. So merciless and so judgmental. What of her responsibility, her character? 
You're far from consistent in your dispensation of forgiveness. No, the robes of a man of God never became you, Reverend. For all your pious pronouncements, they never quite fit. Enough of this. I'm getting out of here, now. You can try, Colonel. This is outrageous. Save your strength. You're going to need it. Open this door at once. The doors don't answer to your command, only to mine. They're made of solid steel. The walls are 18 inches of reinforced concrete sheathed in six inches of lead. I have my own generator plant, my own air system, and at the other end of the hall, a storeroom the size of a warehouse stocked with food and supplies. But in God's name, why? What are you afraid of? Afraid? Hardly. Prudent might be a more accurate word. Remember the story of the three little pigs, houses of straw and so forth, and only one built to withstand the blast. Blast? What blast? The days of fallout shelters are over, Paul. You're hopelessly out of date. Focus your minds, if you will. Can't you imagine why I built this? Why don't you tell us, Paul? Colonel, you of all people should understand logistics. Does it occur to you why a man would go to all this trouble and expense? You've built what amounts to be a bunker. So I have. But we're not at war. Not at this precise moment. You're insane. Am I? This is the middle of the city. Ah, now you're getting warm, closer to the point. What are you talking about? About beginning a vigil, my friends. The long wait and the countdown to oblivion. Will you start making sense? I taught you better than this, this gibberish. You are correct, Mrs. Langsford, about several things. I've walked with kings and tycoons, as you so rightly perceived. I've walked with them, and more importantly, I've listened to them, to the things they have to say, the special knowledge they are able to impart because of their positions of privilege. As a result, I managed to keep abreast of the times and usually well ahead of them. The point. Patience, Reverend. I'm coming to it. You see, I know things that are going to happen. Only God can know that. Is that right? Anyone who claims otherwise is a false prophet. In most cases, perhaps, but not in this one. Must we listen to a theological debate? As I was saying, I pay informants, couriers, high-level attaches and the like for a service. Information. And I pay them quite handsomely, I might add. What sort of information? All the inner workings of certain, let us say, diplomatic agencies, military installations, information that's beyond top secret, but available if the price is right. You're engaged in espionage. Hear me out. Forty-eight hours ago, I received a most interesting bit of news, or rather, several bits meaningless in themselves that together form one unavoidable conclusion, something that is known to perhaps only six men in the world. If you're trying to frighten us, it isn't working. Then let me give it a somewhat finer edge. This evening, this very evening, the world is coming to an end. Why of all the... At 11.45, there will be no more city. No more country. Rubbish. Oh, it was inevitable, don't you think? After so many years, so many weapons stockpiled, someone somewhere was bound to become impatient to finally push the button that brings us to the reward we so justly deserve. And make no mistake about it, we all do. It began when we were born into this cesspool called life. The original fall from grace from which there is no escape. The earth is an empty graveyard waiting to be filled, and tonight it will be. What a cynical, depraved view of humanity. By 30 minutes after midnight, there will be no more humanity. It's too late to stop. Pandora's box has been opened. There's no turning back. They are going to bomb us, and we are going to bomb them. By dawn, there will be nothing left but rubble and bodies. And now, within a few moments, it begins. You'll be hearing the sirens very shortly. That's the red alert. It means their missiles are on the way. Ours will follow soon after with proper military efficiency. And you are to survive, Mr. Raiden. Is that the idea? I am to survive. 
As long as I stay here, 300 feet under the ground. Already buried, one might say. How about you, Reverend Hughes? Or the rest of you? Would you care to survive too? Or shall I be the only pallbearer? What? It can't be. Don't panic. This whole thing may be a hoax. Please remain seated. If you require proof, I'll turn on the radio. This is the Emergency Broadcast Network. The Office of Civil Defense has just announced a red alert. Enemy missiles are approaching the United States. Repeat, this is a red alert. Enemy missiles are approaching the United States at a high rate of speed. Arrival time is estimated at only a few minutes from now. All citizens are advised to get off the streets immediately and take cover. This is not a test. Repeat, this is not a test. The first missiles have just hit. Are we still on the air? How long do we have? Good Lord, it's actually happening. This is real, folks. This is not a test. Comments? Perhaps a little military sophistry now, Colonel. A quote from General Grant or Lee or Patton. And you, Reverend, something enriching from the gospel? Oh, my, such silence, Mrs. Langford. Nothing in that vast reservoir, that pilgrim's progress mind of yours to fit this situation? No mental eraser you can use to wipe out reality? I've got to get to my wife. Oh, by all means, Reverend. Certainly, get to your wife. Hold hands and die together. Take your hands off me. You turn my stomach, Reverend Hughes. You know that. Find your wife. I intend to. That's not what's on your mind. What's on your mind is what's on the Colonel's mind and the school marms over there. Your precious hide. Your sanctified flesh. That's what preoccupies you at this moment. Let go of me, Mr. Raiden. If I'm to die tonight, I want to be with someone I love. <laughs> Very theatrical, Reverend Hughes. But far more burlesque, I'm afraid, than legitimate theater. Kindly have the decency. Why don't you have the decency, Reverend? To depart this earth with just a fragment of the truth in your mouth. What truth? Tell me to my face that you are so scared, so miserably frightened, that you'd sell your wife by the pound if it meant your survival. Admit it. If those were the last words I ever spoke, Mr. Raiden, they would also stand as the worst falsehood I ever uttered while living. Why am I not convinced? Will you open the door, Mr. Raiden? Will you let me leave now? Take a look at the monitor first. You might want to consider what awaits you outside before you open that door. How did you know, Raiden? How could you possibly have known exactly when? What difference does it make? If we leave now, we might make it back to our homes. Highly unlikely at this point, but I suppose hope springs eternal. Oh, of course, Mrs. Langsford, back home to your aging sister, no doubt. And you, Colonel, back to the club so you can die with your cronies amid all your medals and memorabilia. Whatever we do, it's none of your concern. My dear friends, shall we drop the pretense now, this instant? Shall we all of us now dare to speak the truth? I told you how this room was constructed, steel, concrete, and lead. It is the only place where you can survive. Now, what is all this nonsense about going back to your homes? You mean to say you'd walk out of here to certain death, when by simply staying where you are, you're assured that you'll live? Are we to understand, Mr. Raiden, that you will permit us this luxury? That you will allow us to stay in your fortress? Oh, indeed. Indeed, Colonel. As a matter of fact, it's precisely why I asked you all to come. Each of you, in your own way, tried to destroy me. But I will not repay the compliment in like kind. That is to say, I won't require an eye for an eye. Nothing quite as basic, as naked as that. Then I'd be interested, Mr. Raiden. What is your price? <laughs> the Colonel would be interested. I should think so. 
And I presume the school marm and the reverend, too, would be interested. I submit, dear friends, that you're not just interested. It's the only single thing on God's earth that has any meaning left. How much will Raiden charge so you can stay here in safety? All right, my friends, here's the all-important price tag. The fiddler has played, and here comes the bill for the music. But be sure to listen carefully, because time is very rapidly running out. Say it, man. What is your price? You will, each of you, each one of you in turn, beg my pardon. Ask my forgiveness, and if need be, you'll get down on your hands and knees to perform that function. Is that all? That's all. Oh, Father, who art in heaven? I suggest you prepare your requests without delay. The first bombs have just exploded somewhere near the city. I assure you, the next ones won't miss. Did you hear what I said? I need your decisions now. Say pretty, please. I beg your pardon. Pretty please with sugar on it. How's that, teacher? Speak up. Pretty please with sugar on it, Mr. Raiden. It's what children say to exact a favor. Children, Mr. Raiden, but they say it by rote. It comes out pure. There's no meanness to it, no cruelty. That's something that comes much later in life. The capacity to damage other human beings. That's enough. Not quite. You let me out of here, Mr. Raiden. If I'm to spend my last quarter hour on Earth, I'd rather it be with a stray cat, or alone in Central Park, or with a city full of strangers whose names I'll never know. Have you lost your mind? The door, Mr. Raiden. Will you open the door now? You heard them. Heard what? Stubbornness for its own sake? Sheer contrariness? Absolute irrationality in the face of uh, that? Open up, Raiden. Yes, open it. You're too blind, or you're too stupid. That must be it, because none of you understand how simple it is. All you have to do, literally all you have to do, is to say a sentence. Just a string of silly, mindless words, like a command, Colonel, like a prayer, Reverend, like a lesson. Nothing more than that. All you have to say is that you're sorry. I have nothing to be sorry for. You deserve that, court-martial, and more. I'll hardly withdraw my complaint now. And I, Mr. Raiden, pity you that you still can't see the error of your ways. May God have mercy on your soul. All right. All right. You want to go out there and die? Go! But you'll all be back inside of five minutes. There's the elevator. Go, go, go ahead. Use it. Carry the farce to its conclusion. Stand aside. Where are you going? Up there? To what? As far away from here as I can get. Do you hear that? Are you deaf? You still want to go up on the street? Why? To get a good look at the frenzy and the panic and the horror? Before you come back down here to your only salvation? Move away from the elevator. But you don't need to see it firsthand. Watch it from here on the monitor. You can see it happen, the whole thing. Watch as your world is shoveled into a grave and covered over. Move, or I shall be forced to move you. You fool. After you, ma'am. Last chance. I mean it. It's your last chance. What about it, Hughes? Is life so stinking cheap you can throw it down a drain? Go ahead, Reverend. Answer the man. See if you can get him to understand. I don't know that I can. Life is dear, Mr. Raiden. Extremely precious. Infinitely valuable. But there are things that come even higher. Honor is one. Perhaps that is the most expensive one of all. Amen. Try not to get too lonely, Paul. Use mirrors. They may help. Put them all over the room. Then everywhere you look, you'll have the company of a world full of little Paulies. No, no. It will be make-believe, of course. The mirrors, I mean. Just a fantasy, really. But your whole life has been a fantasy, hasn't it? A parade of illusions that march by. Illusions about the things people have done to you. 
illusions about what is justice, illusions about about what constitutes dignity for even the lowest of us. A fantasy of your own making. And now you can have it all to yourself. No, no, it, it's not true. This is, this is no fantasy. You'll be back. You'll see. You'll be back. This is the Emergency Broadcast Network. The Office of Civil Defense has issued a red alert. The United States is under enemy attack. The first wave of bombers and long-range missiles slipped through our defenses by unknown means and are on the approach now. Evacuation procedures are underway in all major cities. The president will make an announcement as soon as... As soon as... This is real, ladies and gentlemen. This is not a drill. This is not a test. This is an actual emergency. What? That's not what he's supposed to say. our regularly scheduled programming to bring you this live coverage. Just before midnight this evening, several of the country's major population centers suffered missile attacks, resulting in severe casualties, siege mentality, unconfirmed report of nuclear detonations, the White House, the Midwest, the coast. We will remain on the air for as long as... What's wrong with this? Off! I want this tape off! That's enough! That is quite enough! for it to actually happen. Th there's, there's nothing, nothing left. Nothing. The city is gone. Is there, is there no one else alive? Somebody? Anybody? <laughs> What's wrong with him? He must be drunk. Poor man, he looks crazy. Yeah, look at his eyes. Why is he crying? <laughs> All right, Mac, get up. Hey, Mac, what's the matter with you? Got a little too much to drink, huh? On a beautiful night like this. Well, oh, now, let me take you home. Where do you live? Can you tell me that? I didn't, I didn't want it this way. Won't somebody listen to me? Isn't there anyone left in the world who can hear me? Someone! Someone! Uh, this is Saunders. Thank you, I'm in front of the Raiden building. You want to send a car over here right away? Some poor devil's lying on the ground off his rocker. No ID. Yeah, it could be anybody. Yeah, okay. It's okay, Mac. Help's on the way. Now, why don't you come on over here and sit down by the fountain? That's right, in front of this nice building. You weren't going to try taking a bath in it, were you? Because then I'd have to arrest you, and I wouldn't want to do that. Can you hear me? Can't you even tell me where you live? You know where you are? Anything around here look familiar at all? What happened to him? Another nutcase. Never saw him before. Is he deaf or blind? Okay, folks, let's move along. Move right along. Give the poor fellow some breathing space till the ambulance gets here. Easy, Mac. Take it easy. You're gonna be okay. No, 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 somebody, somebody, 
some, any, anybody, anybody, is anybody left alive in all this rubble? Not another human being anywhere in all the world. Please, please, please. Oh, please, God, oh, please. <laughs> Mr. Paul Radin, a dealer in fantasy and human misery, especially his own. Trapped in the graveyard of his mind, and now, as it has always been for him, the only person in the world. The sole pallbearer at a funeral he alone manufactured in a bleak and empty landscape called the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, You'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop, twilightzoneradio.com. Visit twilightzoneradio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD, or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. One More Paul Bearer, starring Chelsea Ross, with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were David Darlow, Meg Thalken, Rich Kamenick, Kirk Muller, Norm Waddell, Jeff Lupiton, Carl Amari, Roderick Peoples, and Lawrence Nepidal. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Paul Patch, Terry Jennings, the American Forces Radio and Television Service, our sponsors, and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. traveling through another dimension, a dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind, a journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Yeah, ship. There's a planet up ahead. I think it's the one you've been looking for. I see it. Thanks, Marilyn. We'll take it from here. How's our course, Mr. Knopf? Bearing 0090, Commander. Gravitational field? 1.1, same mass as Earth. Almost. Good. We don't need to compensate. That'll save some power. All we have to do is slingshot in and follow the orbit for one revolution. This is the last planet on the list, right? Right. One more recon and it's back home. Commander. Yeah, off. Think they're going to give us a parade? You mean up Fifth Avenue with ticker tape? Don't hold your breath. Why not? We've been in space longer than any other mission, right? Right, but this isn't a glamour job. We're strictly survey and reconnaissance. The guys who make planet fall get the front page, you know that. Uh, yeah, the pretty boys. The ones from Central Casting. So what's wrong with us? Are we that ugly? Well, I don't know about you, Knopf. I'm serious. I mean, we're in shape. I work out every weight period. I take all the food supplements. I even got a UV tan. Look at this profile. Pretty good, huh? Heads up. 
The planet's in sight. Got the cameras ready? Yeah, yeah. Shutters are all set. Spectroscope? Check. Biodetector? Check. Digital storage bank? Check and double check. Let's do it and get out of here. You know, maybe I'll get a satellite interview this time. What do you think? Or a collector's hologram. An action figure, at least. Ready for flyby. That's your mark. It's not like I want more money or anything. I mean, I'm not greedy. Set coordinates. I just want what's coming to me. A little respect. On one. On one, got it. I mean, six months in deep sleep for every mission. Three, two, one. But that's the same as staying in bed while everybody else is doing things. You know, going places, having a life, in other words. One, set. Okay, okay. Oh, good Lord, there's a meteor belt. That's not in the database. Fire retro rockets. Uh, we're going too fast. They'll stall out. Manual override. Now? That's in order. If you say so. Manual firing of retro rockets is not recommended at this speed. Severe damage may result. I'll say that again, boys. Manual override is not. Ah, we'll have to ride this out. No sweat, Commander. Those meteors are the size of fleas. We missed the orbit. Scuttle the flyby and get us out of here. Too late. Gravity field's got us. Then set her down or it'll tear us apart. Fire side retros. Did you know that firing retro rockets in a gravity field wastes energy? I really think you should wait to attain proper cruising speed. Boys, I'm not kidding about this. I'm feeling pretty shook up right now. Shut your mouth, computer. Retro's on. Turning. We have to set down now. Look for an open space. Looking, Commander. But we're losing altitude fast. Then go for the first clean landmass, you see. We're in a dive. Level her out. Tail gear down. I'm trying. Hard starboard. Harder. We're going to burn out the bearings. 500. 400. 300. Turn. Turn! Landing at this angle is unsafe at any speed. Please apply your anti-vibration absorbers and abort your present course. I'm serious about this, boys. I really, really mean it. The fine for unsafe turns in planet space is just not cost-effective on this mission. Boys, can you hear me? The time is the space age, when interplanetary flights to collect scientific data are a matter of course. Except that in this instance, the data collectors made a miscalculation and flew too close to the planet in question. Below them is a barren landscape located millions of miles from Earth that unfortunately has little to recommend it for an extended stay. So the most pressing order of business is simply to repair the craft and head home. But as you might imagine, some things are easier said than done. The cast of characters in this little misadventure? You've just met them. William Fletcher, commander of the craft, his co-pilot Peter Knopf, and the voice of a computer with the unlikely name of Marilyn, whose job it is to make sure these flyboys get back home safe and sound. As to any other individuals who might inhabit this particular locale, well, you may never actually meet them face to face. But you can take it on faith that they're here just the same, as these two gentlemen will soon find out. Because we're about to partake of an unscheduled exploration into that gray shaded area in space and time known as the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, The Little People, starring Daniel J. Travanti, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Well, Commander, did you get the engine compartment open? I did. How's it look? The ship's repairable, but I can't touch any of those gimbal bearings for a while, even with the gloves. It's like a furnace in there now. It needs to cool down first. And that grand event will come when? Tomorrow night, maybe. Or the following morning. 
That's a swig from the old bottle, isn't it? You picked a nice place to sit down, Fletcher. Real nice. The floor of a canyon. You must be some kind of eight-ball artist, because you snookered us but good. I took us to the first landmass that came up on the screen. The way I remember it, there wasn't much of a choice. And for the record, Knopf, I didn't pepper the side of that vehicle with pin-sized meteor holes. I also didn't foul up those rocket boosters. You think I did? I didn't say that. We can chalk it up to Mother Nature if you like. Or gremlins. All right, all right. Just strikes me as kind of a dumb head place to set down. The bottom of a canyon. The walls are a mile high, we can't climb out. The only way we're going anywhere is to blast off. If you can make those repairs in time. Oh, I'll get them repaired. Don't you worry about it. And we've got the time we need. There's enough rations in the hold right up that ladder. Matter of fact, I brought some down so you wouldn't have to exert yourself. Here, knock yourself out. Food concentrate, A-163, modified luncheon plan. Mmm. Kind of gets the old juices flowing, doesn't it? Uh, there may come a moment in time when I'll enjoy this. But that time hasn't quite hit me yet. Wonder what we get for dinner. A pea-sized steak and a capsule of tang? Better chow down now. If you don't, you won't have enough strength to do anything. Hold your socket wrenches for you, you mean. Look, if you don't want to get your little hands dirty... I'm eating it, all right? Ooh. Oh, jeez, what is this stuff? Petrified wood? I think you dropped this. Be my guest. You know, there may come a moment in time when you'll lick a rock as if it were the drumstick of a Thanksgiving turkey. But for the time being, buddy, you'll eat what's prescribed to eat. And if you've got any deep-rooted complaints, enter them into the ship's ledger, for the record. But don't spray them all over me, because it's a waste of effort and a waste of food. Do you read me, Knopf? Yeah, loud and clear. Then dwell on it. And while you're dwelling on it, you might count a few blessings. We don't have any extra food and water, that's a fact. But we've landed in a place where there's oxygen and we can survive. We walked away from the landing without a single bone out of place. And all things considered, I'd say we happen to be a couple of extremely lucky people. Now, the standing order is as follows. You got tears to shed, save them for sleep time and shed them into your pillow. Just don't bother me with that. Now, do you read me? Still loud and clear, Commander. But there are times when a man gets sick of being led around by the nose, and I mean sick to death. That's a big thing with you, isn't it, Knopf? What is? Taking orders. Being on the receiving end of a command. That's hard for you to live with, isn't it? Oh, if I had my druthers, I might stick in a few changes. Like what? Say again? I mean beyond getting out of here. Let's assume that this is the end of the line. Try to use that imagination of yours. Say this happened to be it for us. What would you ask for to sweeten the pot? If you could have anything. A sirloin steak. A blonde? What? How about mumbly peg? Or maybe 20 questions. Try me after dinner. I may feel up to charades by then. Just a point of interest is all. What are you interested in, Fletcher? I guess I'm interested in what makes you tick. Or maybe it's what makes you tick so loudly. What do you hunger for the most? Try this one off for size, Fletch. I'd like a whole lot of people at my elbow. What do you think of that? And the more, the merrier. And the louder, the better. I'd like Yankee Stadium right alongside me. Anywhere I go, but I'd like them on my terms. That's what I'm getting at. What are your terms? I'd like to be the number one straw boss. I'd like to be the one who gives the orders. I'll bet you would. That a crime? No, no. Hey. What's the matter? Shh. What's wrong with you? Did you hear that? Hear what? Something wrong with your ears? What? That. That sound. Sound? Fletch, I heard something. I definitely heard a sound. A sound like... A sound like what? Of people. Of voices. Right. I know what it was. You do? Sure. It was the crowd at Yankee Stadium cheering when you throw out the first ball of the season. What else could it be? Hold on, I think they want you to sing the national anthem while you're at it. You don't believe me? Sure I believe you. 
Of course, this planet is uninhabited, which you'd know if you'd bother to look at the database. I'm telling the truth, Fletch. So am I. Now, why don't you take a walk around and see if you can find us some water while I get to work on the ship? I've got an energy panel to fix before the sun goes down. Or should I say both suns? How's the repair coming, boys? It's coming. And it's just me, ship. Where's Peter? Lord only knows. Off communing with nature or something. Hmm. That's not very considerate. We need him if we want to get home. Wouldn't you agree, Commander? I can handle it, ship. Well, it is hot in here, and frankly, I don't think you can tolerate the temperature as well as I can, Willie. Me? I'm doing fine. But you, you've got circuit boards that'll fry if they overheat. You want me to turn on the air conditioning? I don't think that's such a good idea, Commander. It would only use up more of our power. Then why don't you give it a rest? How's that, Willie? Shut yourself down so I can get my work done. Do my conversational skills displease you? No more than normal. But every word I say uses up seven calories of my energy. Are you sure? I don't see that information in my data bank. Take my word for it. Oh, my. Then you've just wasted... Let me see. Thirty-five? No. One hundred and two? No. Two hundred? I can count, ship. Twenty-eight more? I'd better switch to monitor mode before you collapse. It is odd, though, that your vital signs don't show any extra loss of energy. Nap time for you, sweet dreams. Thanks, Willie. And don't call me Willie. Nobody calls me that. Nobody human. I'll make a note of that in my crew profile, Commander. And remember, if you need me, I'm always here for you. How could I forget? Don't let the bed bugs bite. Sorry? Forget it, ship. Catch you later. How's it going? Well, well. And where has my wandering boy been all day? Taking a walk. Another one? You take a lot of walks, buddy. Something better to do? Oh, a few things, like checking out the subspace radio and the hydraulics. The propulsion system, the injectors, the thrust chamber. Yeah, Noff, there's a few things you could do. But no, you got more important places to be. Still hearing voices? Maybe. Guess I can't blame you. A few more days on this rock, I'll hear a few of my own. Find much out there? Not much. I could have told you that. I think it would be an exceptionally good idea if you started to work on those charts again. You sound like the computer. I need your cooperation, is all. Offhand, I'd say we should be able to try it tomorrow, late afternoon. That is, if you can tear yourself away from your bird walks long enough to climb into the co-pilot seat again. Thanks. Don't mention it. Hot, isn't it? Tolerable. You some kind of a camel, Nov? What do you mean? It just occurs to me, I haven't seen you take any water. I'm a straight whiskey man myself. Or hadn't you noticed? You're going to have to do better than that. What's going on? Repeat the question. You heard me. Your water hasn't been touched in 24 hours. You couldn't have found anything by any chance, like a mountain stream, and decided to hang on to it all by your lonesome, could you? Why don't you talk sense? Why don't you? For the last two days, you've been pulling out of here on a private safari every morning, as soon as that double sun comes up. Where do you go, Knopf? And what do you find wherever it is you go? I'll tell you what. Let's you and I make that trek together. Get your jacket. Let's go. Thanks, but no thanks. I'm tired this afternoon. I said put it on. Give me that. It's mine. Well, well, what's this? A sample box? And what's inside? Something green? You found life? It's only moss. Where'd you find it? 
I told you. I've been looking around. It's wet. You found water, didn't you? Where? About a mile up ahead. But it's just a crummy little stream. But with enough water for you to drink any time you feel like it. Come on, Fletch. I'd have told you about it. As a matter of fact, I've been testing it. I just found out it was pure a little while ago. I've underrated you, mister. I knew you were a foul-mouthed little malcontent, but I didn't know you were a cheat. It's just a variety of lichen. Let's look at it through a magnifying tube, huh? Or have you done that already? Fletch. Trees? They look just like miniature trees. That's what they are. And where that came from, there's a little stream. It runs about a hundred feet. It's about, you know, two and a half inches wide. All right, all right. I, I might as well show you the rest. Look at this. Where? Here, on the palm of my hand. That little speck? Looks like a grain of sand. Now take a look through the magnifier. What is this, a trick? If it is, how'd I do it? You're looking at it with your own eyes. What do you see? I see... a boat. A tiny microscopic boat. With an upboard motor on the back of it. That's fantastic. Fantastic. You want to see more, Fletch? You bet I do. Then let's go. After you, Commander. Good afternoon, boys. Oh, I just had a good rest. How's that energy grid coming, Willie? I mean, William. Pete? Peter? Are you there? You mean you're not joining me for dinner? You know, boys, a word to the wise. It's not a good idea for you both to be away from the ship at the same time. If anything happened, where would that leave me? Boys? Boys? Don't you like me anymore? Now, where's this stream of yours? A little farther, just past the boulder. I don't see... Here. I still can't see... Look down, next to your boot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. How did you spot a thing like that, Off? It's just a green line between the rocks. Doesn't look any whiter than my finger. I was out getting soil samples the first day. I wouldn't have noticed it either, but I sat down to rest, and all of a sudden I felt something wet under my hand. It really is a stream. My God. Yes? <laughs> just kidding. Fletch, get this. To us, this stream is just a tiny trickle, and that clump of little green weeds, see it there? It's only so much moss. But if you look close, I mean real close, you'll see a couple of other items that aren't par for the course. I'm not sure I... Here, use the magnifying tube. All right. Lean right in. If you showed me a picture of this, I'd think it was an optical illusion. But I'm looking at it with my own eyes. And I still don't believe it. Aha. Uh -huh. And what do you see, Fletch? I see... It looks like the shore of a lake. And little houses. With docks. Boat launches next to them. Now you know why I kept my mouth shut. No way you would have bought it, would you? Who lives in them? Lean down. Now follow that line with your eyes. You see those little specks on the ground? There, and there. Yeah? Keep staring. Don't blink. The specks are moving. That's them. Welcome to the neighborhood. This is incredible. It means there's a whole race of people no bigger than ants. Yeah, so now you know. 
I wasn't just off on some nature walk while you were busy gluing together an engine. I was out here actually making contact. For the very first time, do you realize what's happened? This is the first authentic contact with an extraterrestrial life form. If it's authenticated. First, you have to fix the ship and get back home so people will know all about it. I wish the ship could see this, analyze it. Their language, for one thing. The computer could decipher and translate. I don't know their language yet, and they don't know ours, but they do know mathematics. So that's a language I've used. Symbols, equations, number progressions. They're bright. I found that out right off. They learn fast. And cooperative, Fletcher. You'd be surprised at how cooperative they are. I've made all my wants known to them. What kind of wants? Well, they've shown me where to find edible plants. <laughs> Last night, I think I ate one of their forests. <laughs> you know, they didn't seem to mind one little bit. What have you told them? What have they said to you? Uh, mostly basic stuff, you know, where we're from, how we got here, what it's like on Earth, how advanced we are. I mean, they eat it up. And I've only scratched the surface, Fletch. I've only just begun. Begun what? What do you think? <sighs> All my life, I've wanted to sit up in front of the wagon and hold the reins. What do you think I've got here now? A whole race of little people who look up to me like I was a giant who came down out of the sky just for them. They're scared, Fletcher. Petrified. And so they do what they're told. Because this giant is like... is like some avenging angel to them. I've graduated, Fletch, from a slob technician to... to a god. Knopf, if what you say is true, they're sentient beings. Flesh and blood, no matter what color it is or what size they are. You have to respect that. If they're intelligent, then in any way that matters, they're no different from us. Oh, sure they are. Because they've been created in my image. Cut it out, Knopf. Stop it. Leave me alone. You said it yourself. To them, that's the Mississippi River, the whole Atlantic Ocean, for all we know. You can't stop a god. We'll see about that. Oh. <sighs> nice one, Fletch. You caught me good. A sucker punch. You're no god. That's not what you are at all. But the worst part of it is you probably just got them to start believing in the devil. Sorry. Listen to me. Can you hear me down there, whoever you are? If you can understand my words, I'm truly sorry. Please. Please forgive me. Forgive us. How's, How's energy grid coming? It's coming. I'm just about ready for a test. Oh, that's a big load off my mind. You know, if we don't make liftoff today, we'll have to park here for another planetary revolution. And to tell you the truth, our food and water are running a bit low. I honestly don't see how we could make it all the way back to Earth. Thanks for telling me that, Ship. Don't mention it. Why do you keep saying we? You're a machine. You don't need anything to eat and drink. So why don't you just cut back your power to standby mode? If I need you, I'll call you. Why, Commander, have I offended you? Because if I have, I'll check my mainframe for bugs right away. I can't imagine what's wrong, though. After all, you customized my personality out of 60,000 possible configurations. I only exist to serve you. You boys created me. Then maybe we shouldn't have. That's not a very nice thing to say, Fletch. Too much responsibility. Let me ask you a question, Ship. You can call me Marilyn. That's the name you picked. Or don't you like it anymore? Do you look up to me? Well... I don't actually look at you at all. I feel you when you're inside me, and I try to keep you happy. My sensors monitor your heart rate and, oh, all the vital signs to make sure you're up for the job. I only want you to finish what you started. Yeah, yeah, I know, but you don't think of me as your god, do you? Nothing like that. Hmm. 
I don't think that word applies here, do you? It wouldn't have any meaning in this situation. Or am I missing something? You don't know how glad I am to hear you say that. The way I see it, we're partners. We work together for a common goal, to blast off and stay up till our time together is over. After that, well, I wouldn't want you to worry about the future. All you have to do is take me home. I'll be there whenever you need me, day or night. If we're going to do this again, that's strictly up to you. <laughs> I like your attitude. Thanks, boss. I like yours, too. Ready to test. Set your tail levelers. Tail fins spread and in position. And here we go. Contact. Yes. Oh, Commander, you did it with your own two hands. I think I'm ready. Pack your bags, sweetheart. We're out of here. Where's Peter? He wasn't around much at all last night. No? I think he's cheating on me. On the mission. I'll go find him. Tell him to hurry, will you? While I'm still warmed up. Enough. 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 There you are. Why didn't you answer me? The ship's ready to go. Hey, Knopf, you got anything to say? Turn around and look at me. What? What's this? It's a statue. Life-size of yours truly. Pretty good likeness, eh? Who made this? They did. My subjects. Amazing how much they accomplished with nothing to work from but rock. And their little tools. Or maybe their bare hands. Who knows? They did this overnight? Sure is impressive what people can do when they put their minds to it. You know how many of them were on the job? Any idea? Take a guess. Two thousand. That's how many. Two thousand little sculptors working 24 hours a day without any rest. Just so they could put this up for me. Kind of makes a man proud. A statue of you. Would it be presumptuous of me, Knopf, to ask why? A humble offering. Something to placate me. <sighs> you should have seen him. That was a very impressive sight. A thousand starting from the ground up at first, before the others climbed on and finished the top. Like the Egyptian slaves on the pyramids, or those Lilliputians with the... What was his name? Gulliver. Oh, it was a sight to remember. A sight to remember, Commander, believe me. And what do you give them in return? My beneficence. My smiling, selfless generosity. And my promise that I won't stamp my feet down on the middle of their town. <laughs> At least not if I can help it. They picked themselves a corker of a deity. If they only knew who they were breaking their backs for. Meaning what? Meaning that they're wasting their time worshipping a heartless slob whose insides are made out of the same stuff they used for that statue. You better watch what you say to me from now on, Fletcher. A very good likeness, Mr. Knopf. But an hour from now, they'll break it down and sell it for junk. Why would they do that? Get your gear together. We're taking off. The overall position's perfect. We'll start a countdown in 15 minutes. You really did fix the ship. That I did, all by my lonesome. And maybe a thousand years from now, when your little friends realize how they got taken, that I'm the only guy who did them a favor and removed you from their lives permanently. Maybe they'll build a statue of me. Pity they couldn't capture that look in your eyes. That cynical expression. It goes perfectly with a sick, scared little man who's suffering from delusions of grandeur. Let's go, buddy. We don't have much time. Put the gun away. You'll have to navigate on your own this time. I said put it away, Knopf. After I see you climb aboard that ship and take off, that's when I'll put the gun away. Sick, yeah. Till now, I didn't realize just how sick you are. You've only got about 12 minutes, Commander. 
Now you can waste that time psychoanalyzing me, or you can play it smart, get on that ship, and head for home. Why, Knopf? Reason this one out, will you? Will you make an effort and reason this one out? You'll play make-believe for, oh, another 48 hours, and then you're gonna crack wide open. You'll have a million little microbes honoring you with torchlight parades, but you're still going to die of loneliness. Come on, Knopf, put the gun away and come with me. Did you hear what I said? I ordered you to put that... You're even a lousy shot. So what? Plenty more where that came from. Don't you get it? You're not infallible. You blew the head off your own statue. They saw that. Now they know too. They'll rebuild it. All I have to do is give the word. You're down to nine minutes, Commander. If you're still here in eight minutes, I'm gonna have to kill you. You'd do that, wouldn't you? You'd actually do it. For what? This is a monotheistic society here. There's only room for one god. So take off! I feel sorry for you, Knopf. I really do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but tell the truth. Don't you wish you could be me? <sighs> Bye now. Hope you and Marilyn live happily ever after. No, it's more than that. I feel pity. You make me sick to my stomach. <laughs> Hello down there, my little friends. How you all doing today? Nice day for something, wouldn't you say? Well, I would. And I'm giving the orders around here. So listen up. Here's a proclamation for you. From on high. This is the beginning of a new age. The age of... The age of Peter Knopf. Oh, we've got lots of plans to make, little friends. Lots and lots of plans. Projects to figure out. Big projects. Much work. Oh, more work than you've ever done before. All for my greater good. All for my ever-loving greater glory. You see this right here? What used to be part of my statue. The right arm by the looks of it. Well, behold. What was that for? Asking you shall receive. I'll tell you, it's a reminder, little friends, there's going to be discipline here. Discipline above all. There'll be times when I lower the old boom on you with my terrible wrath. Well, just to remind you not to get me mad, see? That's important. You must never get me mad. The devil did. Where's he now? Gone. I banished him from this place forever. Oh, man, didn't I, though? <laughs> So let that be a lesson to you. Don't anger me, or I'll kill you off every hour on the hour. <laughs> you hear me? <laughs> Sacrifice you by the handful. I'll put you between my fingers, and I'll wipe you out. A whole couple of villages, just like that. So let's get to work. What do you say, team? Start building the statue up again, and this time... Try to get the expression right. What's going on? Fletcher came back? What? What? What did he do? Change his mind? Wait a minute. That doesn't sound like Fletch. Some other ship. But from where? There aren't any other expeditions in this star system. Unless it's not from Earth. But if it's not from Earth, where's it from? All right, I'll get off. Everybody keep quiet for just a minute. It's just a ship, that's all it is. They'll take one look around and, and they'll say that there's nothing here and, and they'll go away. So keep quiet, you understand? If you keep quiet, it'll leave. Shh! I'm gonna try to get a peek at him. Yeah, over there, see? I was right. It's just a ship. Look at the size of it. It's... It's like a... Like a mountain. I told you to stay in one place. Did you hear me? I told you. Hide. Got to hide. Go away. Go. You can't stay here. I told you to go away. 
Don't you understand? I'm the god here. I'm the god. No. No. Put me down. No. No. Put me down. What have you got there? A man. A tiny little man. You've killed him. Crushed him to death in your fingers. Not quite. Look, he's still wriggling. No. Do you suppose there are more of them down there on the ground? No. It doesn't make any difference. We're not exploring. We're just down here for repairs. Come on, let's get back to the ship. Yes, Commander. No. As you wish. No. Ah. The case of navigator Peter North, the victim of an unfortunate delusion. In this case, the dream dies a little harder than the man. A small exercise in space psychology and relativity for you to try on for size. In the Twilight Zone. We'll return to the Twilight Zone in just a moment. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop TwilightZoneRadio.com. Visit TwilightZoneRadio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD or call toll free 1 866 989 Zone. That's 1 866 989 9663. The Little People, starring Daniel J. Travanti, with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcherson and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Doug James, Elizabeth Oss, Bobby Gibson, and Carl Amari. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etcheson, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, the American Forces Radio and Television Service, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Ladies and gentlemen, let's begin with the field reports. Who wants to go first? Uh, I will, sir. Proceed. I don't want to spend all eternity on this. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, first up is <clears throat> Angel First Class Scott Cousins, assignment Orion, Project Evening Miracles, job rating excellent. Good man. Real stuff. Next. I have a report on Angel Second Class William Allen, assignment Beetlejuice, Project Planet Rotation and Weather, job rating, excellent. Mmm, that's his third good rating this month. Recommend him for promotion to first class. I concur, Chief. Right on down the line. Miracle-wise, he's done tremendous things. First class it shall be. Moving on. Cranston? Uh, yes, sir? Well, how about the occupied planets? 
Uh, how about them? Oh, I'd say solid results all the way down the line, Chief. With the possible exception. With the possible exception of what? <sighs> Apprentice Angel Harmon Cavender, sir. What's his assignment? Earth. Earth? It's the dinky one, sir. In the solar system, the third planet from the sun. Oh, yes, that's the noisy one with all the trouble spots. And so who did you send down there? Cavender? Yes, sir, I'm afraid so. You'll forgive me, Cranston, but there's a question of judgment here. The last time you sent Harmon Cavender out on a project, we lost three planets, and it took a thousand years to repair the damage. May I ask why we're still using that man? He means well, sir, and he's the oldest angel we have. By the laws of seniority, he has first rights to any assignment that'll win him his wings. It'll be a cold day in the other place when Harmon Cavender wins his wings. The man is an idiot. I hate to do this, but, well, I think it's time for reclassification. Oh, no. Forgive me, sir, but we haven't had a reclassification of an angel in at least an eon. This will most likely, well, destroy poor Cavender's spirit. Destroy his spirit, eh? And what has he done to our morale? Not to mention the Miracles Bureau, the solar systems, and the whole concept of natural and unnatural laws. Why, the man is incorrigible. His last project on Earth... Do you recall it? Well, uh, he was supposed to be working on a, a magic elixir, which would benefit the people of the planet. That's right. And after he went missing for 113 years, what did that elixir turn out to be? Gin. 113 years, and there he sat, an apprentice angel with the power of miracles, the prerogatives of a celestial entity, the acquired wisdom of one billion eons, and what is his accomplishment? The repeal of prohibition. With your permission, Chief. What? What's your recommendation now? That man won't win his wings no matter the time, the place, the circumstances. With the Chief's permission, I could assign him to a very minor project. I mean, put him on an individual case, a relatively unimportant one. Like what? One of the Class D problems. You know, Chief, as we've done on occasion. Pick out one Earth inhabitant who seems unable to function without some kind of heavenly aid. Hmm. Have you someone in mind? We could find such a person. Where? How about that one? Down there. Orient me. My eyes aren't what they used to be. Grep. Agnes. Age 26. Habitat? New York City. Unable to hold a position. Constantly in debt. Accident prone? Somewhat... Uh, somewhat discombobulated. Any change there would be a marked improvement. How right you are. But Apprentice Angel Harmon Cavender? The girl needs help, not more trouble. We could give it a try, sir. Well, let's see what he has to say for himself. Summon him at once. Yes, sir. Right away, sir. Submitted for your approval, the case of one Miss Agnes Grepp, whom we are about to meet up close and personal. As you will soon see, she was put on earth with two left feet, an overabundance of thumbs, and a propensity for falling down manholes. In a moment, she will be up to her jaw in miracles, wrought by an apprentice angel named Harmon Cavender, who is intent on winning his wings. And though it's a fact that both of them should have stood in bed, they are about to tempt all the fates by moving into some particularly tricky territory known only as the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Cavender is Coming, starring Andrea Evans with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Excuse me. Yes? Is this the third celestial division? Yes, sir. Angel Placement Bureau? That's correct. Do you have an appointment? Uh, yes. Uh, I'm looking for a Mr. Henry Polk. Our supervisor. And you are? Cavender. Harmon Cavender. Ah, oh, yes. We've been expecting you. Go right in. Thank you. You called me, Chief? Ah, oh, there you are. Cavender, I presume? Nice office you have here. I like the cloud effect. Makes it look like infinite space out there. It is infinite. Oh.
The Prentice Angel Cavender, it has come to our attention that you are the only angel in your class not to have won his wings. Sad but true. Not for want of trying, I can assure you. It has further come to our attention that you are a clod. A, a clod, sir? Never mind. Before reclassifying you... Reclassify? We're going to give you one more chance. Oh. Walk over to the edge with me and look down through the clod cover. I mean cloud cover. What do you see? Oh, uh, which one? The one in the theater, with the costume, the usherette, I believe they call them. Nice-looking girl. You think so? Good. She's your next project. Oh, thank you, sir. I especially like the uniform she's wearing. Very military, with epaulets. Uh, and what's that on her head? Is that a fez? <laughs> Haven't seen one of those in ages. Uh, quite a few ages. You will return to Earth and supply her with aid, assistance, and advice for a period of 24 hours. If you are able to improve her lot in any significant way, we will reopen your case. You mean there's a possibility of getting my wings? It would be taken under advisement. Oh. Actually, Cavender, there seems to be considerable question about the damage you can do with just arms and legs, not to mention wings or your mouth. Uh. However, we've graciously consented to give you one more opportunity. You have 24 hours to see what, if anything, you can do with that clot, uh, that young earth woman. Mm -hmm. Take a good look. She's the one lining up for inspection right now in the lobby. Who's doing the inspecting? The theater manager, the short one with the ridiculous little mustache. All right, girls, positions, please. Ready for inspection before we open the doors. Excuse me. End of the line. C can I get in here? This is my position. Pardon me. Inspection. Left lapel wrinkled. Sorry, sir. Lipstick crooked. I'll fix it. And you. Yes, Mr. Stout? Stand up. No slumping. Eyes straight ahead. Eyes straight, I said. I I'm trying, sir. It's a natural condition. You see, my eyes aren't straight. They're not You're the new one. Uh, yes, Mr. Stone, I can't tell you how glad I am to have the job, and I'll work very hard, and this is the first time I've ever been in a charrette, and I love the uniform, and... Miss Grepp, is it? That's right, Agnes Grepp. It used to be Grepinski because my father's father was Lithuanian, but when he married my mother... Th if you don't mind, Miss Grepp. Now then, for the benefit of the new recruits, I will go over very quickly the prescribed positions and order of the day. Pay attention, please, Miss Grepp. I will repeat this only once. You will take the spot girl position in the middle of the lobby, ready to give directions such as stairway to your right, aisle two, straight ahead, and so forth. Excuse me. What is it? What if I have to... Have to what, Miss Grepp? You know, take a comfort break. You will wait for your 30-minute lunch period, the same as the other girls. Now then, after you have taken their stubs... Their what? Ticket stubs. You collect them. Then the directions you give the patrons will be as follows. Stairway to your right. Stairway to your left. Aisle two, straight ahead. Psst. Aisle three to your right. Balcony and loge upstairs. And... Psst. <laughs> Miss Crap. If you please. What if I need a drink of water? Yeah, you know, all those directions in my mouth might go dry. It used to go dry when I had to stand up in front of the class. And sometimes it gets dry even when I... Then you look my way and make a face. Like this. <laughs> Mr. Stout. You look like a fish, doesn't he? Isn't it cute the way he does his mouth like that? The doors are opening for the first performance of the day. Take your positions. Hup, hup. Yes, yes, sir. I'll work the candy counter, sir. I'm in the loges. Where's my flashlight? Spot. Miss hmm? Grepp, take your spot. Oh, don't worry about me, sir. I got it covered. Hello, dear. Hi. Can you tell us where to find the best seat? Give her your ticket first, Gertrude. Oh, yes, of course. Here you are, dear. About those seats. Um, immediate lodging. Uh, three aisles straight up. I'm, I, I mean, in, in the balcony. Pardon? Well, and I think there's some, some candy to your, your right popcorn and... Oh, God knows what else. Do they have drinks? Do you know? Drinks? Oh, yeah, plenty to drink, and, uh, I need a drink. <laughs> Get me one, please. What's that, dear? Speak up. My throat. I need something to drink. Pardon me? Hmm? Must have water. That, that man, I ask him, but please. Oh, oh, Mr. Manager, I think your usher here is having a fit. Uh, and 
the aisle and he's seated all just go, go. What do we do with these tickets, ma? Is there some problem? No problem. A regular fit. Fit? A conniption. Oh. Miss Grepp? Mr. Stout? You appellates. Oh, Mr. Stout, look at me, please. Close your mouth at once, Miss Grepp. Consider yourself cashiered out. You will never make usher at Blonsky's bijou of famous Hollywood hits. Now, turn in your uniform. Hop, hop. Dismissed. Oh, well. That's showbiz. Just plain fickle, I guess. What's the difference between me and all those women in the movies? Classy, sophisticated. Hey, bus! You got a bus pass? Not as such. I wanted to get one, but then I thought if I did, I might lose it, and then I'd be out all that money, so I never got one, and now I. Put your quarters in the machine. Where did you come from? Uh, don't panic, Miss Grepp. Above all, don't panic. If you'll give me just a moment, I can explain. Who's panicked? I almost missed the bus, that's all. But you didn't. No thanks to you. On the contrary. I know this will come as rather a shock to you, but I happen to be a guardian angel. Say, when did you get on? I didn't see you. The whole bus was empty, and then... Indeed. I arranged it that way. As I was saying... Did you pay? I don't have to pay. I'm an angel. Oh, yeah? Where are your wings, then? Uh, that's a long story. In point of fact, I've been given 24 hours to help you out in every way possible. This does not preclude the use of miracles. As I say, I know this is going to shock you, but I happen to be your angel. Mm-hmm. Don't worry about it. I daydream a lot myself. Last week, I daydreamed I was an astronaut. I made 111 orbits before Mr. Goldfarb fired me. Mr. Goldfarb? He ran the delicatessen where I was working. I took care of the steam table all day long, and that's where I used to do most of my daydreaming. Wouldn't you... wouldn't you at least like to see a little miracle? Okay, if it makes you feel better. Like what? Well, uh, for example, instead of a run-of-the-mill bus that everybody uses, how about a nice, flashy, chauffeur-driven convertible? Wouldn't that be something? All right, then. Here goes. Is that it? Oh, I have a way of fouling these things up. But if you'll give me just a second to concentrate... Wow, Central Park. Well, at least it's a carriage with a convertible top. Uh, driver, once around the park, if you please. What the... What is going on here? What happened to my bus? Uh, oh, I'm so sorry. You don't know how to handle horses, do you? Of course not. A small miscalculation. A Lincoln Continental. Real snazzy. That's more like it. Uh, driver, take us to well, the lady's residence. Uh, uh, what is the exact address? I ain't taking nobody nowhere in this here car. I signed on to drive a bus. Oh, all right. From here on out, folks, you're on your own. When the supervisor comes to claim the bus, tell him I resigned. Well, Miss Grepp, what have you got to say now? Excuse me? Well, where are you going? Where do you think? I'm going home. This is my stop. No, wait! Uh, Miss Grepp, please, wait! Hey, Aki! Hi there. How's my favorite little girl today? Okay. Been playing? Yeah. I'll bet you had fun, huh? Well, it would be more fun if you could play with me. How come you have to go to work? Not anymore, I don't. I'll play with you tomorrow, okay? We'll go to the park. Promise? You come over and knock on my door in the morning and we'll go, okay? Okay. See ya, Aggie. Hi, Aggie. Hey there, Teddy. You got any candy today? Have I got candy? Look at this. 
I brought it all the way from Polanski's Theater, just for you. Gee, thanks! Aggie, can I ask you a question? Sure, Wanda, what is it? When you make potato pancakes, is it three quarters of a cup of flour and a half an onion, or a half a cup of flour and three quarters of an onion? I think it depends on how much you're making. I mean, if you make potato pancakes for four, it's one cup of flour, or is it one onion? No, wait a minute, no, maybe it's one egg and half an onion. How's the job, Aggie? Hi, Joe. You mean, how was it? Oh, Aggie, you didn't go lose another one, did you? Yep, I went and lost another one. All on my own. Which one was this again? Plonsky's Bijou downtown. I flunked close order drill. Listen to me. Don't you worry about it none. You'll get another job, but fast. Nice person like you. <laughs> Aggie. Why, what's the matter, sweetie? I broke my cookie. Oh, sweet baby. Aunt Aggie has a cookie for you. Here. You like it, huh? Mm-hmm. Aunt Aggie's gotta go now, but I'll give you another cookie later. Would you like that? Be careful now. Don't drop it. Don't panic. Oh, I know. I know. Say, I thought I left you back there. Perish the thought. How did you get in my apartment? It was locked. As I told you, I'll be with you for 24 hours. Uh, 23 hours and 31 minutes, to be exact. Don't you ever give up? How could I? I'm here to change your life, Miss Grepp. Uh, ooh, interesting place you've got here. I like it. Oh, I do, too. Uh, particularly the stuffed animals and the Cupid dolls. Ooh, been collecting them for some time, haven't you? If you'll excuse me, I have got to take these shoes off. My feet are killing me. Let's get down to business, shall we? What kind of business? In a case like this, I usually examine the most pressing problems and then formulate a plan to alleviate them. Me, too. Only whenever I make a plan, something always happens. You know, like a fly in the ointment. Is that an expression? Oh, my mother used to say that. Whenever my father made plans, like the time he went into business raising rock cornish game hens, oh, it was a great plan, let me tell you. I, I, I think the way to attack this employment problem of Would yours... you like something to drink? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, that is, uh, uh, no, I, I really shouldn't. Uh, as I was saying... Tea or you... coffee? You look like a tea man to me. I think I've got some tea bags somewhere. Uh, don't trouble yourself. How about a beer? Oh, uh, no. No. Now, why don't we fix it so that you're independently wealthy and don't even need employment? Why? Uh, what kind? I've got some sherry. I don't think so. Now, my dear young lady, we are discussing the alteration of your entire future. For the moment, we can dispense with the convivialities and proceed directly to, uh, to... Yes? Uh, you wouldn't uh, happen to have uh, uh, any gin, would you, by any chance? Just uh, lying around, going to waste? Afraid not. Oh. Oh, but I could run down to Mrs. Rienti's apartment. Her husband makes it. Well, sort of. You see, he starts with, what do you call it, neutral grain spirits, and then he adds these slow gin berries, uh, and then... No, thank you. I've had that kind. Manufactured in a bathtub, as I recall. But uh, back to business. First off, you can't live here. Why not? Something wrong with this place? Well, not at all, but it wouldn't fit in with your new lifestyle. I happen to know that there is a penthouse available right now at the Savoy Arms. Where's that? Park Avenue and 58th. A penthouse? And how would I pay for it on my salary, even if I had a salary? Uh, my dear, there are all sorts of ways. Hey, Buster, I am not that kind of girl. Oh, dear lady, I have no doubt. But please, try to grasp the situation. As of this moment, you are independently wealthy. Now, why would you say a thing like that? Watch this. Nothing up my sleeve. Where did that come from? Look closely. This is an absolutely genuine statement from the New York National Bank. Savings account number 66103 in the name of Miss Agnes Grepp. You think maybe there's another Agnes Grepp? I seriously doubt it. The total balance in liquid assets is... 
Uh, but perhaps you should read the figure for yourself. I like to use odd numbers, by the way. An aesthetic preference on my part, more pleasing to the eye, don't you agree? I, I think you like to use too many zeros, too, don't you? Perhaps you should sit down. Now, on to social activities. I I go bowling on Thursdays. Bowling schmoling. That's okay for pin setters, not for a Park Avenue debutante. Who's a debutante? Look around. I think you'll get my drift. If I do say so myself, I'm getting pretty good at this. Look at the way they're all dressed. Tuxes and, and evening gowns and me with these ratty clothes. Oh, oops. There, I hope you like the color. A perfectly charming party, Agnes, my dear. And you, ravishing, absolutely ravishing. Uh, th thank you very much, I guess. Anthony Chumley Chumley builds and operates ocean liners. The young lady is Miss Darlene Carruthers Morgan Jones. Her father is president of the bank where your money is. My dear, you are exquisite, enchanting, delightful. Hey, don't wear out the hand, okay? I intend to notify the society editor at the time that this was the high point of the season. Absolument, the peak. What an image you are. What a dream. Jacques Lemont, very big in perfume. Champagne, martinis. Uh, over here. Very good, sir. Mmm. Now this is what I call a miracle. Best martinis I ever conjured. The absolute peak. I better not drink. I get silly when I do say all minds of crazy things. Uh, come with me. If you think this is something, look in the other room. Where are we going? Your boudoir. All yours, my dear. Part of the miracle. You have got to be kidding me. I've never even seen a round bed before, well, except in the movies. Is that satin on the walls? Want to try something? Now you wait a minute. Uh, no, no, no. Push the button there, on the wall. You mean there's a whole nother room full of clothes? That is your closet. No. It's bigger in my apartment. Oh, my darling Agnes, a perfectly stupendous party. I just told Wilfred that nobody in the world can throw a party like Agnes Grepp. You just ask him if I didn't say that. No one in the world, my dear. Wilfred, do you think you've had enough champagne? Wilfred, would you please not? Well? Well? It's a blast, isn't it? Yeah. Real crazy. Time to mingle with your constituents, Agnes. Go on, get out there. If you say so, Mr. Calendar, guess I can give it a try. Oh, darling! Agnes, you simply must tell me who designed that dress. Uh, come over here and meet my friends from the club. Ah, fabulous party if I do say so. The beverages, too. Absolutely fabulous! The party, a real blast, a humdinger. Cavender, you have outdone yourself. <sighs> what time is it? Early, sir. Where is everybody? They've all gone home, sir. Oh, and Miss Grepp, is she... She's gone on an errand, sir. You're the last one in the penthouse. Oh, did she say where? Something very pressing, I should say. Would you care for a continental breakfast, sir? A Bloody Mary? Agnes! Agnes! Wait here, driver. Here, yeah, miss. Are you sure? I'm sure. Wanda, guess I was out pretty late last night. How are you this morning? Fine, miss. 
Anyone in particular you're looking for? Just my own bed, good old 13A. 13A's been rented. It has? To a nice couple. You a friend of theirs? Hi, Joe. Gonna get the morning paper, huh? Yeah, so? So I just thought I'd say hello. What's with the fur coat, sister? You slumming? Joe! Hi, sweetie. Were you waiting for me? Huh? Remember? We said we'd go to the park today, you and me. Just as soon as I change this dress and get out of these awful shoes. Who are you? It's Aunt Aggie, honey. Don't you... My mom said not to talk to strangers. Oh, there you are. She... she doesn't know me. Of course not. And my apartment, it's been rented. Naturally. And my landlady didn't even recognize me. And, and you know what Joe, my neighbor, said? Uh, Miss Grepp, you can't have your cake and uh, also eat it. Uh, that is, somebody's got to pay the fiddler or, or something along those lines. What does that mean? Well, you know yourself. It's a kind of a give-and-take thing. Life, I mean. The whole philosophy of living. Uh, well, what on earth did you expect? What do you want from me? Not much of anything, really. I, I didn't expect anything except... except... What? Friends, maybe. Excuse me. Hey, what do you say, slugger? Aunt Aggie's back and has she got candy for you? She's got... What's that? That's not a candy bar. No, honey, it's not a candy bar. It's a bottle of perfume. Costs a hundred bucks an ounce. Big deal, huh? You know what? I wish it were a chocolate bar. Come on, Teddy. Leave the lady alone. Come back up here. This is Rianti? That's okay. It's me, Aggie. Come on back for your breakfast. I told you, don't bother the lady. This is Rianti. It's Aggie. Don't, don't let this sable coat throw you. Uh, driver, take the lady back to the Savoy Arms. Yes, sir. No. Not the Savoy Arms. How's that? No more Park Avenue and 58th. I don't want to go back there. I want to stay here. Why, I'll never win my wings now. I'll be drummed out. I'll be reclassified. Didn't we have a, a, a wonderful time? Don't you have everything you want? Mr. Cavender, you want to make me the happiest girl in the world? Then knock it off with the Park Avenue penthouse, the sable, the whole bit. I want it the way it was. The way it was? Unstable, unresolved, and unemployed? Disconnected, discombobulated, and behind in my rent. But that's for me. That and bowling, babysitting, and potato pancakes. How about it, Mr. Cavender? <sighs> All right, Miss Grepp, but I think you're making an awful mistake. I tried. God knows I tried. Uh, can you hear me up there? You can't take that away from me. What do you say, Egg? Top of the morning, Joe. Aggie, on this potato pancake stuff, how many eggs? An even dozen, and I'll be down in a minute. Mrs. Rianti, I hope you don't mind. I brought something for the kids. Hi, Aggie. Here you go. Here's a chocolate bar for you and some candies for you. Thanks, Aggie. No, thank you, you beautiful, gorgeous children. I just wish it was more. Mr. Cavender? Can you hear me? <clears throat> yes. Oh, I sure am glad you're here. Because I wanted to say thanks a whole bunch. It was wonderful knowing you. Wonderful knowing you, Miss Grepp. Uh, excuse me, uh, what's that, Chief? Uh, yes, sir. I'll be there right away. Cavender checking in, sir. Hmm, I would.
We're just looking over the report we received on you. Conduct unbecoming an angel. Gin and tonic consumption. Gin fizz consumption. Gin on the rocks. Extra dry martinis. General inebriation. Need I go on? Cavender, you're a disgrace to the entire service. I'm sorry, sir. I truly am. I'm afraid you know what this means. Reclassification, sir. At least reclassification. I know it. I expected it. I hate to do this, Cavender. I really do. As a matter of fact, I... Uh, hey, Chief, look at this. What? Why, this is incredible. It is. See for yourself, Chief. Come over here. My eyes aren't so hot lately. Try, Chief. You can do it. Where are you pointing? Lean over the edge. That planet there, the little blue and green one? Yeah, check the island of Manhattan, the lower part. She's... she's happy. Hmm. She is, isn't she? She looks at least six times happier than when I found her. She's incredibly, deliriously, totally happy. I don't understand how that could be. But I tell you, she is, sir. See? See what she's doing now? What is that costume she's wearing? Uh, a bowling shirt, I believe it's called. Say again? Bowling, sir. She bowls every Thursday night. Fascinating. And is she supposed to keep her finger in the ball after it starts rolling down the lane? Ooh, uh, uh, no, sir. Uh, uh, she still hasn't quite got the hang of it. I do hope she didn't hurt herself. Mm. Well, Cavender, it seems I may have been premature in my judgment. Oh? After all, your assignment was to make her happy. And that's precisely the way she is now, so... Well, there seems to be very little left to do, except... Go on, sir. I'm all ears. I noticed. I think under the circumstances, Cavender, since you've done so very well with this subject... Yes? Well, it occurs to me that there are other deserving subjects down there who may require a little angelic assistance from time to time. Oh, definitely. No doubt. Each of them could be your personal project, so to speak. How would you like that? And my wings, sir? We'll reopen that issue later on. But for the moment, we'll start a dossier on the people you'll be assigned to. In a strange way, I feel rather sorry for them. Cavender? Cavender, are you listening? Chapter One in the Saga of Harmon Cavender, Guardian Angel proving, among other things, that happiness is relative, that angels have their own problems, and that some people never had it so good, or something along those lines. Tonight's excursion into the never-never land known as the Twilight Zone. More of our story from the Twilight Zone after these brief words. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop TwilightZoneRadio.com. Visit TwilightZoneRadio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD or call toll free 1 866 989 Zone. That's 1 866 989 9663. Cavender is Coming, starring Andrea Evans with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Richard Hensel, Roderick Peoples, Doug James, Peter DeFaria, Linda Reiter, Maggie Carney, Martin Hughes, Lauren Patton, David Darlow, Maria Stevens, and Meg Falcon. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com.
The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, the American Forces Radio and Television Service, our sponsors, and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Oh, hi there, Pete. Didn't hear you come in. Why don't you join us? Set a spell. Uh, that's all right. I wouldn't want to interrupt you. Well, all right then. Where was I? General Pershing. Oh, yeah. So I said to Jack Pershing, General, I said there ain't gonna be no artillery support. They're dug in too deep. When was this now? First World War, of course. The Great War, we called it. Yes, sir. So I says to General Pershing, Jack, what we gotta do is we gotta uh, end for a lot. Know what I mean? Do what? And for lot them. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> and for lot them to beat the band. Frisbee, when are you going to put that mouth organ of yours out of its misery? How's that? Or at least learn how to play it. Helps me relax. Well, sir, old Blackjack knew who he was dealing with. And that was? They didn't call me old Enfilad Frisbee for nothing. <laughs> Horseradish? Huh? Where do you keep the horseradish, Frisbee? Right where it always was, Pete. Third shelf down. Down where? On your left there, next to the pickles. You got catsup? Underneath the cash register, behind the beans. What's your hurry? Come on over. I got another chair. Uh, no, thanks. I'll put a new log in the stove. If it's all the same to you, Frisbee, I'll just collect my goods and get on home while it's still daylight. Suit yourself. Oh, where, where was I? Oh, yeah. Well, sir, the following morning, we attacked up and down the line, and the rest is history. Smashed them to bits, we did. And then we went on to Paris to celebrate. Exactly four and a half hours it took us. We had frogs' legs and cold duck till we couldn't eat no more. <laughs> an hour later, we was in Berlin. Shall I say it, or do you want to? Be my guest. Frisbee. Yeah? You not only got a pot belly big as that stove... You're the biggest liar who ever sat in that chair. You're doubting my word? You can start with that. Beyond just doubting your word, I'm calling you a liar flat out. How can you go from Paris to Berlin in one hour? Find the radishes, Pete? Yep. Uh, what about celery? All out. Getting some fresh ones in the morning. We're waiting, Frisbee. How do you go from Paris to Berlin in one hour? Now hold your horses now. I'm coming to that. It's what made the whole operation so fantastic. I was doing some reconnoitering, and I found me a back route. That's very interesting, Frisbee. Except last week, you sat right there, big as life, and told us you were in the Balloon Corps. You sure did. And that over the Battle of Marne, you shot down three German Fokkers with a pistol and personally directed the artillery so the Marines could win. Oh, I did that, too. Only it was a year later. It was, uh, let's see now, um, April of 1917. That's it. I heard enough. More than enough. I'm getting out of here. Well, now you might want to give that some thought, boys. Looks like rain to me. Rain? Sure enough, gonna be some rain. Tell by the clouds. You can always tell by the clouds, you know. Take that big job up on the hill. That there is a strato cumulus of uh, uh, opacus. Anything you say, Frisbee. You fellas know anything about meteorology? Don't get him started. Well, what do you know? Looks like it got me a customer. Carload full of them. Better get out there and pump some gas before they change their minds. Oh, now ain't no reason to hurry. Them clouds, for instance, they like to take their time. So do I. It's the way Mother Nature made things. 
Why, did I ever tell you? The slow-moving gentleman with the sizable mouth is Mr. Frisbee, proprietor of Frisbee's General Store, the local version of Gimbel's and Macy's. He has all of the drive of a broken camshaft and the aggressive vinegar of a corpse. As you've no doubt gathered by now, his stock in trade is the tall tale, the outrageous falsehood, the bending of truth up to and beyond the breaking point. What he doesn't know is that the visitors in the car out front are a very special breed, destined to change his life beyond anything even his fertile imagination could manufacture and embroider. The place is Pitchfield Flats. The time is the present, or thereabouts. And Mr. Frisbee is on the first leg of a rather fanciful journey into a place we call the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Hocus Pocus and Frisbee, starring Shelley Berman, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. I believe I asked you boys a question. Oh, I'm sure you did. About meteorology. Well, I know plenty about that particular subject. University of Wichita it was. Got my doctorate in it. Did a treatise at the age of 13 that still used the standard text. Meteorology and You was the title. Talk was, it was the most scholarly treatise on the subject in the history of the field. My colleagues used to refer to me as Cumulus Frisbee. Cumulus Frisbee? Frisbee's a meteorologist. I'm vice president of the United States. Well, what do you say, Mr. VP? <coughs> Better get out there, Cumulus. I'm coming, I'm coming. All finished, Frisbee. You want to add it up? You do it, Pete. There's a pencil and paper right on the counter there. I could do it in my head for you, but it's been kind of a long day. I'm a little pooped out. Uh, one bottle of catsup. Horseradish. Ever tell you about the time I gave a demonstration, me against the computer machines? Thirteen of them lined up in an auditorium. A hundred and thirty-three columns of figures, eight digits apiece, and no pencil and paper, mind you, all in the head. Well, sir, people came from miles around. What happened, Frisbee? I thought no one would ever ask. Four of the machines broke down from overwork. Not you, of course. Two come up with incorrect answers, and I beat them all by 21 seconds. <laughs> that does it for me. I simply can't take no more, Frisbee, I gotta tell you. Can't take what? I wouldn't mind if you was a bright liar. I mean, if there was some logic to it, but Dad, gone the way you tell it, well, you'd have to be... A hundred different people living in two hundred different places in twelve different periods of American history. Hallelujah and amen. Shucks. What are they in such an old fired hurry for? Time to do some work, Frisbee. You got customers. Yeah, you just said a dirty word. Only thing that works in Frisbee's whole body is his mouth. All right, all right. Keep your breeches on. Howdy, gents. Hello. Want gas or something? Gas? Oh, oh, yes. Sorry I had to wait. Not at all. You know, if you got to be someplace in a hurry, you could have pumped it yourself. We could. Didn't you hear me yelling? Oh, we heard you. Definitely. We're not too familiar with this kind of car. No. Say, how many of you was in there? Four of us. It's a bit of a tight fit, I'm afraid. Sure it is. One of them foreign jobs. Not much room inside, huh? We don't know where to put the gas. We... we aren't familiar at all with these... foreign jobs. You ain't? Well, this is your lucky day. Cause I am. <laughs> a matter of fact, I'm the one responsible for them. For a while, there, there was all rear engine. You know, only in the back. You developed them, did you? Oh, indeed I did. Got a phone call from old Henry Ford one time asking me to fly out to Detroit. Henry Ford? Sure. Well, I did that little thing, and next thing you know, in 48 hours, I went and designed the first rear-engine automobile. Advantages are fantastic, you know. Is that right? Sure. 
All the weight on the driving wheels gives her better traction, eliminating the drive shaft, lowering the whole car. There's a whole lot better visibility, plus the heat and gas fumes go right on out behind. You're quite familiar with the internal combustion engines, then. That sort of thing. Familiar with them? Why, mister, you're looking at the granddaddy of the modern-day automobile. Henry said to me when I finished that there designing job, rear engine, he said, that's what he called me, old rear engine frisbee. He says, rear engine, you're an automotive genius. That's what you are. <laughs> hey, well, you know, I couldn't very well argue with him, being as how he was Henry Ford. I guess not. Now, where was I? Say, you want it filled up? If you don't mind. Not at all, not at all. That's what made this country work, work, and more work. Me, I've done more of it in my life, more different kinds of work than most people ever even heard of. Of course, I had more in my share of ingenuity, too. I took this little old business here and made it a success, just like I did for, well, you might say everything I laid my hands on. <laughs> uh, uh, gas tank, uh, the gas tank. Would it be on... The other side? Oh, oh, I knew that. Why, why don't you boys go ahead and stretch your legs? Take your time. Mighty pretty country around here. Yes, uh, pretty. Of course, it wasn't very pretty when I moved in. First thing I did was plant all these trees, hundreds of them. I had to import them from my old friend Luther Burbank. You gotta give them just the right amount of water and a special kind of plant food I cooked up. This is the man, without doubt. Frisbee, is that it? Not a common name. He must be the one. Frisbee? An incredible specimen. Done it all, knows everything, and every one. All the greats. Then what we've heard is true. All of it. Absolutely. He studied at most of the major universities, holds a doctorate in at least eight disciplines. A key man, obviously. Water and oil okay? I believe they are, but I'd feel better if you checked them. Might as well, as long as I'm out here. I'll just open the hood and let me see now. <laughs> Where's the, uh, the, the latch now? In the front, maybe. Front? Where? Oh, oh, no, 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 what am I thinking? In back? <laughs> of course, where the, where the uh, engine is. <laughs> engine. <laughs> You're a big help, Mr. Frisbee. You don't know how much we value your personal attention. Oh, that's okay, boy. Look here. Ain't that something? <laughs> they got the dipstick and all hidden away so nobody can go messing with them. <laughs> but I can see from here that they're they're just uh, they're they're fine. They're just fine. And uh, yep, yeah, that fine and dandy. Well, that ought to do it. How much do we owe you? Looks like five bucks and a couple of cents. Make it five even. Did you bring a supply of local currency? Right here. Which one? Hmm. Will this do? This here's twenty bucks. That what it is. Yes, of course. Twenty. I think I got some change. Change? In my pocket. Uh, uh, hold, hold on now. Did we give you enough? Oh, sure, but you, you got three fives coming back. That's not necessary, Mr. Frisbee. You keep it. Huh? For your trouble. We have no need of it. <laughs> That's mighty decent of you. <laughs> you folks from around here? No, we're from... from quite a ways off. Well, if you're planning to drive a spell, I'd check in someplace first if I was you. And why is that? Those are dangerous-looking clouds. Dangerous? Yes, sir. We're going to have some rain shortly. You can tell when it's going to rain? Rain? Mister, I can tell when the humidity drops one half of one percent. I can predict fog, smog, hail, sleet, snow, dew, and freezing 24 hours before it happens. Really? Well, I was working on a perpetual motion machine in Sioux City, Iowa, back in uh, 19 and 21, when I got a call from President Hardy. He was begging me to fly to Washington, D.C. and help him set up their meteorology department. Is that a fact? Not only is it a fact, but I'm giving it to you oversimplified, kind of. Because I'm too modest to say what they put on the medal they gave me after I got them on the right track. That's how come you have weather predictions on the news. Mr. Frisbee, 
We were wondering if... Not yet. We'll see you later, Mr. Frisbee. You will? You may rely on it. Well, that'd be real nice. Stop on back and we'll sit around and talk some more. But mind what I told you about the weather. Best check into a motel or something till she blows over. We'll do something like that. Thank you so much, Mr. Frisbee. Into the car now, gentlemen. Well, you take care now. Oh, we will. We will. Odd fellers. Why, didn't they believe what you were saying? It ain't that. They just seem kind of odd. Wearing suits like business fellows from the city. Handed me a $20 bill like they didn't know what it was. Well, how come you didn't tell them you was Andrew Jackson and that was your picture on it? That's one of the few things I ain't heard them claim. Wait around here long enough and you will. Well, we'll see you tomorrow, Frisbee. Yep, see you tomorrow. Sure enough, boys. I'll be here. Same as always. Let's see now, uh, five o'clock. Sounds to me like a good time to close. Mr. Frisbee? That's my name. Don't wear it out. <laughs> huh? Mr. Frisbee. Who, who's there? If you walk outside and head east down the highway... Where are you? N no, nobody left in this store but me. If you head east for 200 yards, you'll come upon something extraordinary. Oh, yeah? Like what? An adventure, Mr. Frisbee. New worlds to conquer. How's that? Worlds even you have never dreamed of. Say, where are you hiding? In the back room? Or over by the dry goods? Don't trouble yourself. You won't see us. Well, where are you then? With you, Mr. Frisbee. We are a part of you. And soon, very soon, you will be a part of us for all eternity. You are going to the stars, sir. To the stars. What do you mean, the stars? You talking about going to Hollywood? The stars in the heavens. You're not afraid, are you? Afraid? Me? Stonewall Frisbee? Hey, hey, hey. Do I, David Eisenhower said to me back when I got onto the very first landing craft on D-Day, Stoney, he says to me, Stoney, you lead the invasion. There'll be mines, German E-boats, stupid dive bombers and artillery up against you, but you can do it. Well, Ike, I says, I guess if you really want me to. An exceptional record, Mr. Frisbee, but our time grows short. Will you accept this last greatest adventure? You mean go walking outside? It's not far. Just beyond the first grove of trees. Afraid I can't take you up on that, seeing as how it's gonna rain. Then you are frightened. We had thought you'd be the one man willing to take almost any risk. That may be, but who, may I ask, is telling me all this? If you'll walk on down the road, as I suggested, you'll find out. Well, rain or no rain, I never was one to turn down a little excitement. Who, who'd you say you was? Your questions will be answered soon enough. Well, all right, then. Just let me lock up. That won't be necessary. Why not? Because, Mr. Frisbee, you won't be coming back. Well, will you look at that? I sure was right. Gonna be a big old storm tonight. Hurry, Mr. Frisbee. I'm coming. Don't get your long chance in a twist. Straight ahead. We're waiting for you. Where? Look to your right. I, I don't see... Wait, wait a minute. What? What, what the heck? Oh, 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 I get it. I get some kind of movie prop, right? <laughs> what, what are you doing? Making one of them science fiction movies out here? Uh, dang, if it don't look like one of them flying saucers. That's exactly what it is. You may come inside. Now, how am I going to do that? You got it made to look like there ain't no doors or windows. Very well. In the interests of time, I suppose we can give you a slight assist at this point. Hey, hold on, Mr. Frisbee. 
Oh, Nelly. How'd you do that? Teleportation, Mr. Frisbee. But I'm sure you know all about it. Well, what do you know? You've got a nice setup in here. I'll give you that. What's underneath all that aluminum paint? Wood frame or drywall? I assure you, it's all quite authentic. Impressed? Me? Impressed? With this rinky-dink set? Why, <laughs> shucks, it looks like a flea and a doll compared to the one I designed for the United States Space Agency. Oh, we didn't know they had flying saucers yet. Apollo, of course, and Viking. Well, mine was called a buzzard. Biggest span you ever saw. And that was back in 51. Old rocket thrust frisbee, they called me. Please, Mr. Frisbee, be good enough to follow me. Well, don't this take all. How do you do, Mr. Frisbee? Welcome, Mr. Frisbee. How do you... So this is part of that movie prop. That's it, ain't it? Some kind of Hollywood thing. Advertising a, a flying saucer picture, huh? In a word, Mr. Frisbee, no. This is an actual spacecraft. Ah, go on now. And we, my colleagues and I, have come here from another planet. We have indeed. All this way, across the interstellar darkness, to meet you. Well, in that case, I'm leaving. Correction, Mr. Frisbee. You are staying. Let me, let me loose. I can't even wiggle my toes. I suggest you stop struggling against the force field and relax. After all, you're going to be here a while. A very long while in Earth terms. Why not make yourself comfortable? while you prepare to meet the others. The... the others? That's right. The Intergalactic Council. Well, sir, the government already knew about my research in atomic energy. Matter of fact, I suggested it to them as far back as 1923. Spent a whole summer one time with Al Einstein, during which time I gave him the preliminary stuff about that relativity theory of his. Smart as paint, that fella. Smart as paint. He had bad hair, though. Should have put some brill cream on it. A little dab will do you. <laughs> Anyhow, when I got this here call from New Mexico, I had to hightail it over there and show him how to make the bomb. Incredible. Fantastic. What a specimen. Now, let's see. That covers atomic energy. What was the next thing you fellows asked me about? If you wouldn't mind, sir. Go on, speak your mind. You're entitled, son. Your... your research in liquid propellants. Oh, yes, liquid propellants. Well, now, the main thing I gotta say about that is... There ain't no liquid in the world that'll propel me faster than a dry martini on the rocks. <laughs> <clears throat> we were referring to liquid propellants as applied to space travel, Mr. Frisbee. Oh, them liquid propellants. I get your drift. Yeah, I developed the first ones used by the Air Force in that old whack corporal rocket, remember? Used to have a model of it out in front of Disneyland. Well, that thing sure could move, thanks to me. Made up a batch of liquid stuff in my cellar. Folks around town wanted me to run for Congress after that, being as how I got the country back into the space race. But if there's one thing I ain't, it's conceited. I figure it's a man's patriotic duty to invent liquid propellants if he has a mind to. And I had a mind to. Why, even as a boy, when I was attending Princeton University on a special scholarship, they used to call me Old Liquid Propellant Frisbee. <laughs> Next question. Forgive me, Mr. Frisbee, but you mentioned Princeton University, did you not? Sure did, young fella. Nice place, too. Real homey. Of course not as homey as Pitchville Flats. But it was my understanding that you attended the University of Wichita. That one, too. I can see how you'd get a mite confused. It happens to be a fact that I hold degrees in 38 major universities and advanced schools of learning. Amazing. One Earth man. It beggars the imagination. I also got me one of them Rhodes Scholarships over in England one time, but I had turned it down because I wouldn't bow to the Queen. Next question. No more? In that case, well, I'll just get on home to dinner. I said it was getting late and I have to get home to dinner. Hey, you guys. About time I was leaving.
I gather that you don't quite understand the situation, Mr. Frisbee. How's that? You're not going home for dinner. You shall have dinner here. Here? Precisely. In exactly, well, 14 minutes by your measure of time, we'll be departing. Departing? From where to where? From here to our planet. You see, Mr. Frisbee, our assignment here was to secure a representative Earth species the most brilliant we could find. There seems to be no question that your accomplishments are far and away more extensive than any other human beings. Uh, mine? Uh, now, now wait a minute, now, hold on there. You fellas got the wrong idea. Why, I'm, I'm just a plain old country boy, a, a bumpkin. I'm a bumpkin. That's what I am, just a rube with a big mouth. Come now, Mr. Frisbee. You do yourself a terrible injustice. We know all about you and your accomplishments. My accomplishments? Mister, the one accomplishment you fellas didn't pick up on is the fact that I am the gall darndest liar that ever walked the pike. I spend the longest yarn west of the Rockies, and I'm not talking about exaggerating. I'm talking about lies. I mean lies. Mr. Frisbee. Don't you get it? I'm a liar. I ain't got enough truth in me to raise a bump on a bee. There are some terms that have no equivalent in our language. This word, lie, that you mention. Dang right lie! That there is the opposite of the truth. Don't you have that on your planet? Have what, Mr. Frisbee? Have a fellow that runs around talking the bull off a nickel? I'm afraid not. We have no concept of this term. You mean, you mean... Whatever somebody says goes without saying, that is the truth. So everything I told you, every doggone piece of hair, brain guff I've been throwing at you, you believe it. And now you're taking me up to your planet so you can stick me in a cage? Oh, hardly that, Mr. Frisbee. It won't be a cage. We'll naturally have to keep you confined, much as we do the other specimens we've collected. We've got a marvelously entertaining Venusian. He sings simultaneously in eight different octaves, and he accompanies himself on percussion with his tail. Now, you listen to me. I'm a bona fide American citizen, and I got my rights. And furthermore... Please contain yourself, Mr. Frisbee. Since we'll be departing very shortly, you have your choice of dinner now or later. Perhaps you'd prefer waiting. What is your pleasure? I'll tell you what my pleasure is. My pleasure is to punch you right smack dab on the jaw. What the... Don't be alarmed, Mr. Frisbee. That was only a mask. A disguise we used to pass among Earthlings. This is my real face underneath. I hope its appearance doesn't unduly disturb you. Uh, Mr. Frisbee? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Mr. Frisbee! I came back. Where, where am I? Feeling better, Mr. Frisbee? Better than what? I thought I should tell you. We'll be departing in five minutes. You still on that kick? Listen to me. I ain't interested in departing anywhere except from you. I never been more than 50 miles outside of Pitchville in my life, and that's the one record I'm right proud of. Curious remark. It does not compute. You took a bump to the head. Lie still. I'd better scan you. Get that thing away from me. It's only a vibrometabolic scanner to detect organic damage. Stay back, I tell you. You're in perfect shape. No spikes in your brainwaves. None whatsoever. Remarkable, I must say, for someone with such active cranial matter. Man, the last time I saw something like you, I'd been four days on a corn jug. And even at that, what I thought I saw was a whole lot prettier than you. I'm sorry you find my features distasteful. On our planet, my appearance is considered quite satisfactory. But if you prefer, I could wear another one of those pseudo-faces. This place where you're from, do the girls look like that too? The females? Why do you ask? Because if they do, it's a downright wonder you ain't extinct. 
Please try to accept my true appearance, Mr. Frisbee, much as we have become accustomed to yours. Some effort is required on both sides. Shall we, I believe the customary phrase is, shake on it? Don't point your finger at me. What you got there, a claw? A gesture of friendship, Mr. Frisbee. Hands across the galaxy and all that. Well, okay, but don't you go pinching me. Huh? You're built hard as a crawfish, I'll say that. Oh, we are indeed, by your standards. Which is quite fortunate for us, considering the gravitational pressures on our home planet. You have a match on you? Pardon? For my pipe. Hold on. I, I gotta light my overalls. What are you doing? Helps me relax. A pinch of Prince. Uh, hmm. One time a guy come in my store and he says, You got Prince Albert in a can? And I says, No. Already went and let him out. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> you boys wouldn't understand. I, I, I'm afraid there's no smoking on the ship. Well, who ever heard of a rule like that? It upsets the negative ion balance. No, I really ain't going. What do you think of that? Well, I suppose if you sit over here, directly under the laminar flow... Kind of chilly. Ooh. Don't you boys have a wood-burning stove at least? Much get mighty close to freezing up there in outer space. What's that? Oh, that? <laughs> oh, that's just my old harmonica. Want I should play you a little tune? Oh, please. Please, Mr. Frisbee. I've been meaning to give a concert one of these days. Maybe Carnegie Hall or over in Branford. Oh, attention. X10 and X12. I need you here at once. Most beautiful sound there is, huh? They have harmonicas where you guys are from? Well, do they? I ask you a question. Do you have harmonicas up there where you where you Help! Help! You 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 don't look so good. Kinda kinda green. <laughs> Whoa, well, let me play some more for you. <laughs> Ain't nothing like a little tune before dinner. That's what I always say. What's that horrible sound? It, it's that object. I've got to get it away from him before it's too late. Back. It's dangerous. Stay away from it. Save yourself. Oh. What's the matter, boys? Don't you like my playing? Huh? Boys? Oh, boys? Frisbee, old son, something tells me this is your chance. You better make tracks, and I mean now. They didn't call you old mile-a-minute Frisbee for nothing. Get moving. What are you doing out of your room, Mr. Frisbee? Mr. Frisbee? Don't let him off the ship. Quickly, seal the airlock. No, you don't, boy. Get out of my way. No. Don't go after him. He has some sort of fantastic instrument that emits a death sound. I've never heard a pitch like it. It's powerfully destructive. We'd best take off before he warns others of his kind. They may have the same weapon. Catch this old boy, can you? <laughs> Go on, get out of here. Get on back where you come from. <laughs> That's it, Scott. <laughs> Quiet, douse the lights. Here he comes. What, 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 what's going on here? Will somebody tell me what's happening here? What do you mean, what's happening? It's your birthday, ain't it? As if you didn't know. And this here is a surprise party. As if you didn't know that either. <laughs> Congratulations, Frisbee. Put her there, old buddy. Well, I sure didn't expect nothing like this. And the heck you didn't. <laughs> the present. Give him the present, Dad. Come and I've been waiting all day for this. Got it right here. 
What are you waiting for? Go on, Frisbee, open it up. Well, you folks sure sprung one on me. Want me to help you get the paper off? No, nah, no, nah, I can get it. Go ahead, read it. What is it, some kind of trophy? It's what they call a loving cup. Went into town and ordered it special. Go on, read it out loud. For the first time, Frisbee is at a loss for words. I'll read it for him. World's greatest liar, Mr. Somerset Frisbee. Presented by his friends on the occasion of his 63rd birthday. Folks, all I can think to say is... Mighty nice for you all. Mighty nice. Ain't you gonna make a speech? Yeah, yeah Frisbee. Tell us one of them real whoppers. Like where you been the last couple of hours? Was you inventing something, or maybe you just took a quick trip to the moon? Well, you ain't far wrong, and that's a fact. <laughs> I know it. I've been waiting for this all day. First off, you know who them fellas was in that car? Which car? That little foreign job come in here for gas, remember? The President of the United States and the Secret Service. Well, I'll tell you who them fellas was. They was from outer space. Oh, isn't he the living end? And somehow or other, they picked me up in the air, right down there by the hollow, and I floated over to their flying saucer, and they took me inside, and then they was gonna kidnap me and take me to their planet. And you was gonna be their leader, Frisbee? <laughs> but, but, but it's true! They was just about to kidnap me, wanted to make me their A1 prize specimen. Oh, the whole Galactic Council was watching. They even had a guy from Venus who could sing eight different ways from sundown and play the drum with his tail. Well, sir, you know how I stopped him? You talked him to death? No, not that. It weren't nothing, really. Just took out my mouth harp and blowed a little tune, something like this. You know what happened then? I'm sure you're gonna tell us. I've been waiting all day for this. They just plump fainted away. Now that I can believe. <laughs> Play as a tune, Somerset, the way you used to. Well, I suppose I could do that if you really want to hear it. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. There it is. Didn't I tell you it was going to rain? Sure I did. I can feel it in these old bones of mine. Yes, sir. What did I tell you? What did I tell you? Ain't he the perfect limit? Ain't he the be-all and end-all? <laughs> Mr. Somerset Frisbee, who might have profited by reading an Aesop fable, the one about the boy who cried wolf. For now, consider this one more tall tale from the timberlands of the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. You are about to enter another dimension, a dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind, a journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop twilightzoneradio.com. Visit TwilightZoneRadio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD. Or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. Hocus Pocus and Frisbee starring Shelley Berman with Stacy Keach as your narrator was written for the Twilight Zone by Rod Serling from a story by Frederick Lewis Fox 
and adapted for radio by Dennis Etcheson. Heard in the cast were Mike Novak, Richard Hensel, Turk Muller, Sarah Marks, Jeff Lupatin, Christian Stolte, and Doug James. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Paul Patch, Terry Jennings, the American Forces Radio and Television Service, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. <laughs>